everybody could take your seats, we'll get going in about two minutes. All right, we're about ready to kick off here. Perfect. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to the Carl G. Greffenstadt Center for Ethics and Science, Technology and Law 2021 Symposium on Biometric Ethics. I'm Directing Fellow John Slattery, and I'll be sort of your host throughout the day today. And I'm extremely excited to have you here in person. And I am also just want to welcome all our online visitors as well. Uh, we had over 150 people sign up uh, to join us virtually, so I'm sure that'll continue throughout the day today. Before we get going at all, I want to uh, introduce you to Father Ray French, who's going to lead us in prayer for just a couple of words we get started. Let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we gather together for this important symposium, let us ask the Holy Spirit to be our guide so that we may be open to discern both the opportunities and the challenges of biometric technology. We pray especially for the presenters and the participants, both here and virtually around the world, that our discussion will be honest and civil and that we will confront the benefits and potential dangers so that we will always protect and defend the inherent dignity of the human person and the beauty of God's creation. We pray this through the spirit who gives life. Amen. Thank you so much for that, Father Ray. Um, I'd now like to introduce you uh, virtually to President Ken Gormley, uh, who's going to say a couple of words as well via video, because he unfortunately could not make it here this morning, although we hopefully will be able to see him later this afternoon. My name is Ken Gormley, and I'm privileged to serve as the 13th president of Duquesne University here in Pittsburgh. Unfortunately, I'm unable to join you in person today, but I wanted to take a moment to welcome you to the second annual symposium of the Carl G. Greffenstadt Center for Ethics in Science, Technology, and Law. The presentations and moderated discussions this afternoon involve a multidisciplinary examination of the technological, political, ethical, and theological implications of biometric ethics. Biometric technologies once sounded like science fiction to many of us when we were kids, but these technologies are now very real in 2021, and they're here to stay. With a simple fingerprint or facial scan, you can access everything from heart rates to online banking services. But as we know, these continued developments in this pioneering field bring with them many concerns relating to privacy, human rights, and the dignity of individual persons. Today's impressive speakers will discuss potential technological and societal issues, and in keeping with this center's mission, 
they'll delve deeply into important ethical and theological implications of those changes. The Carl G. Greffenstedt Center for Ethics in Science, Technology, and Law is uniquely positioned to discuss these issues through a distinctive Catholic lens, offering us an important forum through which we can find common ground and discover new and ethical ways to share and validate information for the common good. We are most grateful to the Henry L. Hillman Foundation whose enormous generosity led to the creation of the Greffenstedt Center, named for Duquesne University's preeminent alumnus and former board member, Carl G. Greffenstedt. Carl is a distinguished 1950 graduate of our School of Business. He went on to spend more than 30 years with the Hillman Company, where he was the trusted advisor to the late Henry L. Hillman, helping to transform that family-owned Pittsburgh-based company from its roots in heavy industry into a diversified global investment holding company. A resounding thanks as well to the fellows of the Greffenstedt Center for Ethics in Science, Technology, and Law. At the helm is directing fellow, Dr. John Slattery, who has devoted himself to the center's important work, which furthers the historic Spiritan Catholic mission of Duquesne University. John also serves as the senior program associate with the Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion program at the American Association for the Advancement of Science in Washington, D.C. Our other fellows are equally impressive. Dr. Nathan Colliner is a senior instructor and director of business analytics at Seattle University. Dr. Matthew J. Gaudet is a lecturer in the School of Engineering at Santa Clara University. Dr. Patrick Yula is an internationally noted expert in text analysis, security, forensics, and stylometry here at Duquesne, and Senior Research Fellow Dr. Jerry McGill is the Vernon F. Gallagher Chair at Duquesne and is a tenured professor in our Center for Global Health Ethics. A big thanks as well to the Center's postdoctoral fellow, Erjan Avschi, who graduated with his PhD in healthcare ethics from Duquesne and he has been instrumental in supporting today's program. I also want to thank the fabulous speakers who are taking part in this symposium for sharing their expertise today. We're honored to collaborate with some of the most elite academic centers in the United States dealing with these important issues of biometric ethics. And finally, our thanks to our wonderful audience for joining us both in person and virtually I hope you draw new perspectives and inspiration from today's rich interdisciplinary dialogue. With deep gratitude to the Hillman Foundation and to all of the community partners, we welcome each of you to the second annual symposium of the Carl G. Greffenstedt Center. And so now it is my pleasure to turn things over back again to Dr. John Slattery, Directing Fellow of the Greffenstedt Center. John? Well, thanks so much, Ken, for turning it back over. Appreciate that. Um, so just a couple of words about today. Um, in keeping um, with the policies on Duquesne's campus, uh, masks are required inside unless you are either speaking um, at the podium or uh, a panelist or you're eating or drinking. Um, bathrooms are right where the you know, to the left of the sort of food area. Um, and there will be snacks uh, throughout the day. And then uh, we'll, we'll have a lunch served here as well. Um, so a couple of words in about our topic of the day before I introduce our first moderator. So biometric technologies are as natural as breathing in 2021. We use them to unlock our phones, log into our computers, access bank accounts, sort through thousands of family pictures for that certain someone you were, you were looking for. They are used on us to issue speeding tickets, find missing persons, prevent possible terrorist activities, and detain anyone who a computer might think is someone else. Like a lot of technology, biometrics have become essential to the flow of modern life, while simultaneously being deeply problematic if used improperly. To this point, it is auspicious to have this conference today, two days after Facebook 
otherwise known as META, uh, announced that they will be phasing out their vast system of facial recognition that billions of users have opted into, um, willingly or not, over the last decade. Now, despite what the press announcement said, we are natural to be suspicious of Facebook's intentions following a series of unscrupulous and dangerous actions that have been revealed to the world in the past two months through the documents released by whistleblower Francis Haugen. You know, some might be rejoicing um, this announcement, but many in the industry have also reacted from curiosity to suspicion as Facebook's decision um, seems to beg questions. Why is Facebook actually ending this practice? What effect will it actually have on biometrics more generally, if any? And what will Facebook do to the images and the image sets instead? If nothing else, Facebook's announcement this week will likely have shockwaves for months and years to come. And it reminds me why I'm so grateful that we have gathered this symposium here today and virtually, um, and for all the speakers and moderators and attendees uh, throughout the day today who have come to Pittsburgh to uh, have these important conversations. So without further ado, I want to introduce uh, the moderator of our first session today. Dr. Kathleen M. Carley is a professor in Carnegie Mellon University's School of Computer Sciences Institute for Software Research an IEEE Fellow and the Director of the Center for Computational Analysis of Social and Organizational Systems at Carnegie Mellon, and the Director for the Idea Center, uh, who we at the Grafenstadt Center really appreciate our partnership with, uh, which is the Center for Informed Democracy and Social Cybersecurity. So, Dr. Carley, welcome. So thank you, John, and thank you to all of you for being here. Um, delighted to be part of this uh, workshop today on biometrics and the ethical challenges. Our first session today is focusing on the technology. What is it? How does it work? And what are some of the promises of it and the challenges of it? For that, we have two wonderful speakers who will each come up here and speak for about 15 minutes, which will follow that up with questions. Uh, to kind of get a dialogue going about what's going on in this space. Our first speaker is Stephanie Shuckers. She comes to us, she's the Painter Krigman Endowed Professor in Engineering Science and the director for, the director of the Center for Identification and Technology Research, or CIDR, at Clarkson University. She got her PhD from the University of Michigan, which is dear to my heart because my daughter did too, one of them. And she, her research focuses on processing and interpreting signals which arise from the human body. Among her many notable contributions to the field, she has also made a point of actually uh, working with the Department of Homeland Security and has actually testified before Congress. Our second wonderful speaker is Arun Ross. He comes to us, the, the uh, John and Eva Silig Endowed Chair in the College of Engineering and the professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at Michigan State University. His degree is from Bits Palani, India as an undergraduate, from which he moved to, of course, Michigan State University, where he got his master's and PhD. His research focuses on biometrics, computer vision, and machine learning. He has also taken his uh, research to practice and has advocated for the responsible use of biometrics in multiple forums, including before NATO, as well as before the, um, in the Security Council for NATO before in Switzerland, and as well as working in an event organized by the United Nations uh, Counterterrorism Community. Uh, I'm delighted to have these two speakers here today, and we'll start off with Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, having me here, and I'm glad to speak to you today. So as the slides are pulling up, um, I am the director of the Center for Identification Technology Research. Uh, it's a National Science Foundation center looking at identity and biometric research. Um, so it's really a pleasure to be part of this important conversation. Oh, no problem. Sure. He's coming. Okay. Oh. 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 Oh.
Okay, so uh, we're here to talk about biometric recognition technology. You know, as, as was mentioned in our intro, it's being used today for a lot of applications. Many of those applications are online. Uh, and in today's world, particularly with COVID, a lot of things happen online. But one of the troubles with the things that are happening online is fraud. The fraudsters now have a new vector in which to operate. And, and in that vector, there are password problems, um, there is identity theft, um, there is ransomware, and this is really um, causing a lot of issues and a lot of pain for members of, of our society. And a lot of it today is rooted in this establishing of the connection between the, the real user and, and the party, whether it be a bank, whether it be a government. And so how are we doing it today? Uh, well, we, we do it today through the things we have, like our passports, keys, et cetera, or what we know. Actually, a lot of, of things are based on what we know, like a password or a PIN. And so what Biometrics provides is another layer or another uh, way of tackling the solution that connects directly back to the individual. It's the information measured from the individual that then um, is compared against an enrollment database. And we're gonna get into a little bit about how all of this works. So it's actually fairly simple. Let me just see if I can do this. Yeah, here we go. First step, you enroll. Um, so you, you capture from a biometric scanner. There's some processing, feature extraction, and then information stored in a database. That's the first step. Second step is the query or an authentication, where now you go again to the biometric scanner, some information is extracted, and then it's compared against the information that's stored in the database and a decision is made. So you can see, as a technology, it's right, quite simple, right? Just a couple steps. But now we're gonna get into it and you're gonna see uh, the layers of complexity, because the layers of complexity come into how you use this underlying technology and we're gonna cover a few of the use cases, you know, first with some examples and then with some more broader picture ideas about it. So let's start with one example. So after 9-11, uh, we realized that one of the vulnerabilities that we had were people were, cross people were crossing our border, which we um, didn't realize, you know, through the uses of uh, fake passports, et cetera. And so what uh, they set up, actually the Homeland Security didn't exist at that time, but they set up the Homeland uh, Security, Department of Homeland Security, as well as set up a biometric program where individuals who need a visa to get in this country would apply for a visa, provide their fingerprints, those fingerprints would be checked against a database, and then when that, and to ensure they're not on a watch list, those individuals were not on a watch list, and then when they came to the border, they would ensure that the same person that applied for the visa and that wasn't on the watch list was the one crossing the border. Um, so this is something that's actually been in existence almost 20 years. Of course, mobile authentication, um, typically what that is, is you're just proving yourself to the, your phone, the biometrics stored locally on your phone. It's not passed up to, to um, any party, um, it's built into the phone in a secure part of the phone and allows us to protect you know, our personal information uh, as we log in uh, again and again throughout the day. Another place where biometrics has been used for uh, quite a few years now is in India. In India, there were a large portion of the population who did not have an identity. And if you don't have an identity, it's a little hard to understand when you're in the United States about what not having an identity means. You know, but there are many countries where there are people who don't have an identity and thus cannot participate in society through things like banking, um, through things like loans. Um, and so what India did is they wanted to issue an identity for the 1.2 billion people in the country and they did not want fraud to ensue so they had people enroll, and through enrollment, um, they collected two, 10 fingers, two irises, and then they would do a step called deduplication. So if a new person would come along to enroll, they wanna make sure they didn't already have an identity, such that they didn't issue two identities to the same person. So they would search against the whole database, and the reason why they need 10 fingerprints and two irises is to be able to distinguish uh, 1.2 billion people. And of course, they had um, some manual overreading when 
they saw that there was a match to ensure um, that that was not a mistake. They can also then tap into this database for one-to-one -one banking, um, and so there's still some uh, work going on related to that. Some other use cases that you might have seen um, in, in your uh, perusing of biometric recognition technology or, or yourself, you know, in terms of day-to-day uh, -day interactions, particularly now because of COVID. Um, there are solutions which essentially you take a photo of your, your driver's license or your passport, and then you take a selfie, and that selfie is matched against the photograph on your driver's license. And then usually there's a liveness check to ensure that a real person is there. And then um, that information is usually provided to you know, something, uh, some service provider who then makes sure all of these things line up. And then also, um, um, I can't remember what I was going to say, um, makes a decision. And then, oh, yeah, oh, I know what I was going to say. So the kinds of things that this has been used for would be things like when you're starting a new bank account. Um, I know that at one point I used it in, with Airbnb. Um, and so it's really to ensure the identity on, on that first interaction online. Another place uh, I was asked or, or told um, about our retirement account. Well, apparently there is fraud in call centers in our, our retirement accounts. That I, I wonder, there might be a lot of academics here with TIA CREF. Um, yes, so there was some fraud where people were calling into the call center of TIA CREF pretending to be the real person and as, as a result, um, stealing people's retirement account funds. And so what an option was, you know, and there are many ways to do this, but one of the options that they provided through that was to register your voice so such that when you were to call in, they would match against your voice and ensure it wasn't a fraudster calling in. Uh, there's something called the FIDO Alliance. So um, the FIDO Alliance includes all of these folks, plus a number of others. Uh, these are the board level folks. And you can see it has folks like Google, Microsoft, uh, Lenovo, Samsung, Visa, MasterCard, many major banks. And what they're looking at is a way to get beyond the password. Because uh, we all know that the password is a shared secret. Thus, if the password is leaked, then that password uh, can be reused um, and, and uh, is often one of the major attack factors for both identity theft as well as ransomware attacks. And so the way they're going about it is really a two-step process. Where biometrics comes into play is where you prove yourself to your device. We're calling it authenticator. It could be a key, could be your phone, could be a laptop. So you prove yourself through biometrics. That biometrics is stored locally. And what that does is it unlocks a private key that can then be compared to a public key at the relying party now, say it be a bank, say it be a shopping website. And so what's now stored at the bank instead of that password, that shared secret, is, is a public key, essentially a thing that's useless on its own. It's only useful when put together with the private key, which is stored locally on the device. This is built in today into phones, into all the major web browsers, and you're going to start to see this opportunity to essentially link your biometric to uh, the relying party, but remember your biometric is stored locally on your device. And instead of doing like a password fill-in box, which again is still a shared secret, it uses asymmetric key cryptography. Now you don't have to do biometrics, you can also use a pin on your device for this type of authentication. I got to watch time and I didn't watch when we started. <laughs> so, Moving on, so what are some of the challenges? Um, one of the challenges that we're finding is that there's, even though there's that simple technology and how it works, how you put it together in a system, I've just explained a few of them, can be very complicated. And so, uh, when we're having conversations about, you know, what should be the limits related to biometric technology, uh, things tend to get mixed together, you know, in terms of how things are used. And so I'm going to talk just a little bit about some of the use cases as far as categories. And I know I'm not going to cover them all, but it'll give you an idea. 
So we have something called one-to-one -one matching. And what one-to-one -one matching means is that it's only compared against the template that the claim is made. So I claim to be Stephanie Shuckers, I'm standing at the border with my passport, and then it's only compared against my uh, template. This can also be a, in the mobile device application, et cetera. And that data can be stored on your phone, like in the FIDO model, or it could be stored in the cloud. Um, for example, the voice recognition um, uh, uh, example that I was talking about, that's of course sto stored at um, the, the uh, retirement company that I was talking about. Now, one-to-many um, applications means that single thing I capture now is run against a whole database. Um, and so it could be done for, for example, access control or gym membership. Uh, I, I know that some gyms, you know, you just kind of walk in, you don't need your ID, you don't need anything, you know, it, it captures your biometric and then lets you in, or maybe a doorway. Um, again, there's no claim made here, but you're kind of willingly provide your sample so you can get into your gym. And then it's compared against the database sitting there at the gym. So that's positive identification. Deduplication, I've just talked about. And deduplication, again, you're sort of willingly participating in the process. You want an ID, you want to be part of the system, or it's going to be a benefits or a bank. And they're just checking to make sure that you're not a fraudster claiming to be somebody else. So they're checking against that database. Investigative, of course, we all watch, well, maybe we don't all watch, but a lot of people, I know I was watching Law & Order last night, um, watch uh, crime shows, you know, and, and essentially what's happening in terms of biometric recognition is a crime has occurred, there's some biometric evidence that's extracted, then that biometric evidence is run against a database for lead generation or investigative purposes. And there's some um, candidates provided back to the investigator, and the investigator needs to pair that information with other information associated with the crime and help them solve the crime. No claims made there, obviously, the samples from the crime scene, um, and it's used to generate leads. And here, some of the questions relate to what are you searching? Remember, it's a two-step process. You have to capture the biometric, and then uh, you have to search it. And in this case, you could be searching prior arrests, or you could actually be searching things like driver's license databases. And notice I put that in red, you know, somewhat purposeful because I imagine this is gonna be something that's coming up uh, later today. Um, watch list, this is another way, now you have kind of a smaller list of folks that you're looking for. Suppose it's wartime environment, you have some individuals, um, you're detaining someone, and then you're trying to make a decision on whether or not that person should be held longer. So you're checking against a watch list. Um, again, a claim is not made, but there are kind of cases like the visa example that I talked to you, where you are making a claim and they're checking that you know, you're not on a list and doing um, uh, a claim that isn't true. Um, so in this case now, you're searching against the watch list. And then, uh, the last category I'm going to talk about is a surveillance category. And what's flipped here now is uh, the data that you gather that you're going to search is the data gathered from a public square, you know, or a store looking for prior shoplifters. Um, and so uh, this is, is distinctly different, right, than after a crime has occurred and you're using it to search for uh, the person who may have committed the crime. And again, this could be compared again against a watch list, um, likely. So I've made that in red again, another place where I imagine there'll be a lot of discussion today. Another place that causes a lot of confusion is with error rates. Um, and so as with all technologies, you know, COVID tests, we're actually pretty good now about false negatives and false positives um, after COVID. <laughs> um, but biometric technology has a similar false negative, false positive um, scenario. We, we tend to kind of use it interchangeably with something called a false reject or a false accept. Um, so looking kind of at the, at the top row, I, let's see if I have a pointer. Um, and for those online, I'm kind of looking under performance and the top row, we have, you are accepted, this is how it's supposed to work. This is now verification, kind of 
one-on-one -on -one or a positive ID. And then you want to reject you know, the wrong individual. You know, someone stolen your phone and putting their fingerprint on that. Um, you'd like to be rejected. And then the mistakes would be, and we've all experienced this, you're falsely rejected, your fingers are wet, um, you're cooking, uh, for example, you're falsely rejected. And then the other mistake would be a security risk, where, which we call a false accept, um, and that um, is the unauthorized person getting into the system. So what are the impacts of these errors? It's inconvenient for the real user, um, and it's a security risk if the fraudster gets in. And that inconvenience is an important step if we're talking about, say, passport. Again, typically it's a one-to-one, -one, you're at the border, but if your fingerprint doesn't work, you know, there needs to be policies in place in order to handle that uh, with, with the individuals at the border prepared for the fact that it could be a false reject. Uh, now let's talk about error rates, you know, in terms of searching a criminal database or a watch list. Again, you've got sort of the top row, which is what we want, right? The real person who's not on the list is rejected and the true criminal is accepted. And then the bottom, you're falsely matched or the criminal is missed. So in th those cases, you can have a false negative Again, we're pretty useful, used to that, as well as a false positive. So again, what are the impacts? You know, clearly the impact here is quite a bit different than the impact that I was talking about in the last slide. And again, we have to be prepared that these errors uh, could occur. Um, and essentially, the idea of using it for investigative purposes is meant to pair it with other information in order to make a decision. Um, and then the court of law to uh, be part of that process. So what can we do? You know, in our center, we want to participate in these conversations. Um, we also are, have just finished videos that helps help in terms of education. I think the idea is is in order to have a good constructive conversation, we need to understand these differences in the technology so we can put the right things in place you know, as a society. And so um, we're really excited about these videos. They're animated, they're fantastic, um, so take a look. Um, and just drop me a note uh, and I can send you the link. Formally, we're announcing it next week. All right, time-wise, I think I have a little more time. So last section I wanted to talk about, actually I think I have two more sections, um, is security, so I'll try to move a little more quickly. Um, so, you know, from the point of view of a technologist, we're using biometric recognition um, as a form of security. And so we need to ensure that we uh, control the whole tool chain and, and think about each of the risks as we go along. You know, one of the risks is someone makes a fake biometric. Um, and we've been doing research in the center um, and some in collaboration with the Rune here for a number of years. And one of the features that that provides is uh, the ability to reject um, spoofs or people who try to fake these systems. We're also doing research on templates. If templates that are stored in a database could be a vulnerability, are a vulnerability. And so if we could create what's called a, a one-way transformation or an irreversible template, if that was stolen, it couldn't be, uh, the original biometric couldn't be reconstructed. Of course, you know, when we talk, when I was talking about the FIDO Alliance and how it's working, the, the idea of that is to really use best practices in information security to uh, create an authentication um, solution uh, that, that uh, you know, looks at each aspect of how matching and decision making is made. And then there's research on what are called injection attacks. And some of it relates to doing some kind of liveness check with, with the challenge response to ensure it's not a replay attack. So just since I've been doing spoofing for a long time, I gotta show my spoofing slide. Um, so so in, in our laboratory, we've been researching ways to detect when someone's trying to attack biometric through spoofing. 
And we do that, we call it presentation attack detection or liveness detection. And in fact, the iPhone has um, the ability to reject uh, spoof attacks. It's not absolutely perfect. Um, oops, here we go. Uh, but what it uses is a near infrared camera um, that uh, puts um, some pinpoints of light on the face and measures a three dimensional piece as well as has an algorithm that would detect if say someone was putting a photograph in front of uh, the camera. Another thing that's said quite often in relation to biometric technology is that biometrics cannot be changed and they're not secrets and so we shouldn't use them. And the thing about biometric recognition technology, it's not equivalent to a password. It's not equivalent to a shared secret. Because of the protections that I was talking about, like liveness detection, we actually have more possibilities to ensure that we are actually taking a sample and making a decision at the right time and place than we do with someone typing a password in a text box. Uh, so that's what presentation attack detection provides for you, as well as we want to limit the holes, right? such that anyone can, and can insert a biometric at any point, right? Because you need a scanner, you're already halfway there, but that, then you need to use the information security practices that I was talking about to secure the data as it's you know, going on to processing and matching. And I think this was said way back in 2001 when we started researching liveness detection, that it's really about the liveness detection that makes biometric technology um, work, not necessarily that we have to keep it secret. You know, of course, there are a lot of good reasons to keep it secret, and I'm sure we're going to cover them today. Um, but I, I want folks to, to, to know about some ways to mitigate you know, some of the issues that may arise if a biometric is stolen. And the last, I think we're going to talk about this today, and I don't have very much to say um, because I think we'll, we're going to talk quite a bit. So, but I, I did like this because it, it really helped me um, kind of, you know, we, we talked about all those different use cases. They're, they're quite complicated, you know, but this was very straightforward. You know, my identity is me physically taking up some space here with this, my biological cells. Our identity is me participating in the process, you know, my, me providing my biometric data to set up a trust relation uh, with a third party, explicitly giving my consent. And their identity is about when someone's trying to guess who I am through biometric technology or through you know, the many digital signatures that we leave behind, um, our, our search habits, you know, our, our um, location, et cetera. And I like this little um, quote because I can remember in 1993 when somebody said to me, hey, we should put our, our, our student club on something called the World Wide Web. And I was like, what is that? Um, and so um, that was the joke then on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog because you really were very anonymous. But we'll, we'll come back to that um, in, in a few minutes. So uh, I think it's interesting that even companies are asking for regulation. Now, this may be a really great marketing ploy by Microsoft, um, but you know, certainly I don't think anyone's arguing whether there's a need uh, for regulation or not. And I've been working with the Biometrics Institute uh, in terms of the responsible and ethical use of biometrics, and they've come up with these three laws of biometrics, uh, which I think is, is useful for both, uh, for, particularly for end users who are looking to set up a biometric system you know, to, to kind of put it in very simple terms on the technology is sort of the last thing you need to think about and these policy and press process are the first things you need to think about. And uh, that is where I'll leave it just because I know I'm short on time. I'm gonna do my sort of updated. I noticed in, in, in 2015, those same dogs came back on the right there and they said, remember when on the internet nobody knew who you were? You know, you know, back in 93, I mean, you really were anonymous, but you know, a as you know, I just searched for uh, homecoming dresses for my daughter and I got so many dresses coming into my feeds wherever I go, no matter which platform I jump on. Um, and so remember when nobody knew who you were and there's my doggie. Maybe someday we can 
uh, get this all to work together in the way we desire. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for attending this uh, very exciting symposium. Uh, John, thanks for the invitation. Kathleen, thanks for the nice introduction. Stephanie, good opening remarks there for this session. Um, I'll give a brief uh, description about recent advances in biometrics. Uh, my name is Arun Ross, and I'm a professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at um, Michigan State University. Uh, Stephanie has already given us um, the fundamentals of the technology and some of the uh, definitions pertaining to the technology. And uh, one thing I'd just like to add, uh, Stephanie did a great job of covering uh, all those aspects, is that um, this notion of uh, likelihood ratio, and the reason I'm bringing this up is that uh, when we're given two images, two face images to match, uh, we do have to generate two numbers. Uh, one is the likelihood of observing these two face images, assuming they are of the same person. But we must allow for the other hypothesis also. That is the likelihood of observing these two images, assuming they are of different people. And at first blush, it might be tempting to think one is uh, a complement of the other, but it's not. These are two independent events, one under the assumption that they originate from the same person and the other under the assumption that they originate from two different people. And when we take these two numbers and put them in a ratio framework, we are able to now make a decision as to whether they do originate from the same person or if they don't. And this has a very practical implication to it because we are not necessarily committing to saying that these are of the same person. We are allowing for the alternate hypothesis to exist and then we bring them both together in the scoring ratio framework. So as we start looking at face recognition technology in particular, uh, this is a report from NIST. And uh, this has a gallery size of 1.6 million identities. That means these are the number of identities in a database. And you can search through this database, for example. Uh, basically, in their report, which uh, has been cited here, they point out that the most accurate algorithm in 2018 gives a false negative identification rate of about 0.2%. In contrast to the 2014 result, where a false negative identification rate was about 4.1%. And so this constitutes almost a 20-fold reduction in false negatives. And this is at a very low false positive rate. And so the authors make this statement which I think is very telling about how the technology has evolved from the perspective of uh, empirical evaluation error rates. So they say the massive accuracy gains are consistent with an industrial revolution associated with the incorporation of convolutional neural network-based techniques into the prototypes. And so now here we notice that uh, the word, the phrase convolutional neural network is used, CNN. Uh, not the network agency, but the neural network uh, enterprise here. And so clearly, the, um, the, the emergence, if you will, of convolutional neural network has completely changed the field, completely changed the field. 
especially over the past five years. Whereas previously, getting these type of numbers was uh, partly unimaginable. I think what has changed in the field of artificial intelligence is the um, emergence of convolutional neural networks, whose principles have been around for decades, but more recently, due to the availability of massive computational resources, massive number of uh, example images and so on, one has been able to really improve the performance. And so the authors themselves, uh, themselves point out the major result was that massive gains in accuracy have been achieved in the years 2013 to 2018, and these far exceed improvements made in the prior period of 2010 to 2013. And just in the bottom of the slide, you will see the paper which kind of changed the landscape, and this is a figure from that paper uh, by uh, Teigman et al. And uh, this is uh, what is called as a deep face, which uh, changed, in some sense, the paradigm of face recognition, where now, by using massive number of training examples, the algorithm would learn what kind of features to extract from the image in order to establish identity. So now the focus is not just on human-defined features, but now the focus is on data-driven features. And as I will say later on, both these things have to come into play. Because if you're looking only at human-based features, those discovered by humans, then there can be biases in them. And similarly, if it is only data-driven features, there can be biases in them as well. And this is where this kind of technology requires not just the sole interpretation of the machine, but also the augmentation of human expertise. So I won't speak a lot about convolutional neural networks except to say that uh, these networks can automatically learn what type of features to extract. These are mathematical models. Uh, they are heavily data-driven, so they require massive number of training samples. We're talking about millions. Uh, the training process is computationally expensive, requires in many cases multiple uh, GPUs, graphics processing units, uh, but the actual matching the actual comparison is very fast. At the same time, we are seeing improvements in other aspects of the technology in general, going beyond face. For example, the incorporation of uh, fingerprint sensors in uh, personal devices and the ability to recognize individuals, to authenticate individuals before sensitive information is accessed. And so we have these type of sensors which are being increasingly developed so that um, a person can be authenticated rapidly, especially in sensitive applications. So we see uh, improvements on that front as well. And clearly, many of us are familiar with uh, smartphones and fingerprint sensors. And uh, what is intriguing is the small real estate that is needed in order to host the sensor, which is then used to uh, authenticate an individual prior to them accessing sensitive information. So there has been tremendous improvement on the algorithmic side, like I talked about the NIST report. There has been tremendous improvement on the sensor side, like the example that I gave of a smartphone product. But at the same time, there are many attack vectors that have entered into the picture, and Stephanie had covered a number of them. One, of course, is spoofing, where I can strategically alter my trait so that I can match with John's and I become rich overnight. <laughs> or I can create a spoof of a fingerprint uh, um, tip, of a fingertip, and now create a virtual identity that may not pertain to anyone in this world, but now I have a physical artifact that is corresponding to no one in particular, but it's a virtual identity. And so much analysis and research has gone into developing uh, what uh, Stephanie mentioned, presentation attack detectors. Uh, another term that has been floating around for a long time is anti-spoofing technology. And in this particular view graph, you're seeing examples of many kinds of attack vectors that can be launched against an iris recognition system, which is a biometric system that uses the iris portion of the human eye for recognizing individuals. And uh, what we have determined, for example, using some of our algorithms, is that we can detect these type of spoofs 
with uh, very high accuracy, and I'm providing some numbers uh, just as examples, but these things can be detected with very high accuracy at a very low false detect rate. That means incorrectly calling a real bona fide iris as a fake iris. So in other words, as technology evolves, um, it is also necessary to ward off attacks that can be launched by enterprising adversaries who are um, keen on circumventing the operation of the system. So as we speak about sensor evolution, about algorithm evolution, now we have this third dimension of enhancing the security of the system. And so here is one example where um, this is detecting a fake face. Every time you see a green box, that's a real face, but then it turns to red if someone is offering, say, a mask or some kind of uh, um, an artifact that uh, is not real, and therefore the system has to flag that. So, so far it's having a green. This was developed by my colleague, uh, Professor Xiaoming Lu, but now you have an image of someone's face, and so you see the red uh, box suggesting that the algorithm has determined that it's not a real face, but a bona fide one, or, but a, a synthetic one, or something that has been altered by the application of makeup, or even something that is uh, a fake head, and so on and so forth. So clearly, technology is evolving to ward off these attacks, to detect these attacks. But still, there are some fundamental questions that remain. And uh, one of the most pressing questions is, uh, what is the uniqueness or distinctiveness of a biometric trait? That means if I were to give you one fingerprint, could you indicate how unique is this? What are the chances that it would accidentally match with someone else's? And so this particular question seems to be very basic. It is very fundamental. But surprisingly, there is no consensus on what those numbers are. What is the probability that my face image will match with someone else's face image in this room? I will be delighted, maybe not you, but. And so we notice here that this fundamental questions, these fundamental questions have to be answered. And the same thing about the persistence or permanence of a trait. What is the uh, longevity of using a trait? Is it five years for face? Beyond which maybe the face aging process would prevent the face from being matched with the template as we call it in the database. A very fundamental question. Uh, but surprisingly, or perhaps unsurprisingly, there is no um, answer that everyone would agree to. But large-scale experiments have been conducted in order to come up with empirical numbers for these type of questions. Uh, but still, more research is, is needed. The second thing, um, we talked about convolutional neural networks. Sometimes it is difficult for humans to understand what kind of features these networks have extracted. And so in order to um, enhance interpretability and explainability, the field of interpretable face recognition or explainable face recognition has become very significant. But the machine should not just make a decision, it should also explain why it made that decision so that human operators can now work in conjunction with the machines in order to make some final assessment especially in very sensitive situation where a lot of things are at stake. For example, apprehending someone. And so here is an opportunity for these algorithms to become transparent and offer an explanation of how they do things. Thirdly, improving low quality face images or biometric images. Because there are scenarios when there are false matches because the quality of the image was so poor but yet the algorithm decided to move forward in making a determination of someone's identity. And that's uh, not always the wisest thing to do. Because when the quality of the image degrades, there are chances of enhancing the, increasing rather, the false matches. And so how can we improve the quality of face images or any biometric images prior to matching them? And if the quality is not sufficient enough to be able to say, that this is not a viable source of evidence for establishing identity. 
And so that is very important when we talk about quality. In other words, garbage in, garbage out. We would like to ensure the integrity of the data is maintained. Another aspect is face aging. How can we uh, regress or progress someone's face image? Several applications. One of the best known applications is locating missing children. The ability to see how their face image would look like in the future or in the past in order to connect the dots, so to speak, and be able to match an image with an image in the past, even though that past image may or may not be available, or with an image in the future. And so these are important technical advances that have been made where the image itself has been subjected to a mathematical model that, uh, that uh, projects how the face would look like either delta years before or delta years after. And then briefly about face recognition and privacy. And the reason why this is important is because there is tremendous amount of research where people are using face images in an automated sense to extract information far beyond what was intended at the time the image was supplied to the agency. So for example, there are algorithms, machine algorithms that can extract age information or health information from the face image. In this particular example, you see an image on the left and then you see a bunch of images on the right. The bunch of images on the right have been modified such that you can still use it for recognition purposes, but you can't use those face images to extract other pieces of information, like age or health or race information. And this is important because you're confounding the machine from extracting any other piece of information that was not consented to by the user when they offered the data or when the data was extracted from them. So this we call as differential privacy, privacy, not in the strictest of its terms, but just to suggest that you're modifying the data in such a way that it's not misused beyond the purpose for which it was intended. And then in the remaining time that I have, about two minutes, I will speak, quickly speak about algorithms that have been develop, developed rather to enhance the fairness of the technology. And uh, sometimes this is referred to as de-biasing face recognition. Because there is evidence in the literature in the past that uh, some face recognition algorithms can operate well on certain demographic groups, but not very well on other demographic groups. Due to a variety of reasons, ranging from the lack of sufficient training data to biases in programming that made certain assumptions that does not apply to a majority or a minority of the population. So in order to address these issues, there are many uh, face recognition researchers and other biometric researchers who, uh, who uh, perform de-biasing in terms of ensuring that their algorithm is operational over different heterogeneous groups. And so if you look at some of the more recent uh, NIST results, they, they point out that the top 20 algorithms, they do not have differential performance across the demographic groups. But when you start looking at the poor performing algorithms, not the top algorithms, but the other algorithms, then you actually start observing these biases across demographic groups. Further evidence that it's very important to decide which algorithm to use and not just use any algorithm if its fairness has not been evaluated. And so I'm not going to speak about uh, deep fakes much because I'm sure there might be some questions, but deep fakes are synthetically generated face images based on the principle of deep learning. All three face images that you see here are not real. Uh, you can type in this person does not exist.com. Maybe you have done that many times. And you can see all these synthetic faces being generated by powerful GANs generative adversarial neural networks. And these are not pertaining to a real individual. These are just synthetic images that are created. And so there are ways in which um, we can detect these deep fakes. I'm not going to play these two uh, videos in the interest of time, uh, but the one on the right is a deep fake video of Mark Zuckerberg 
The one on the left is a genuine video of Mark Zuckerberg. And uh, we have developed methods in which we try to detect deep fakes based on the identity of the individual who is appearing in that video. We call it an identity condition model that takes into account the identity of the person that is being represented. Because certain identities can cause more havoc, especially when there is a deep fake video that is promoting things that are not accurate. So all these things indicate that researchers are working on deep fakes, on morphed faces. Here, are, here is an example where you have two identities, if you can see my pointer, and you can combine these two faces and create a morphed face that can now match with the two participating identities. And now this causes uh, an issue because the two individuals can share the same digital document. So how do we detect these type of morphs? And so we have developed some techniques where we not only try to detect the morph, but we also try to find out who the other person is who is not present at the point of authentication, but the document does embody two distinct identities. So um, my final comment, which I already made at the beginning, is uh, humans versus computers. Uh, this is a paper by Jonathan Phillips and co-authors where they talk about combining human-based face recognition with machine-based face recognition. And the goal, as they point out in their paper, is improved performance. And so this is where I think there is tremendous hope because allowing the machine to have the final determination or only the human to have the final determination may not be the best way to proceed. There must be a way in which both machines and humans are allowed to make their independent assessment and both have to be then brought together in a very nice uh, fusion framework. So I'll um, stop there, just pointing out that humans plus computers gives better performance. And um, here is a summary of some of the comments we made. Performance has improved, but um, conjunction between human examiners and reviewers are needed. And researchers have studied factors impacting performance and are working toward mitigating these um, factors. I really appreciate, again, the opportunity to, to speak. And uh, I believe now we are going to go into a, a Q&A session. And I look forward to that. But thank you very much for your patience. Real, pardon me, real quick. Um, if you, the microphone in front of you, there's a switch. You, you toggle it on. Just want to make sure people over the live stream can hear us, and it's also recorded. Perfect. Thank you very much. I was yep. looking for that. All right, so thank you to our speakers. And as you were both talking, I couldn't help thinking about the fact that there is going to be a lot of artificial intelligence and biometrics. And as we know in artificial intelligence, it's the case that if you can build it with AI, you can unbuild it. You, if you can create it, you can detect it. And so that kind of puts you in a situation like, I'm sure everyone has read the Butter Battle book, or some of us remember the Cold War. Um, you know, is biometrics now kind of an, an area where as you get better at it, the adversary is also getting better. You're getting better at developing it, but the spoofing is getting better. And if so, you know, is there a way of getting around this? <laughs> Thank you. A great, great question. Uh, that is indeed the case. It's a cat and mouse game, uh, where as the technology evolves, there are better ways of um, attacking the technology. Uh, one of the things that um, many biometric researchers are involved in is trying to predict where the next attack is coming from. Um, it is almost impossible to conceive of a system that is able to deflect all possible future attacks. And so one of the ways is to be prepared beforehand. And so every time we develop a technology, we also try to determine ways in which this particular technology can be attacked before the technology uh, is attacked. And so that kind of uh, an approach has been uh, typically used in our field. Um, and again, uh, there are some researchers who are working on uh, a unified way in which many of these attacks can be, can be uh, 
you know, detected in advance. Uh, but uh, that is often, as you rightly point out, a, a losing battle because we must keep in mind that technology is advancing, better sensors, better materials to spoof uh, sensors, uh, better ways of attacking a system due to the evolution of uh, GPUs and so on. So uh, that would be my perspective that um, in many cases, once the technology, as the, as the technology evolves, to be able to look ahead and say, well, we see these things in the horizon. Now, how do we develop uh, an attack um, uh, resistant uh, mechanism? And I would just add, when we're thinking about security, um, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about biometric security. But the reality is, is, you know, you have a problem you're trying to solve and you're going to bring the tools to the table. And what the attacker is going to do is find the weakest link. Um, and so the weakest link may or may not be the biometric. And I would say most of us in our experience today, at least with logging onto our phones with the biometric, that is not the weakest link where our threat is against in, in terms of identity threat. The threat is passwords. Also, we've moved to multi-factor authentication. But unfortunately, many of the ways we're doing multi-factor um, uh, can be easily phished. You know, things like sending a code that you have to type in. You know, you can be easily tricked into typing in that code into the wrong place. And thus, people can take over your account. And so when we think about biometrics, we want to be prepared. We, we are developing ways to be prepared. Um, but we also have to see, you know, as it's integrated into technology, where becomes the weakest link, right? And so I think right now there's a lot of weak links in how we do authentication, for example. You know, and so with the FIDO Alliance putting it together, the biometric with the asymmetric key cryptography is meant to sort of plug, plug those, some of those holes for authentication. Great. Thank you both. Um, so... Building off this idea of the wink link, uh, you know, a while ago, we used to use handwriting identification as a biometric to kind of figure out, you know, was this indeed the bad guy or whatever doing something. But there are a lot of non-physiological biometrics out there, like your walking gait, you know, the way you style speech and so on. My question is, what are the challenges in making that kind, those kind of characteristics more usable, and are they more valuable if they're used in conjunction with the physiological ones? Yeah, uh, indeed, indeed that's the case. Um, we're talking about, um, uh, Kathleen, I think, uh, behavioral traits, uh, like uh, the way a person walks, um, even uh, the way a person speaks. And uh, there are some use cases where uh, these traits become very significant. Um, imagine that the only evidence you have of uh, a perpetrator of a crime is that you see them walk away from the camera. Now the question is, what can you use? And so in such cases, it becomes the standalone technology. But then if you take a smartphone, uh, which is able to record your behavior, uh, say the way you um, really type on the, on, the, on the keyboard, which in this case could be a virtual keyboard, or the way you swipe uh, your fingers on the screen and so on, you can have the opportunity to do continuous authentication by using those behavioral traits to ensure that you did not unlock your phone and then you left it and someone else took the phone and started using it. If the system is able to determine uh, that there is a change in behavior in which the way the, uh, the phone is being used, then those are good traits that can be used in order to secure the system. But I do completely agree with you that in uh, many other cases, it is always good to augment these behavioral traits with the solid um, primary traits like fingerprint or iris or, or face. And the reason is the behavioral traits, by definition in many cases, can change with the person's disposition. Uh, even the way I, um, I interact with my smartphone might change during the course of the day depending upon some ambient conditions and situations. And so this is where purely relying on the behavioral trait uh, may not uh, be the best thing to do, but one could augment it with the primary biometric trait. I think all I would add is, you know, if you're, for example, in the smartphone application, you have logged in, you're using it, um, and then you want to, say, open an app uh, like your bank, 
right? You wouldn't necessarily have to then log in again. So it could be used as a complimentary. I, the phone knows it's still you, right, because of the way your behavior is with your phone. You know, normally it might just go ahead and ask for a, bio, uh, you know, a physiological biometric, but if it has confidence that the behavior is consistent with your own behavior, then it can be used as a convenience. So one of the new uh, biometrics that was recently announced is the brain print. Okay, um, and the brain print is supposed to be like if they if they're like watching your how your brain is activated when you're solving problems, it sends off a signal, and the idea is that that signal is as unique to you as your fingerprint. Is the brain print real? You know, is it useful? Is it practical from a biometric standpoint? I think it's interesting. You know, when we say the word biometric. Um, you know, it, it implies and it imparts um, uniqueness and permanence right off the bat. But the reality is, you know, there's a continuum, and that's kind of the stuff that Arun was talking about, right? Some biometrics, you have the ability to differentiate people in the, you know, one in a million. But some biometrics might only have the ability to differentiate people in the one in a hundred. You know, so then it becomes, what is the use case? And is it an appropriate error um, rate for that use case? So there may be use cases that are appropriate for a brain print, you know, which I would expect would be on the lower end of the spectrum than the higher end of the spectrum, you know, but maybe in a hands-free environment where your biometric is not available. You know, people in hazmat suits, for example, you know, uh, military individuals, you, you know, there may be some appropriate, you know, um, uh, situations um, you know, people driving, et cetera, you know. So, so I, th I think it's, you know, I don't want to say that it works or doesn't work, but there may be applications that it could be appropriate for. Yeah, and if I could uh, quickly add to that, I completely agree. Uh, the use case question. must exist. And so without the use case, it is often difficult to say that um, whether, you know, one biometric prevails over the other. And in cases like brain waves, uh, perhaps there is a different way of um, analyzing and understanding who that person is rather than using a technology that might be viewed to be um, invasive. Uh, so there are seven or eight attributes that we often consider. Um, universality of the trait, uniqueness of the trait, permanence of the trait, whether it can be collected non-invasively, whether it can be easily circumvented, uh, whether it is applicable to the broad uh, demographic uh, group that is using the technology, and whether it can be easily incorporated into an existing application. And not many of the biometric traits uh, out there will meet all these criteria that is necessary in order to establish it as a primary biometric trait. So, you know, you talked, both of you talked a little bit about the technical challenges of advancing science in this area. Uh, but I'm wondering to what extent are there also policy and legal challenges that are also need to be addressed at the same time so that one can do science in this area? Oh, excellent uh, question. And I'm looking at the audience <laughs> and I uh, am observing many of my dear colleagues there uh, who will uh, definitely be bringing that up uh, later on. And one thing I must say here is that increasingly, Increasingly, uh, researchers are becoming more and more aware of the privacy and ethical implications of the technology they are building. And uh, let me just give you one example. Uh, maybe even 10, 15 years ago, when someone was developing face recognition algorithms, uh, they would often say, well, we want the performance number to be 95%, 99%. But now they pose the question differently. They say, we want to have 95% or 99%, but we also want to understand to what extent does it compromise privacy? To what extent does it leak information beyond just using it for recognizing an individual? And so these are questions that previously were not very explicitly considered, I must say, at least by graduate students working in computer vision and artificial intelligence. Certainly some were, but the majority were not. And I think that's where we are seeing a distinct shift. And the conversation in society is, uh, is facilitating that. We all understand, from the computer vision standpoint, the prowess of the technology and the ability of the technology to bring about massive changes 
in how certain things can be conducted. But at the same time, if I were to go and speak to my graduate student now, they would tell me, well, what are the privacy implications of what you're saying? And how do we address those privacy implications? How do we address those ethical implications? I think that's the biggest change in paradigm, at least that I've seen in my lab, happen over the past 10, 15 years, and I'm sure in Stephanie's lab as well, and in the center that's, uh, that uh, Stephanie is directing, and I'm one of the site directors there. That's the biggest change we have seen, that students and researchers are no longer just saying, let's get 99%. They're asking us, what is the cost of making it 99%? What is the cost to someone's privacy? What is the cost to the ethical implications of the technology? I think that's where the biggest change has been uh, observed. Yeah, and from my, my perspective, you know, as technologists, you know, we, we understand, you know, we're not Luddites. We like to see technology. We can see its benefits. We can see where, where it can uh, provide great value as some of the applications I talk about, but as many technologies, there's another side to it, right? And I think that's what our job is, right, as, as a community, is to, to put the guardrails in place to ensure. And as things go, usually the legal and societal sort of agreement lags the technology, right? And I think we see that in many, think, look, autonomous vehicles, right? Uh, we were having a conversation before about the steam engine, <laughs> right, you know, and, and the resistance to a train, right, that we, we wouldn't even think about today. Um, and so, so you, know, you know, there are concerns, you know, and, and I hope through this conversation um, we can help in, in, in mitigating some of those concerns and leading the way, right, you know, on terms of what, what laws and policies need to be in place. You know, and then recognizing it's just not about the United States and what we do, but how this impacts uh, folks around the world. So uh, it's always difficult to predict the future. But if we think about, you know, what is going to be possible, say, 10 years out, you know, what's just on the horizon? Like, what are the, like, advances are just about there that are likely to make a difference in biometrics in our everyday lives, you know, in the near future? Maybe I'll start on this one, because um, I wanted to dig into it a little bit more, but I, I felt like I should move along. So um, so the one that I think is really interesting is, is the one I brought up in, in the security, which is template security. And I briefly mentioned it. And what the goal is, is when you capture the biometric, you make a transformation of that biometric information. And when you transform it, that transform information, if it's stolen, cannot be put back to the original information. And we've generally called it template security, we've called it biometric crypto system, we call it fuzzy matching. Um, so these technologies could help us with some of the benefits, you know, from say a consumer um, maybe, maybe to utilize the technology such that you don't have to reveal a lot of private information in order to prove yourself to a bank you could utilize this stored template. Um, and so um, I think that's gonna make a major change. I'm seeing a shift. I used to ask at, at conferences you know, five years ago saying, does anybody know any company who's using this? And you know, nobody would ever tell me about a company using it. And today there's a lot of examples of companies who are either using it or uh, exploring how best to use it. I think, um uh, another attendant uh, area where there is um, tremendous potential and which we might be seeing in the horizon uh, is uh, these uh, privacy biometric sensors. Uh, so normally when you have a face camera, you would naturally assume it's taking a picture of your face. But increasingly, there is a push to put a rating on the camera such that certain cameras will capture your face but not your face. So there's going to be a canonical representation of your face, uh, which is not uh, really your identity, but it's allowing, say for example, if there is monitoring needed, to know what activities are happening, but without revealing a person's identity. And so one could imagine different grades of those type of sensors. Um, and so when you look up and you see a camera and it says category five versus category one, one would better understand what kind of information is being, is being gleaned. Uh, the second uh, uh, 
uh, uh, improvement uh, that, uh, or something that is coming up is uh, more of this notion of multimodal fusion. Um, not putting all our eggs in one basket and saying that, well, it's only fingerprint or only face. Being able to judiciously combine multiple traits becomes important. On one hand, um, you're allowing for the fact that not all technologies pertaining to biometrics are perfect. And so rather than leaving it in that imperfect mode, uh, being able to judiciously use multiple traits can help in uh, better recognizing individuals and lowering some of the false uh, match rates that can lead to uh, some um, untoward events. So um, those are areas also in which much investment has been made and perhaps in the near future, we will see some of those techniques being uh, unrolled as well. Great. Yeah, the, I think you're, I would agree with you both on those, but I was also thinking of another one that I'd like, to, uh, and that is in the area of human trafficking. Uh, from, uh, I know in our own work, which is on social network analytics and um, so on, that the combination of um, the advances in biometrics, the advances in real-time network analytics, the advances in understanding the pipelines that human traffickers use uh, is just about there to actually put a real curb and dent in that. And are there, there are other kinds of, you know, bad things happening to good people like that where you see biometrics as having a, a, a future in the nearest term? Definitely. Uh, we are working on a project uh, which um, looks at uh, videos which have uh, child exploitation videos. And uh, using a combination of face and voice, we are trying to detect uh, the victim as well as the perpetrator. Um, and so um, uh, these are technologies that are very important uh, because without knowing who the perpetrators of these crimes are, uh, it, is, um, it is very difficult to, to, to move forward. And so this is where talking about biometric fusion, previously the technology was just trying to look at face images. Uh, but, but, uh, but due to various reasons in many of these uh, uh, media, uh, we don't have the face image, but we do have other attributes, uh, voice attributes, for example. And so we are trying to use a, a confluence of these primary biometric traits and what we call as soft biometric traits, uh, like hair color, for example, in order to determine uh, who the participants in the video are, and hopefully that can be used to, uh, to capture um, uh, these perpetrators uh, in, in, in advance. Yes, and another area, and I think it, it's similar to the Andhar area, but now we're talking about folks that are refugees, you know, people who don't necessarily have a country um, but need an identity in order to um, a, a, use their refugee status, you know, to uh, get, you know, to, to help them, if that, that makes sense. So there is, um, United Nations has a, a um, program called ID2020. Uh, and what's interesting about their approach, um, they're exploring kind of a related technology to the template security technology, which is called decentralized identity. Right, and so our self-sovereign identity. So essentially what that allows is that an individual would have control over their biometric data, but still have a way to be able to prove who they are as they move um, you know, from, from one place to another. Um, and so I, I see this emerging as a really interesting field that can be used not just for refugees, but you know, each of us could have control, self-sovereign identity. Well, thank you both, and thank you all for attending this session. This is a wrap on this session. The next session, we'll look, dive more into the ethics and policy implications in this particular area, and so we hope to see you back here in a few moments for that as well. And I'd like to thank our speakers, both for doing the great research they've been doing, but also for their thoughtful remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone, to the 2021 Symposium on Biometric Ethics here at the Greffenstadt Center for Ethics and Science, Technology, and Law at Duquesne University. Once again, I'm uh, directing fellow John Slattery with the Greffenstadt Center. And our second session here is on ethical responses, possible and practical. And moderating the session, I have the pleasure to introduce one of my colleagues for the past year at the Greffenstadt Center, Dr. Nathan Koloner. Uh, Dr. Koloner is a senior instructor and director of business analytics at Seattle University, outside of his work as a fellow here at the Greffenstadt Center. His research is on the ethical development of machine learning, specifically regarding the creation of explainable artificial intelligence. His teaching revolves around organizational ethics, focusing on the ethical implications of organizations increasing reliance on digital technology. So without further ado, Dr. Nathan Colliner. Thank you, John, and uh, welcome to panel two. Um, this is a genuinely exciting panel for me, and I think it'll be a great addition to our conference today. If you notice the credentials of our speakers, they are both CEOs, uh, which makes this a different kind of panel in our conference, but also just different than um, probably all the panels at all the conferences that I've ever gone to. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing about that. I'm sure if, if uh, you, know, you do ethics case studies in your classes like I do, um, you, you try your best to make them as realistic as possible. Um, but, but at some level, we're kind of living in an ideal world when you do that, that kind of thing. So it's, it's like, well, they should have done X, they should not have done Y, hopefully they'll never do Z again, and then the bell rings. Um, and as a matter of fact, <laughs> you know, when you're trying to operationalize ethics in the world, when you're trying to actually do some good and change things, uh, there's just so many obstacles and pressures that must be navigated, and that is not easy to do. So uh, I, I'm really excited to hear from two people who are making their way in that world. So we have um, Liz O'Sullivan, and I should say that, that uh, Liz was actually on her way to Pittsburgh, and there was a situation just uh, last night, and after some scrambling, she graciously agreed to be here um, virtually. So I'm very excited to, to, she's, to, that we can still have her. She is the CEO of a company called Parity, who um, works to identify risks in AI models and then um, takes practical steps to reduce them. It's based on uh, intellectual property that was developed by a scholar named Ruman Chowdhury. Before that, um, Liz was involved in uh, founding a company called Arthur, and she took it just from its inception to being a huge multi-million dollar company. So we're uh, I'm excited to hear uh, Liz's perspective. We also have Reed Blackman with us, who started his career as a philosophy professor at uh, Colgate and University of North Carolina. He has now uh, founded and is the CEO of a company called Virtue, who uh, works in ethics and, and risk mitigation. Uh, he also is a senior advisor for Ernst & Young on their AI advisory board and a member of the IEEE, um, ethically aligned design uh, task force. And I might also mention that uh, I am developing a course on how analytics is changing management. And I put this really great article on the syllabus from Harvard Business Review. It's called How to Monitor Your Employees While Respecting Their Privacy. And it took me a good two weeks before I finally put together that the author of that article and the person on the panel today is the same person. So uh, we're very glad to have Reed here. Um, I think we're going to try to start with Liz. I don't anticipate any technical difficulties, but um, we'll, we'll uh, see if we can do this without any issues. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me OK? Is the sound coming through? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Just let me know okay. when you're ready for me. Yeah, you're good. Yep, you can, uh, good start, you can start your presentation whenever you're ready. Super. 
Okay. Well, I'm super glad to be here. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there with you in person. I had a family emergency come up and these things are happening all the time today in the days of COVID reality. So um, instead, glad to be here virtually. Um, some of my contact information is here on the screen, which I'm about to share with you. Uh, if, oh, sorry, host has disabled participant screen sharing. So maybe one small technical difficulty in the tradition of this, this <laughs> new world we live in, um, they're guaranteed. So um, in just a second, I will share the slide with you. And this slide has all of my contact information available. Uh, if you'd like to reach out to me um, to talk about some of these issues on a more practical level, I'm always happy to do things like that. As a philosophy undergrad myself, super invested in helping mentor people as they grow into the real and practical world. So I'm gonna try sharing my screen again. Um, and you should be able to see my cover slide Perfect. right now. Perfect. And yeah, so there's my contact information. And I'm sure any of the organizers would be happy to share it with you as well after the conference. So today we're going to talk about um, a notion called the, the notion of dual use technology, which was first prioritized um, in uh, science, really mainly during the uh, era where biological and chemical weapons were being developed. Um, of course, the most famous dual use technology is nuclear power, uh, born of the Manhattan Project. And in current technology, we're seeing a lot of this, um, you know, adopting of this frame framing to discuss some of these incredibly powerful AI based technologies, um, especially with regard to computer vision, as they do tend to have uh, the promise of certain utilities, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. And then uh, simultaneously, also some very grave dangers, which I'm sure many of the other presenters um, who I'm, I'm very excited for you to meet with some of my own personal heroes um, are going to talk to you about in greater detail. Um, and the quote I have on the board right now is one from president of Microsoft, Brad Smith, famously in his book called Tools and Weapons, sort of um, tried to minimize this notion of dual use by claiming that something as, as simple as a broomstick can be dual use. And, and perhaps that's true. You can use it to sweep your room. You can also use it to hit somebody on the head. Um, but to me, this is sort of a toy example that uh, minimizes the impact of something as ubiquitous as 24-7 um, authoritarian surveillance here in the United States and also making it widely available through our open source and research sharing mechanisms to entities all over the world, including authoritarian governments governments. Um, and we're here to talk about biometrics data. So I'm going to talk through just four short case studies um, in the time I have, some of which you may be familiar with. Uh, and this first one was a really big story. And for me personally, as a professional who was working in the AI field at the time, um, something that hit very close to home. And this is the notion of Ever AI, a company that was started in 2013, um, had been around for a very long time and wanted to give people the ability to search their photos using computer vision recognition. So it's pretty simple. Um, you could tag a face of your dog or your dad and, and simply type in dog or dad into your phone and find all of the relevant photos. And at the time, there was really nothing that could do this. Right now, we have it embedded in Google um, Photo Store. Now, even Apple is trying to you know, branch into this as well. And um, so you can see pretty, pretty good utility where we used to have to just thumb through to the, the rough date where we thought we took that photo and then others probably get lost in this massive trove that we've all accumulated on our phones over time. And what's interesting about this case is that simultaneously they were purporting to be claiming this data for one reason and gaining access through consent mechanisms, consent mechanisms on people's phones, um, while the other hand of the company was selling this information in the form of a trained um, facial recognition model that was then being sold to law enforcement agents um, all around the United States. Um, so what's interesting to me about this case is that we can see a really clear trail uh, from this consumer tech, which was popular with VC at the time, to a law enforcement tech or a civic tech. Um, and it became even more attractive to venture capitalists um, even despite the fact that FTC had dinged them really hard uh, for this repurposing of data, uh, they were actually able to raise $23 million just on their law enforcement use case alone, um, despite the legal action that took place. So this is, to me, an indication of the degree to which there is pressure on CEOs and product founders um, to, to go where the money is, right? And a lot of times that means the most lucrative contracts. And right now there's this grave imperative to repurpose biometrics data for the purposes of law enforcement, both domestically and, um, and abroad. So Ever AI is just one way where this data, which is collected for one purpose and may also have implications for another purpose, um, the way this happens, and it doesn't always make the news. 
Um, so I'm talking today about uh, a situation that, that was reported. This is actually um, from my own history uh, with a company called Clarify. And the New York Times was able to, uh, you know, confirm what we'd always suspected, that, that part of our demographics model, which is its form of facial analysis, really, which is uh, trying to identify somebody's gender, uh, race, and age um, using biometric data, uh, was created in part by data that was shared by OkCupid. Um, and the CEO confirmed this in the report, so I'm not sharing any uh, untoward information, but the way that this happened was not through, uh, you know, a monetizing agreement. You know, OkCupid publicly confirmed that they did not intentionally um, make any money off of this deal. Um, but I think it's important to also mention that, you know, a lot of these terms and services that we all sign up for are, are pretty ubiquitous. And so nobody ever reads end user agreements, right? Like I, I certainly don't, you would have to have a law, a law degree. And there was a study that said that if you were to, you would spend pretty much half your life doing this. Um, but it gives these companies pretty much the right to do whatever they want with it, especially in an advertising driven model like OkCupid. Um, so we can see that this was not advertised to anyone who was on this dating site. Um, it was actually an agreement that happened behind the scenes, um, be perhaps because the company had invested in, in Clarify, perhaps because um, it was just this camaraderie between founders. Um, but one way or another, it, it did get transferred. And, um, you know, and I think there's something to mention here. We, we talk so much about how big tech is really the source of all of this. But um, in my opinion, not enough is, attention is paid to the startup ecosystem where the power that these big tech giants have to influence the entire world uh, really boils down to competition, right? That they they have this wealth of data, uh, data sources that small upstarts can never have access to. Um, and instead, uh, they get more and more desperate to compete and will just sort of do whatever it takes to acquire this data. So again, you know, if, if not for the great reporting by the New York Times, nobody would ever have known that this happened or that this was going on. Um, but it is a very common arrangement that we find in AI startups in particular, where um, they may offer services in exchange for free data, just because that data is a lot more valuable to us. And so, of course, when I say data here, I mean our faces, right? And not just our, our personal information where we might have privacy concerns, but also security concerns where um, this data can, can go into training facial recognition models for law enforcement, or even creating reverse image database searching tools like PAMIs and some of the similarity, uh, similar use cases or, or brands around the world where the United States PAMIs is not the first one. In fact, it started in Russia. And so of course, proliferating here. And then ultimately, um, you know, Clearview AI is the clear example of how uh, social media dating site network can also inadvertently get incorporated into these biometric systems. And this last study, uh, second to last study, is one where I think we're all probably a little bit more familiar with it. Um, and I think it's important to touch on how uh, the promise or the so spoken promise of biometrics data tends to focus around, um, you know, certain issues which we could all agree are important, right? Um, in India, the facial recognition system claims that it has rescued missing people, right? And there's no objection there, right? Like we, we absolutely want missing people to be rescued, especially if they're elderly or mentally disabled. Um, and similarly, the issue of child pornography around the world is a major issue. Everybody wants to combat it. Everybody wants to save missing kids. Um, but when Apple announced that they were going to automatically scan any image photos of people that were uploaded to iCloud, uh, privacy communities around the world absolutely objected and very, very loudly. Um, so we have a very clear situation here where good intentions um, may actually be um, overshadowed by this desire to uh, to install ubiquitous surveillance. And so now this is this would be, if it goes into practice, and there's been a lot of pushback, one of the most comprehensive systems of consumer surveillance that exists on the market today. And I, I have a question here, is it, and, and that's really, do we believe Apple when they say that the reason they wanted to do this was to protect kids? Um, because I know that Apple has massive, massive business interests in China and abroad. Um, they've previously, you know, made very clear st statements to protect privacy, and yet simultaneously are launching this the most intrusive, the most invasive um, form of image scanning. So 
you know, do we believe that that this came from pressure inside the United States, where there's this very active privacy community who's been pushing back on it for a very long time? Or do we think that this is instead the, the push from a government, uh, perhaps it's China, perhaps it's Saudi Arabia, maybe it's a coalition of many different governments who are saying, in order for you to operate in our country, you have to provide us more access to your data, more, more surveillance. And is this claimed use of um, helping kids, is that really uh, the reason or is it just a good cover for this kind of intrusive surveillance? So, no one's probably going to have the answer to that. I'm sure it would mix of different things. But again, you know, thinking about the real world pressures that might emerge um, to you as someone who's working in a company where um, there's this notion of, of safety and then the question of actual harms that might come as a product of it. And there are many harms that we can identify here. Dissidents being flagged, um, you know, people who object to the government being put onto various lists. Um, you know, in some countries, this type of mechanism might mean a difference between life and death. Um, and so the freedom issue versus the safety issue, uh, there's a really big question about the degree to which that tension can exist and, and whether or not we believe that the claims of, of enhanced safety are true without any actual research um, or data that shows that, you know, these kinds of invasive technologies actually can reduce um, the instances of violent crime and uh, missing kids and so on and so forth. Um, but it's not always intentional or it's not even something that you can do without, um, it's not, so it, when I say intentional, what I really mean is it, it's not something that you can even prevent if you, if you are collecting data. So I'm going to shift ever so slightly to talk briefly about the health data, which is not necessarily biometrics, but with sufficient AI, it is possible to re reverse engineer somebody's identity from sufficient data points about their behavior, their lives. And I want to talk about the influence of, um, of health data uh, and how it could potentially help uh, law enforcement as well for surveillance and, and using biometrics information. So you can imagine when I'm talking about this health data, the same would apply to somebody like Facebook, who has a wealth of biometric information that could be hypothetically searched with a mugshot or a criminal photo. Um, and there's really nothing stopping uh, this access. So what I'm talking about is Verily is the health arm of Google. Um, which was, uh, you know, basically using these customer data points, our phones, our Google searches, whatever Google has access to, to try to infer things about the user's mental health and not just mental health, but other kinds of diseases and, and outbreaks and things like that, which we can all agree probably, especially in the age of COVID, not an inherently bad thing to do to want to track outbreaks or to want to um, help people with mental health issues. Um, but uh, you know, and it's very interesting to me that in, in October of 2020, in the, I'm um, sorry, it was, uh, yeah, 2020, sorry, during the Trump administration, right after the Florida shooting, uh, there was a, a very innocuous mental health executive order, wherein the president said, uh, you know, something along the lines of like, we, we, we think that school shootings are the result of mental health disorders. And so we want to do better to find these people and give them the help before it becomes a big issue. So we can disagree on whether or not mental health is connected to school shootings, and I would push back very heavily on that. But I think the interesting part of this is that politicians and uh, government regulators are often looking for quick fixes for what is, is essentially a systemic and societal problem. Um, and so if we think about uh, the try to connect the dots between these things, um, you know, how soon would it be or how easy would it be for the federal government or for local governments to surveil people for their symptoms of depression, right? Um, which we may have that have results from things like the pandemic, right? Like um, these are innocuous and they're not necessarily nefarious, but they are definitely ways for um, you know people to be identified, which I think is really the core of biometrics discussions that we're having today. Um, so I think it's really interesting because what people neglect in the software industry to acknowledge is that the moment you collect data, it becomes a, a subpoenaable bit of information. So those photos that you're collecting, that voice print that you're collecting, um, the behavioral data that may indicate that you are happy or sad or that you're having a struggle, um, you know, even just as long as you keep it, um, that can be subject to the law. And the law doesn't necessarily have to tell users when they want access to your data information. They can ask the companies or demand that they sign non-disclosure agreements. And so, um, you know, under the skies of public health, 
we see uh, the beginnings of what may one day become a national um, and unavoidable mental health surveillance network. So um, it's not enough to just simply have the best intentions, and it's certainly not enough to simply, um, you know, uh, do good business ethics and not do backdoor deals or things like that. Um, but just the simple action of collecting this information makes it available to the global surveillance network. And so I think it's very interesting um, from uh, a, a founder perspective that we see really good hygiene practices coming from, um, you know, certain entities like Signal, where if the law tries to subpoena information about people's chats or their IP addresses, they're simply not able to get it because Signal doesn't have it. Um, so I think, uh, you know, if, if we try to identify ways forward from here, uh, as, as students of these issues, as engineers, as product creators, as people who are employees of these large institutions, we need to be very careful about what we publish, what we collect. Um, we need to make sure that we have policies that have good enforcement mechanisms as a, as a populace, as, as a people who are voters who tried to you know, install election uh, officials who represent our views. Um, and importantly, you know, we need to collaborate with civil society as you all are doing today. I'm really excited about some of the speakers that you have lined up today. Um, and remember that when we are doing this research, we're really not working in a vacuum. So it's it's my goal at Parity um, and, and, and just personally as an activist to try to remind people that business isn't everything and that we ultimately do need to have these conversations and make decisions about the trade-offs in order to prioritize humanity over profit. And that's my talk. So thank you for coming today and thank you for your time. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me, everyone. Liz, thanks for your opening comments. Um, I wish you were here so we could debate stuff because I want to say some controversial things that you're going to disagree with. Um, and it's always fun to debate. Uh, my name is Reed Blackman. Yes, I'm a CEO. Please, um, it, you know, that means nothing. If you want to be a CEO, it's actually very easy. All you have to do is pay something like $750 to uh, register an LLC and just proclaim yourself CEO. And, you know, congratulations, you're a CEO. So, Nathan, you too can be a CEO for just the low, low price of $750. Okay, um, it's about that. Uh, all right, so I want to respond to a couple of things that Liz said, and then I want to say some controversial comments that I'm not totally sure I believe, but I'm increasingly inclined to the view that people's um, focus on privacy is the wrong place to focus. So, you know, Liz, let's fight. Um, okay, the first thing I want to talk about is whether technology is neutral. So this is something that, that Liz brought up. Um, I take it, and maybe I'm misunderstanding you, Liz, but I take it that the, the general view is something like, it's not really neutral because there's all sorts of ways people can use it that they didn't originally intend. Um, yeah, you, gather, you collected the data for this set of reasons, but actually it's being repurposed for those set of reasons. It's not really that neutral if it can turn out that the data can be repurposed in a variety of ways to visit various kinds of harms on people. Um, that's fair enough. I think that's, that's arguably one conception of what neutrality consists in. I think there's another conception that, to my mind anyway, is at least as equally nefarious as not knowing what company is going to acquire that data and what they're going to do with it. Um, so let's talk about machine learning for a second. Uh, you know, AI, machine learning, I'll use these things interchangeably. Um, I don't know people's level of familiarity with machine learning or ML, so I'll just give a complete crash course. It's very simple. First of all, machine learning, it's just learning by example software. It's, that's all it is. It's not. It's not very impressive if you call it learning by example software and marketers don't get really excited if you say, we've got this new learning by example software, but that's really what it is. You have an algorithm, you give it a bunch of examples, AKA data, and then it quote unquote learns something from that data. It's looking for various kinds of patterns in the data that you give it and the inputs. Um, that's your training data set. Uh, does some calculations, some of which we can't understand with our tiny human brains, and it gives an output. Yes, that's your dog. No, that's your, not your dog. Uh, yes, this person deserves an interview. No, they don't. Yes, they're at high risk of committing a crime in the next two years. No, they're not. Yes, they deserve an insurance, uh, approval for insurance. No, they don't, so on and so forth. Okay, so machine learning is learning by example, and the examples that you use can have a big impact on what kinds of outputs you get. Of course, I mean, they have a huge, <laughs> they have a huge impact because they're the training data. Those are the examples that your algorithm Algorithm is learning from. Okay, that's my crash course in machine learning. That's just learning by example. You got your input, your training data, or your examples, 
It learns what it learns something about those examples, so it can do a good job. One hopes at uh, making the right kinds of quote unquote judgments about what new cases look like, whether it's your dog or not, for instance. Okay. Now you might think, so look, this is just one kind of technology like any other. So let's talk about the screwdriver for a second, or the broom, as Liz brought up, and you say, oh, look, a screwdriver isn't, if you like, intrinsically ethical or unethical. It all depends upon the intentions of the user. If you want to build the atom bomb, bad intention, bad use of the tool, um, bad outcome, et cetera. You want to build houses for the poor, good intention, good use of the tool, uh, good outcomes, et cetera, et cetera. And so then you might think, all right, let's just grant for the sake of argument that screwdrivers are ethically neutral. There's ways to push on that view that I won't push on right now, but let's just assume for the sake of argument that is the case. Uh, and then you think, look, that's just what all technology looks like. It all depends upon the intentions of the user. Okay, now look at machine learning again. You are um, the, I don't know, you're an HR manager or you're a hiring manager within HR. You're using some fancy new machine learning software. You've, uh, you know, your, your boss purchased it for you and now you use it so that you can vet the tens of thousands of resumes that are coming into your, you know, into your system every day. Now, the, your intentions as that hiring manager can be totally pure. You don't want to be biased, you want to make the right hires, you want to give people the jobs they deserve, et cetera, et cetera. But you're using a tool, the software, the ML software, the AI software, whatever you want to call it, where various kinds of decisions were made about how to create that tool. And those decisions have ethical impacts. So what that training data looked like, um, where you set the threshold, or so when I say threshold, let's say it's a risk rating, um, and you distinguish between high risk, that's a red light, low risk is a green light, I'm oversimplifying of course. Let's say it's based on a certain score, if it's, you know, if, you, if the person gets a score of 67.39, that's where the threshold is. Uh, if they're above that, they're high risk, if they're below that, they're low risk. That depends, that determines whether the person gets credit or not. Um, where you set that threshold is gonna make a big impact on what kinds of decisions the hiring manager, for instance, is going to make down the line. There are also, um, so there's lots of software. I think Parity, I, actually Liz, I wanna hear more about what Parity does exactly, but there's, there's software out there that will take your outputs of your AI and tell you whether, so let's say it's distributing some good or service, like interviews or, or credit or whatever, um, and you wanna know whether or not the distribution is equitable or fair. You can use various kinds of quantitative metrics of fairness to see whether or not the distribution is fair. Big catch, the metrics are not mutually compatible. So you can't score well on all of those metrics at the same time. So you've got to make a substantive, qualitative, ethical judgment about what the appropriate metric for fairness is for this particular use case. That's a decision that's gonna be made by not, not you, the hiring manager, right? You're just an HR hiring manager. You are not choosing the training data sets. You're not a data scientist. You don't know um, what the appropriate metric for fairness is. You didn't even know that there were quantitative metrics for fairness. So now you get this tool to vet, these, to vet these candidates and you start using it with your pure intentions, but the tool that you're using has embedded in it, as it were, certain kinds of qualitative ethical decisions. Very different from a screwdriver, right? You're not worried about the ethical decisions that were made in the design of the screwdriver and how that impacts the end user. The end user, it's just their intentions that determine, we're, we're supposing for the sake of argument, it's just their their intentions of the user that determines whether or not it's an ethically good or an ethically bad use. But now, because ML is the thing that it is, certain decisions are reflected in the very design of the software, in the way it works, and so you're going to, it's going to have certain kinds of ethical impacts independently of the intention of you, the hiring manager. So that's one important way in which I take it that machine learning is not ethically neutral. It's not ethically neutral in the sense that its ethical impacts are not exhausted by the intentions of the user of the software. In contrast to a screwdriver where we're supposing the, the ethical impacts of a screwdriver are in fact exhausted by the intentions of the user. Okay, so that's one thing to say about ethical neutrality. Um, there's one, actually I'll say one more thing. You might think that a screwdriver just lying around doesn't incentivize anyone to do anything in particular. It might enable it in some way, but it doesn't sort of call out, hey, build a house, build a bomb. It just sort of sits there um, until someone comes along and says, oh, I should use this tool. 
machine learning is not quite like that. Um, it actually does in some sense, um, that we can cash out later if you like, incentivizes or encourages people to engage in a certain kind of activity. And that's because machine learning works precisely because there are, there's training data. No training data, you have no machine learning. No examples, you have, no, you have nothing to learn from. So what does this mean? Well, if I wanna use this new powerful tool called machine learning, I better go out and collect a ton of data. It's a, it's a necessary condition for my using this tool. To put it slightly more dramatically, machine learning, the nature of the beast of machine learning, encourages or incentivize, incentivizes violations of privacy. Because it's, as it were, telling you, this is a metaphor, again, we can cash it out, but it's, a, it's telling you, go collect as much data as you can about whomever you can, so that you can train the system. So that's another way in which it's not neutral in the sense that a screwdriver is neutral because there's nothing about the nature of the beast of a screwdriver that calls out to its users, engage in a certain kind of activity that is perhaps ethically questionable. Machine learning does incentivize or encourage it because insofar as you wanna use the tool, you gotta go out and collect a bunch of data and you might do it in nefarious ways. You might you know, purchase data from OKCupid or whatever. Okay, so that's ethical neutrality. Did I start a timer? Liz, you're 23 minutes in. <laughs> that's when I started the timer. Uh, so I don't really know how far I'm in. What do I have, another 10 minutes or so? Okay. Um, I'll say one thing, um, Liz, I don't think you, you, you had this in a slide that I don't think you talked about, and we're talking about responsible AI. This is sort of my, um, there's a lot of talk about responsible AI now, trustworthy AI. Um, in the context of talking about AI ethics, this strikes me as very weird. <laughs> um, people talk about AI ethics, and I don't know why there's a, I mean, I have my suspicions. There's a transition from talking about AI ethics to responsible AI. And I actually think that there's something potentially dangerous about this way of talking. Um, and the reason is that it pulls, you, when you talk to people about whether they're engaged in AI ethics practices, they'll say, oh yes, we have a robust responsible AI program. And you say, I'm sorry, I said, I said AI ethics, you said responsible AI. And what's responsible AI? Well, responsible AI typically includes a bunch of other things that are required for AI practitioners to, to do well or for companies to do well. So it will include things like cybersecurity practices, having robust engineering practices to make sure that things are actually functioning properly, um, regulatory compliance, all these other things that are in the mix that are not what I would call straightforwardly ethical issues. And then what you get company, what companies tend to do is they score themselves on how well they're doing on responsible AI. Regulatory compliance, check. Cybersecurity, check. You know, so they're, they're scoring well on the responsible AI programs, but that's because they've thrown a bunch of stuff into the bucket that they know they can score well on already, like model robustness. Um, but the ethics stuff goes to the wayside. And it's particularly concerning when the ethical concerns, um, as Liz has pointed out, outstrip, in some cases anyway, outstrip the regulatory and legal concerns because advances in technology have gone faster than advances in um, developing regulations, et cetera. Okay, so that's just a word of warning about responsible AI. Okay, so that's two things we've talked about so far. One is the way in which I think machine learning is not ethically neutral. Um, the second is how people talk about AI ethics I think matters quite a bit. Um, and now I wanna say the controversial stuff about privacy. Um, again, you know, I'm a philosopher so I like to put things out there that are controversial and people are gonna disagree with. Um, so, okay, the first thing to think about, I think, when we think about when there's people are talking about privacy is that there are three lenses or perspectives or angles from which you can think about privacy. One is a cybersecurity angle. Who has access to the data, under what conditions, so on and so forth. That's straightforward cybersecurity. Um, there might be some ethical issues in the neighborhood. There's a thing called cyber ethics, but there's cybersecurity is one way of thinking about privacy. Who has access to the data, under what conditions, for how long, what can they do with it, so on and so forth, okay. Then there's regulatory compliance, um, especially for those of you, you know, some of you might be familiar with GDPR in the EU, so um, European Union, GDPR is the general protection data regulation, I think I have that right. And then there's CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act. So these are various regulations that are in place that companies need to be compliant with. 
And so sometimes when you're talking to people about data privacy, what they have in mind is compliance with existing regulations. Um, now, what's missing from this, from my perspective anyway, is privacy from an, from an ethical lens. What does it mean to respect people's privacy from an ethical perspective? So here's how I like to think about privacy. I don't think about it as a passive state of being in which people don't know certain things about you. Um, think about your, you go home, you go to your bedroom, um, and you've got this ability to draw the shades, right? You don't want people to, you know, you want your privacy. But it's not a passive state of being where people merely can't, uh, can't see you. It's an, a capacity that you exercise. It's a capacity to draw the shades. Furthermore, if somebody knocks on your bedroom door and you say, yeah, come on in, they haven't violated your privacy because you've exercised your ability to reveal certain kinds of information about yourself uh, that you're not willing to reveal to other people. So privacy is not just not having people or organizations know certain things about you. It's a capacity that you exercise, a capacity to control who has access to your information, under what conditions, what they're permitted to do with it, so on and so forth. And notably, that kind of control is not what cybersecurity is about, right? Cybersecurity people, strategists, are not focused on, let's make sure that people who are on our website have increased control over the data that they reveal on the site. That's not what they're doing. And regulatory compliance, at least in the US, um, you, is not trying to give you that kind of control. They're, they're, you know, GDPR is, is, is to some extent doing that. Um, in Germany, actually, they, they're, they're pretty strict about this. They have something, they abide by what's called informational self-determination, which is music to a philosopher's ears, but jargon to gibberish to most other people. So informational self-determination in the sense that, look, you've got a right to bodily self-determination, which is to say you have a right to control what happens in and to your body, for the most part. Um, and informational self-determination is akin to that. So you've got control over what can happen with and to your data. Okay, so I think that when, we, when we're thinking about privacy from an ethical perspective, what we're thinking about is a certain kind of capacity, more specifically it's capacity to control your data. Who has access to it, what they can do with it, so on and so forth. Okay, now, if you think, then here comes the controversy. That I take to be not uncontroversial, but um, fairly benign. Here's the controversial bit. I'm just not convinced that we should be worked up over informational self-determination. I'm just not, I'm not convinced. Uh, the headline is, the conclusion is something like, I'm not, I'm, I'm not so much concerned about what data organizations have about me as I am concerned about the bad things they can do with that data. It's not the case that if someone has some data about me or a bunch of people, because it's never about just me, of course, um, that that's the way you get to do a lot of really bad things. Whether it's physical harm, whether it's emotional harm or mental harm, whether it's uh, discriminatory hiring algorithms or risk ratings in the criminal justice system or discriminatory credit lending algorithms, I'm, I'm afraid those things are going to happen. The data enables them to do that kind of thing, but the mere fact that they're enabled to do those kinds of things, they can harm me with certain kinds of information about me, it doesn't follow from that that my, that my privacy has been violated. Privacy just strikes me as the wrong concept. Um, you know, co compare, the, compare the following. Um, I see, you know, let's say that, uh, I don't know, I'm at work and there's this, there's this guy at work, uh, his name is Achilles, and uh, every once in a while the, the, the jo on the job there's a, there are fire drills or something like that, or there's an alarm goes off to prepare for a shoot or something, and every time I notice that Achilles, he keeps covering his heel. I'm like, that's weird. This guy Achilles keeps covering his heel. <laughs> um, maybe his heel is particularly vulnerable. Turns out, you know, you fast forward, um, I get into a fight with Achilles and I realize, oh, this guy's heel is pretty vulnerable and so I attack his heel. <laughs> It'd be weird to complain that the, the wrong that I, that I visited upon him when I attack his heel and I render him completely immobile or dead, uh, that I violated his privacy. <laughs> that's just a weird, that strikes me as conceptually weird to say, oh, you, you know, you did two things wrong. You know, one, you killed him, and two, you violated his privacy because you found out that his heel is vulnerable. That just strikes me as, as odd. <laughs> uh, 
And then the analogy, of course, is that, yeah, companies gather a bunch of data about us, which enables them to do great harms, and we should do everything we can to stop them um, from visiting those harms upon us as individuals and as a society as a whole. It simply doesn't follow from that fact that anyone's privacy is being violated when they do those things. Of course, your privacy can be violated, but it's not obvious that the fact that they've got some data about me entails that my privacy has been violated. It may very well be that we want to stop them from gathering certain kinds of data so that they're not enabled to do those bad things, but again, stopping people from acquiring the necessary means to visit harms upon someone doesn't entail that those necessary means are privacy violations. That just seems like a total non sequitur to me. So focusing on privacy just seems weird to me as opposed to let's focus on the set of ethical risks uh, that companies can realize. The, let's take a look at the probability of them realizing those risks and the, the severity of those risks, and let's do everything we can to stop those things from happening. But having this arguably overwrought concern over their infringing upon my informational self-determination, that just strikes me as, I think, I think it strikes me as totally misplaced. <laughs> um, it's just not relevant. And then you combine that with the fact, I think it's a fact anyway, this is an empirical claim, so I don't have any special access to this. Um, Asking the average person to have control over all their data is just bonkers. <laughs> I mean, most people don't even know what the word data means, let alone metadata. Um, who has the time? <laughs> you know, forget about reading the user agreements. Give me a portal that shows me all the data that's out there and give me control over it. I'm just not going to do it. I'd rather, watch, I'd rather watch Squid Games. I don't have that kind of time or bandwidth or interest. So the idea that we're going to safeguard people's privacy by giving them increased, increasing control over their data seems to me like a logistical non-starter. Okay, I should probably stop now. I could rant more, but that's what I got. Thank you so much. Looking forward to uh, looking forward to your questions and especially your pushback. Thank you so much, Reed. Um, I'll have a question, uh, which might turn into a little debate, and then I'll turn it over to some audience Q and A. So please be thinking of of the questions that you have. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start with, with your last thing, both because controversy is, is kind of fun, um, but also I'm just really uh, curious if, if there is uh, like some genuine disagreement here or if it's just the way things are described. And I, I, I don't wanna characterize as uh, Liz's position, she'll do that for herself, but I'm seeing myself as sort of in the middle of that. Um, I used to not be very excited about privacy because it seemed like privacy was just about anonymization. It was just about taking things away. And it just seemed inevitable that people are always gonna be able to put things back together and re-identify you. And so is this like stacking up sandbags to keep the tide from coming in? Um, but I more recently discovered, and uh, some of you probably know much more about this, but differential privacy, which instead of taking something away is adding noise into the data, uh, which does protect individuals' privacy but, um, but you can still extract a lot of value from the data. You just need a lot of statistics and a lot of data. To me, like once I, once, I, once I put all that together, I was like, oh, privacy is really interesting and has a, an amazing future maybe. Um, so <laughs> I guess maybe we'll, let's start with, with Liz. I'm just curious, are, are you, where are you in the privacy? Like this is what we need to worry about. This is, this is the ball game. Um, where are you on that on that spectrum? Yeah, great question. And so, you know, colloquially, I call myself a member of the Tinfoil Hat Club. Um, but I think I, I really want to respond to some of the, the concepts that Reed brought up in his uh, talk, which is, you know, this notion of we having to be the ones that control our privacy, right? To open the window as you speak. And I want to counter that by saying it's it's really not something that we in in the privacy community think should be the case, right? Because you're totally right. If, if I were to tell you all of the settings that I have turned on in my uh, mobile phone and on my laptop, that's a lot of work for people to do. And it's a lot of technical understanding about the consequences of what they do. Um, but that's not really what we mean when we when we want to use, use laws to prevent people from, um, you know, violating privacy. It's really about the harm, right? And, and so, you know, for, for people like women who are posting selfies on Instagram, I don't think any of them thought that they would one day be able to be shazammed, you know, like take this photo of me and then um, give whoever's looking at me from across the bar or across the room, uh, my identity, right, my name, which is then, you know, easily 
daisy chainable to all of the other information about me, including my home address, right? Like that's the nightmare scenario. Um, and so stalking is a real concern um, and PIM eyes is really enabling this. But, um, you know, I also think that we need to be aware of these vectors where People may not understand that they are inviting law enforcement surveillance into their lives. Um, for instance, every time you do a search on Google or when you walk past a certain point in, in time and space, which with, with your Wi-Fi turned on or with your Bluetooth turned on. Um, and what I'm referring to are two new, relatively new mechanisms that law enforcement use, um, which are rife for abuse and also for false identification of people who have supposedly committed crimes. And those are keyword search warrants and geofence warrants, right? So there's no way to describe these two concepts without calling them a dragnet surveillance. And there was some really great reporting actually yesterday, very timely, that demonstrated that some of these geofence warrants are not used in the cases of child kidnapping or in murder, right, where we might, like some people might be motivated to give over that control and in defense of public good. We're talking about a case where a geofence warrant was requested uh, for a crime of throwing large rocks, right? And so there's really no defense for um, people who are accused in this way to even in some cases find out that the reason they find themselves in, in a court of law having not committed any crimes under a case of mistaken identity is because of this incredibly powerful mechanism that defense attorneys don't even really understand. Importantly, because there's no requirement that prosecutors or that police officers demonstrate the, the way in which they, they, they um, use this technology, right? And so in particular, I'm thinking about facial recognition. We know that there have been at least three documented cases of this Notably, all of them are people of color, right? And the defense attorneys don't even have the ability to know whether facial recognition was part of the investigation. So um, this this notion of like privacy, maybe not the best mechanism or word, that's perfectly all right. I think it's really more important to talk about societal harm um, and to talk about ubiquitous surveillance and its effect on civil liberties. So I guess, you know, the privacy is sort of the downstream effect through which we can examine these issues. But ultimately, we're talking about dissidents who are objecting to their governments and trying to stay safe and who may not be able to safe if they use commercially available products. And importantly, they probably don't know um, that this system is so full of holes that create this really vast power dynamic. And it's a very significant imbalance of power between the accused and the law enforcement um, who are surveilling them and collecting all this information. So, um, you know, just just a small counterpoint to some of the, the good points that Reed made. Yeah, thanks. Liz. I think that that's really helpful. Um, so one, one thing I want to say to clarify is that I think that there's obviously certain kinds of surveillance that are really bad. I don't think that using the term surveillance for the kinds of data that, say, consumer websites collect when you're on their site should count as surveillance. That seems to me uh, too, too large of a word or something like that. Um, that, I mean, is all data acquisition surveillance? Surveillance strikes me as a particularly emotionally charged word, arguably an ethically charged word, um, and it just doesn't, it's just not obvious to me that just the fact that someone's acquired my data about what shirts I looked at means they're surveilling me. The other thing is that surveillance connotationally has the, uh, is, it implies that someone is looking, some, someone is looking. But for a lot of the data that we generate, no one, no, no one is looking. Your data becomes part of a massive data set that's not gonna get examined on an individual level. Even if it did, it would be, it'd be the, ex the massive exception to the rule. And they're taking the, the data, they're running analytics on it, they're training their, their models with it. Um, so it's not, that's, that's, it's not the same thing as, you know, the Eastern European, Eastern, East German government surveilling your every move. It's, it's, so the word surveillance, I think, sort of, uh, it, it is appropriate in some circumstances. In some circumstances, obviously, we should guard against it. We should not just guard against it, but proactively fight against it. Uh, but using the term surveillance to cover any case of data acquisition seems to me to to beg the question about whether there's a privacy violation or not. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention in response to, to your question, Nathan, is that anonymity also strikes me as sort of the wrong thing to focus on. So when we think about Cambridge Analytica, the Cambridge Analytica scandal, people got really worked up and said, oh, people's, people's privacy is being violated. And they also said, 
and, you know, so, so remember Cambridge Analytica collects all this user data, pro Facebook profiles, and they use it to target ads. This person's particularly susceptible to this kind of Trump ad versus that kind of Trump ad, et cetera, et cetera, to push the election. Uh, susceptible to certain kinds of disinformation campaigns, and so we give that. Now, suppose I just stipulate, and I don't know this to be the case, so I'm just gonna stipulate that all of the information that Cambridge Analytica had was anonymized. So no one, you know, Cambridge Analytica couldn't know you know, they were serving an ad to read black men. They just knew it was, you know, user 47597710 who looked at ad number 43, blah, 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 blah. It's sufficiently anonymous, but that doesn't stop them from saying, oh, user 4749, blah, 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 should get this kind of ad because that'll move the needle for that, that user. I'm anonymous in the system, but they can still visit the harm that they want to visit. So again, anonymity just doesn't strike me as the the central ethical concept when talking about you know, what's going on here. Invasions of privacy don't strike me as relevant here. It's the, it's the, the ability to move, you know, to deceive the public at a grand scale and alter elections in a fateful way that strikes me as particularly important. Privacy just strikes me as something of a red herring. Uh, yeah, Liz, and if you want to follow up real quick, that would be great, and then we'll move into our audience Q&A. Sure, sure. And perhaps, you know, there may be something to the notion of, of using the word surveillance delicately, but I think, you know, if we were to ask, you know, would this be considered a system of surveillance? If every single one of your communications in email, every single one of your Google searches, the permanent record of your locations, your movements throughout time and space, um, who you visit, right, with, with the IP addresses get connected to actual physical addresses in a, in a vast database that uh, Google actually created when they had their um, you know, the satellite cars driving around. So um, all of this is to say that this permanent record is created and is available to creative police officers who are able to search for who searched for what, who went where, um, and then reverse engineering their, their addresses actually from that. Because while you may say that anonymity exists in this sufficiently large set of data, um, plenty of statistical research has been conducted that says with just 18 points about a person, 18 things that they like, you can actually re-engineer re their identity from it. And from their identity, it's a short skip and a hop and a jump over to their name and their um, you know, physical address. So you know, something like advertising tracking, for instance, is claiming to be um, anonymous because ultimately, as Reed says, you, you are nothing more to this vast interconnected system of all of the websites that you visit and all of the places that you go, uh, what's known as an advertising ID that lives on your phone. Um, and yet that advertising ID is exactly the bit of information that the FBI needs to surveil people, and I will use that word there, um, who are visiting mosques and using a Muslim prayer app, right? So this is how this system may appear to be, um, and I will call it ethics washing, right, for privacy preserving technology, that in the end, you know, if, if we're trying to prevent um, dissidents from being surveilled or religious groups from being surveilled disproportionately, um, it's not anonymous at all. So I do think that the notion of privacy here is is one that is supercharged. But ultimately, what we're not we're not talking about privacy. We're talking about freedom from law enforcement intervention as you go about your daily life. Yeah, I, it just might be that um, I, I agree with I think everything you said. Um, ex, you know, except that I wouldn't. You know, uh, the I'm I'm concerned about. Let's just say don't um, unjustifiably surveil a certain kind of people, especially when it's discriminatory. Um, how you manage to do that, whether it's through the acquisition of data, inferences that you make from the data you've acquired, or just some oracle-like intuition about what people are up to, um, don't, don't do that. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, but, 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 my, but privacy has been violated. Okay, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna get worked up about my privacy being violated like someone had read my diary. Now, I'll say, I'll say one last thing. The sort of the, the, the operations and all the goings on of all the data collection is really creepy. It's very creepy. But creepy, as far as I can tell, just means, seems dangerous. Okay? There are people who are creepy. Like, they make a joke and they laugh and they make eye contact with you for too long after the joke and they keep laughing. <laughs> That's creepy. <laughs> but they're not actually dangerous, they're just sort of weird. <laughs> uh, Organizations can engage in really creepy behavior, that is to say seemingly dangerous behavior, but seemingly dangerous behavior is not unethical behavior, all else equal. Um, the actual behavior that they engage in that's dangerous is the dangerous stuff. So creepy stuff doesn't bother me so much as, um, you know, creepy behavior is just sort of smoke, and then you have to go investigate whether there's actual fire. But creepy behavior is not as such unethical. 
Excellent points, many excellent points, both of you. Um, we have uh, at least 20 minutes before lunch, so um, I can tell that some of you are, have the wheels turning and are <laughs> gearing up to ask questions, and we'd love to hear from you. And I should also say that, um, you know, Liz and I are, are having a really fun, interesting debate with Nathan about privacy. But as Nathan pointed out, Liz and I know quite a bit about ethics, you know, in corporate America. So if you want to ask us questions about that, you're totally welcome to. That's what I was going to ask. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, so, you know, I, I hear your, your point, um, you know, about, you know, where to draw the line, you know, so, so it, it, if it's really about the action, right, you know, in the end, the misuse, right, you know, which could be by corporate America, which could be by law enforcement, you know, how do, what do, what do we do next, right? What kinds of things should we be doing um, in terms of, um, you know, because I don't, I don't think the answer in, in, in it's probably not even viable at this point is to put everything back into the box, right? And say, you know, forget it, right? We're done, you know, because I, I you know, I see positive uses, right? Um, that can be used uh, with AI, that can be used with, you know, in more particular biometric recognition. So, so what's next? Um, and maybe both might want to answer. Liz, you can't sure. see, but I'm, not, I'm nodding to you. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm very, very inspired by um, local politics right now. And I think that many of us can uh, feel and have an understanding that our federal government, uh, due to the divides in this country, have been sort of at a stalemate over privacy regulation, even though the GDPR beat us to it more than 10 years ago at this moment. Um, we all want it, right? It's bipartisan. Everybody wants privacy regulation. And so absolutely do campaign to your senators and to your elected officials. Um, if you care to allow certain elements of this technology, but outlaw certain other applications of it, just as we would want for advertising, right? Advertising on its own seems like it's okay, right, in most cases, but we don't like these downstream effects where the FBI gets access to surveil Muslims disproportionately, right? But what we do see are these incredible um, localities and cities that are so passionate about facial recognition and, and its use and its implications for people of color and marginalized communities, taking a stand and creating really powerful laws to prevent that kind of abuse of the technology. Um, so I, I do believe that there is a way forward here and it's gonna take us a, a time, a, like a good amount of time um, in order to, to create a system of law that actually understands modern technology and the implications and reckons with the amount of power that this technology gives, not just to the government, but to private companies who become actors as powerful as governments. Um, you know, we need to rein in that power. And I think having a, a good personal identification of where your line is um, would make for a really great letter to your city council, to your House of Representatives candidate, to your senator, mayor, governor. Um, if you live in their state, if you live in their area, they have to respond to you. They have to listen to you. And I can tell you firsthand as somebody who lives in New York City, you know, my city council member agreed to have a meeting with me immediately and signed on to something, a piece of legislation that we were pretty passionate about last year. So, um, in terms of what we can do, so I think everything Liz said is ex exactly right. Um, you know, one thing that, so one thing to do is is start thinking about existing law and see how we can extend that. So for instance, anti-discrimination law is behind the times with bias mitigation techniques and machine learning. It's gotta get updated. Um, thinking about how do we choose the appropriate metrics for fairness in a given use case, we could, you know, I think the industry um, needs guidance on that, uh, you know, regulatory guardrails around that stuff. Most generally, I think we, the tech industry generally needs to look at healthcare because healthcare, no, no industry has done better than operationalizing ethics than, the health, than healthcare, right? You've got institutional review boards, you have ethics committees at hospitals, it's professionalized, everyone understands that healthcare providers, handlers of data, et cetera, need to meet certain kinds of ethical standards. So I think a lot of what needs to be done is let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's look at what healthcare has done. Obviously, it's not perfect, but it's a, it's a really good start. And let's see what we can adopt. So for instance, the IRB. I don't see how we don't have eventually something like IRBs in the production of certain kinds of technologies. I just don't, 
because we've talked a lot about privacy, we've mentioned discrimination a lot, especially in the, in the, in the context of machine learning. There's issues around black box algorithms. Um, but a lot of the ethical risks of, the, of these emerging technologies, um, including in healthcare, are use case specific. And you're not gonna get general regulations to, to handle use case specific risks very well. The only way you're going to get it, as far as I can see, is to have something akin to an IRB throughout um, product development, production, monitoring, et cetera. Um, and hopefully with some kind of a third party verification so the IRB is independent. Reed, you're the master of transitions today because now we're going to uh, have a question from an actual healthcare e ethics expert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you speakers for two fabulous presentations. My name is Jerry and I'm a healthcare ethicist. Uh, and I think you put your, your finger on a really important point. The question I was going to ask you, uh, and, and you lead into the very thing I'm inquiring about, is where do you assess us being in terms of developing a grammar of discourse about ethics in AI uh, terrain? And I, I really like the way you refer to uh, healthcare because where, where we are, I see ourselves now with AI is somewhere akin to where healthcare ethics was 30 years ago. And it did develop a grammar of discourse and became very sophisticated. And I really like the idea of the IRB that you're putting forward, the object of recognized bodies who have uh, authority to distinguish between what is going to occur and what is not going to occur and, and give public you know, display and rationales for their outcomes and decisions. Um, so I want to applaud that very much. Uh, but I, I'm curious uh, about the more fundamental question about where would you assess our grammar of discourse in AI ethics? Are we, I mean, uh, your, your, your commentary on privacy is, is, is utterly revealing. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, are you, do you feel positive that we've got a good control of the terrain of discourse? Or are we just beginning to figure out what the grammar is? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm, actually, I'm actually working on an article right now with a colleague about here's how to have better conversations or here's how to take the conversation to the next level. Uh, so, I mean, I think that, and, and Liz, I think you would agree with this, that the quantity of conversations has vastly increased. The quality, yeah, I don't, I don't know if Liz, you'd agree with that part, but I think the quality is, it's sort of plateaued. Um, people give lots of examples of bad things happening and they say that's a really bad thing and then the next person stands up and gives other examples of really bad things happening and then everyone says, yes, that's a bad thing too. Um, and, doesn't, and then we talk about biased data sets, for instance, and we say bad, biased data sets are bad. Uh, but the truth is that, it, you know, it's not that there's a lack of a grammar. The, the, the people, we, the, it, the issue is partly that the people who have the ethics expertise don't look at the technological underpinnings for the sources of the ethical risk. And so you, and then the technology people don't have the ethics training to clearly articulate what the ethical risks are or to identify them or to identify appropriate ethical risk mitigation strategies, tactics. So it's less that there's a lack of appropriate grammar or way of talking about this and more that the ethicists, this is the way that I would put it anyway, the ethicists and the technologists are not talking together enough so that they can go deeper on the problem and say more than biased data sets, discriminatory algorithms, black box, you know, because you get this high level, black boxes are bad, they're really scary, it's like the creepy thing. But some black boxes are fine. I mean, if I'm just using a black box to, to, to predict when the screws are gonna to arrive to the warehouse, who cares if I can't explain it as long as it's accurate. There might even be some, you know, cancer diagnosing um, AI software that's phenomenally accurate. Um, or you can use precision or recall, whatever the appropriate metric is in this case. But um, you, that's a black box model, but you might think, well, look, the black box model is 99% um, more accurate, you know, has 99% accuracy, the, destroys the best human doctors in terms of predictive success, um, much, much better than a non-black box model but all the conversation is black boxes are bad, as opposed to, okay, let's think carefully about why explainability is a good thing, when it's a good thing, to what extent it's a good thing in the given use case, and then think carefully about what are the cases in which we want to prioritize explainability versus accuracy, if, if they're in the cases in which there's a trade-off. So I don't think it's a lack of grammar, I think it's just a lack of depth on the issues, and it stays at the level of these things are bad, don't, nobody do those things. 
Yeah, I'll agree. There's some merit to that idea that like the ethical harms are concrete and predictable, and yet we seem to be circling around on various definitions of things. And um, I, I'm not sure I would agree entirely that the degree of quality of these conversations has plateaued. Um, but I will agree that uh, absolutely the grammar is still in flux. It's it's something where I'm starting to see a fractioning of the community where something as simple as like what an algorithm is or what bias means can be extremely contentious. And, and the, the sides are sort of starting to gel and formulate around like, you know, the tech is neutral, tech is the only solution to all of our problems crowd. And then people who are saying, wait, these are societal problems that we actually do have a very robust vocabulary for. And now it's just our job to kind of translate that into what it means for machine learning. Um, so it's been very interesting to me. And I'm glad to hear that there are some parallels that you've experienced personally um, to the person asking the question um, that, you know, this is natural, right? When we have new technology that we're reckoning with and we have new concerns that we're reckoning with, um, you know, I, I do think that you know, wanted to make a small point that just the, the kind of couple of examples that people tend to bring up, um, you know, and maybe we're repeating them too much. But I think part of the reason of that is, is that there's so much secrecy that prevents us from getting access to really understand how severe these problems are at scale. Um, and again, it comes back to that really vast power dynamic between, you know, you can't FOIA Google and they don't have to tell you, you know, anything that they don't want to tell you. So we don't know how pervasive, you know, to some degree these requests are. Um, unless they report it voluntarily, which you know we're campaigning to get them to do, but we only have so much power to do that. Um, so I do think that the, the the terms have been have been identified. Like we know what we need to define, but that there are you know two or three different camps of people who are still defining them differently, and there is going to have to be some sort of compromise um, or common common ground that's reached, and we're not there yet. I, I want to say one one last thing. Not um, I think Liz is right. So. One way in which there's not a common grammar is that there are different parties in the AI ethics field who are trying to accomplish different things. So there are, there are people um, like, um, I think this is fair to say, so there's a, the AI Now Institute out of NYU. I think it's fair to say that they're a fairly activist organization. They'll use the language of undoing power structures, for instance. Um, and that's a useful language to use if you're an activist and you want to undo certain power structures and influence politicians and influence um, a, a more general populace. CEOs, chief data scientists, chief, <laughs> chief analytics officers, they're not particularly interested in undoing power structures. They're quite happy <laughs> with those power structures. Um, and so if you, sort of, if you spoke to them in the language of undoing power structures uh, as an AI ethical uh, you know, agenda, that would just fall on deaf ears. So for me, I talk about AI ethical risks and AI ethical risk mitigation. So, but you wouldn't necessarily use that if you're trying to convince or you're trying to rally a general populace behind a certain kind of cause. So there, there, is, a, there, is, there is different language that, it's, that is being used and it often depends upon who your audience is. And if you're talking to a corporation, you wanna talk the language of ethical risk mitigation, which is also reputational and regulatory and legal risk mitigation. But if you're more of an activist, you might use the language of undoing power structures. Um, you might use the language of um, uh, making sure that you don't continue to oppress the historically marginalized, whereas you might talk the language of protected subpopulations um, if you're talking to the general counsel in, in, a, in a corporation. So there are, there are some places where the language is different depending upon your audience. John? Uh, yeah, so I, I wanted to sort of dive in a little bit to to what you said there about sort of corporations having sort of you know review boards and how do we how do we use a scalpel instead of a hammer in dealing with some of these issues and bringing up the issue of Facebook, right? Obviously, I'm sure both of you are really aware of everything that's going on and all the things that have been revealed in the last month. And I just you know I I was really struck by in all these the whistleblower documents, it was clear there there were several panels within Facebook that we're actually trying to do the right thing here, that we're giving a lot of suggestions and, and you know, sometimes 10 different suggestions that would have mitigated a lot of these risks. And then they were rejected and said, well, actually we're gonna do the 11th thing, which actually keeps our profits up and goes towards that. So, I mean, working in this corporate space, how, I mean, it's, it's really hard to say, how can we possibly, you know, sure you can talk about risks, but in the end, if the company internally, you know, outside of whistleblowers, you know, if, people don't have a whistleblower and they're internally not going to face any risks except, you know, except their shareholders because they don't have to reveal any of these internal decisions to anybody else. 
how, how can we make ethical progress here and, and what might that look like in, you know, in response to everything we've now learned from Facebook? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. And I think uh, one that, that has been su summarily demonstrated by Francis Haugen that whistleblowers, in fact, have a lot of power. And it's really the customers that these companies need to listen to, right? So we as customers actually do have a lot of power um, to influence these companies, but it's not nearly enough, right? Because we don't always know what's going on behind the scenes. And so I'm going to take it to a slightly different Facebook example, which is that they just recently yesterday uh, announced or two days ago announced that they were going to can their facial recognition program and delete all of these face prints. And so on the one hand, we can think that they may have done this because of public backlash, or we can think of it in terms of their $650 million fine paid out to the state of Illinois and the residents who are compromised in violation of a 2008 biometrics law called BIPA. Okay, so is it worth continuing to worry about these massive class action lawsuits that are getting brought in Illinois and other states that are looking to copy this law? Like there's discussion of augmenting the CCPA to have better biometrics protection um, around these things. So again, it comes down to local politics where if you enact very strong laws, sometimes you can influence global corporations because it's just not worth it for them to tease out like residents of Illinois from everybody else from their entire product suite. And if they can get some good PR buzz off of the edge of it too, great. So um, I agree. I agree with Liz that we're not going to get to where we need to be without regulation. And then I think those regulations should require something around IRBs. Now, for, for now, um, there are various motives that you can speak to to get people to set up, to get organizations to set up something like IRBs or multiple multiple IRBs or call them an ethics committee, call it whatever you want. Um, it's, it's hard though. Um, so I help, I help companies set these things up and I say, look, first of all, they, they've got to be in the process of product development. It's not just sort of down the line. It's not after products have been have been released and they're doing, they're, they're uh, wreaking havoc. You need to have IRBs. So we do IRBs before you start testing on human subjects for, for very good reason. Similarly, you need to have IRBs involved in the production of the, the product development process really early, on, really early on. I think before you even start, you know, coding anything, before you start collecting your training data, it's got to go to the ethics committee, the IRB or whatever. But then there are some really tough decisions that companies have to make. And to be honest, it's not easy for them to make them. Um, so first of all, the reason why the Facebook stuff happens, they might have a committee, but it's not empowered. So, so Facebook has, for instance, a responsible innovation department. Um, but no product team is required, as far as I know, no product team is required to consult the responsible innovation team. Moreover, none of the recommendations of the responsible innovation team are requirements upon those that have sought their counsel. So the, the product teams aren't required to go to them. And what, if they do go to them, they can say, oh, interesting, thanks, but no thanks for that <laughs> recommendation. So one thing that you have to do, you have to actually empower those ethics committees by, for instance, I mean, here, here's something that would be incredible. Um, every product team has to get their product approved by the committee before they can start making it. Right, that'd be a lot. Moreover, the dictates or the recommendations of the committee are not mere recommendations, they're requirements for the product team. And there'll be further checks to make sure those, those recommendations or those requirements were actually met prior to the product reaching some further stage, like being deployed. Um, then you have to face a really tough question. Remember, you're a business, you're a corporation, you do have certain kinds of responsibilities to your shareholders, yes, you need to make money. I mean. And if you're a smaller business, like a startup, you need to, you know, CEOs feel a responsibility to their employees. I don't want to go under, I need to pay, I need to meet payroll, which is a huge expense. Do you make that ethics committee or that IRB overrulable? Medical IRBs, we know you can't, you can't overrule an IRB, but this is a private corporation. So now you, you know, let's say you're the chief analytics officer, the chief data officer, maybe even the CEO, is this thing overridable? Can, it, can you appeal it to, say, a more senior executive who can overturn the decision of that ethical committee? Now, if you're really into mitigating ethical risk, for whatever reason, both um, you know, those connected to the bottom line, reputational risk, also those connected to, um, uh, you're, just, you're generally motivated by the ethically right thing, uh, you might say yes, or sorry, you might say no, it can't be overruled. That's a, that's a really bold, very bold business decision to make, that not even the CEO can overrule the decision of employees who sit on the ethics committee. 
So then you say, yes, it can be overruled, but now you've started to soften the teeth of the committee. <laughs> um, and how, how, you know, the most difficult decisions are gonna be when the most money is on the line. And if it's overrulable and now it goes to the CEO has certain kinds of responsibilities, ugh. So it's, it's not easy to set up these committees, even for the people who are really well-intentioned, because they do, in fact, also have both financial and, if you like, just ethical responsibilities to make a certain amount of money so they can maintain their employees. Um, it's hard. And I don't think people are gonna make the decision that we ultimately need, which is that they are, in fact, requirements, unless there's regulation involved. Certainly, and certainly not at scale. Maybe we'll get a company here or there. Um, Microsoft is getting, is getting not, they're not there yet, but they're getting good at this. Um, but that's one company among, you know, lots. I think we have time for a quick question. You have something? Yeah, Reed, actually you bring, you brought us back to my question from the beginning when we were asking, what do we do about all this? Um, I just want to problematize something you said, which was earlier you distinguished between compliance and ethics. And I want to say that compliance is a form of ethics in that our government and our laws should be built upon an ethical framework, right? That, that government, that law needs to follow ethics first and foremost. So to the question then, um, and I think this, this might just lead us into our afternoon sessions probably neatly. We don't need to dig deep into, in, into an answer here. But who should be responsible here, right? Um, is it OKCupid okay not collecting data? Is it OKCupid okay not holding the data? Is it OKCupid okay not selling the data? Is it F the FBI not subpoenaing the, subpoenaing the data? Or is it Congress saying how much of each of those should be allowed and should not be allowed? Or the state of Illinois, for that matter, or the local government? Or So just as a general question, who should be responsible for this, the moral responsibility here, and how do we litigate that and, and regulate that um, as a society? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. And I, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with your last point that, that it sh we should hold Congress responsible for stalling for so long to give the, the bare minimum kinds of privacy protections that other citizens enjoy all around the world. Um, but also, it's all of their fault. It's everybody has a role to play here, right? And, and part of it just starts with people um, in all of these different various roles living with their head in the sand about living in an ecosystem that's part of a society that has lots of actors and lots of different scenarios and being unwilling for one reason or another to um, to consider this from all sides or to solicit other opinions. But, you know, we, we have to also think about the business, right? Like I am a CEO, I, I do intend to have customers whose confidential information we will hold entirely private. And that may be in, in con contrast to what, what we might like for another kind of activist organization to pursue, you know, relentlessly transparency. Um, but it's not okay to, to just exist in a society where we've created this massive conflict of interest that incentivizes bad behavior <laughs> and rewards it. It rewards the bad behavior, right? So it, like the laws have to be set up in a way that we're not expecting people to act against their best interests, which is what we're asking people to do right now with this push for ethics. So again, to me, it just comes down to regulation. And I, I really do hope that the government um, here is able to speed up their work. Yeah, I'll echo what Liz said, which is say that there's plenty of responsibility to go around. Um, one place where I think it doesn't lie, though, is with those individual, you know, in the teams of engineers and data scientists and product designers. Um, not first and foremost, because if they don't have the organizational support to do, to go through their ethical due diligence, if their financial incentives are completely misaligned with taking ethics seriously, it, blaming them is is just, a, it's not helpful, it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't do anything. But B, they're not the appropriate objects of blame because they were not given the conditions under which they could actually implement or, or live up to ethical standards throughout product development. Um, you know, you think about Wells Fargo. The problem is, and, and, the, and creating all the fake profiles, because the financial misincentives were misaligned with ethical conduct. And so who's responsible within, at least a corporation, if we're just gonna talk about the corporation, it's gotta be something like, a chief information officer, a chief data officer, a chief analytics officer, um, those people are the ones who need to implement a, a general AI ethical risk program and ensure that that program is created, scaled, and maintained. And if people don't, you know, if there are bad actors in the system that, that thwart that CIO's efforts, 
then that person and that team is responsible. But if they're just generally a team working under the conditions that were not created by them, then they're not the proper objects of blame. And with that, um, I would like to thank our panelists for an extremely interesting <laughs> discussion. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. And I would like to invite everyone uh, to join us for lunch. Uh, re real quick, before you head out for lunch, um, I also want to take this moment to congratulate our two uh, poster award winners, uh, Tina Nguyen and uh, Dina uh, Signora, um, who both um, have their posters um, are displayed over by the lunch tables, and they'll be standing next to them. You can talk to them during lunch. So congratulations to both Tina and uh, Dina for that. And with that, we have a nice lunch break. So stretch your legs, uh, get some food, go outside for a few minutes, and we'll see you back at 1.40 p.m. for the next panel. Thank you so much, everyone.
you could all have a seat. We're going to get started. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, once again to our afternoon session of the Symposium on Biometric Ethics here at the Greffenstedt Center for Ethics in Science, Technology, and Law at Duquesne University. Um, I am John Slattery, the Directing Fellow of the Greffenstedt Center, and this afternoon uh, we have a fantastic uh, two uh, panel sessions coming up. The very first one is on Catholic theological ethics, and the moderator for this is another one of the external fellows of the Greffenstedt Center, uh, my colleague uh, Matthew J. Gaudet. He also serves as a lecturer in the School of Engineering at Santa Clara University. Um, his research lies at the intersection of moral theology and political and social theory, with a particular interest in the topics of tech ethics, disability ethics, the ethics of war and peace, and university ethics. He's the co-editor of several special editions of the Journal of Moral Theology and is currently working on a special issue on artificial intelligence to be published in early 2022, um, you know, aside from all the other projects he is currently doing and pursuing. So without further ado, Dr. Gaudet, welcome. Thank you, John. This isn't about me. This is about these wonderful folks over here, um, which, it, yes, so... As a, you know, this morning we heard President Gormley's um, introduction of, of what we were going to do today. And one of the, there was a key line that he said right in there, and, and part of what the Grevenstead Center is trying to do is carve out this distinctively Catholic place in this conversation. And so part of what we're doing today is to invite two premier theologians to come um, wax theologically on, um, on, the, on the question of, of AI and specifically the use of biometrics in AI. And so we have two wonderful speakers today that um, I'd like to introduce. Um, Andrea Vicini holds a medical doctorate from the University of Bologna and a sacred theological doctorate from the Pontifical Faculty of Theology in Southern Italy in, in Naples, Florida. Also a sacred, an SDL, a sacred theological license and a PhD from Boston College. He's been to school. Andrea has taught in Italy, Albania, Mexico, Chad and France, and even once held a research fellowship at the Center for, of Theological Inquiry in Princeton um, on, this, on the societal implications of astrobiology. Andrea currently sits as the Michael P. Walsh Professor of Bioethics at Boston College and was formerly held the Gasson Chair at the same school, but in the School of Theology there, uh, Theology and Ministry. He is co-chair of, of the International Network, the Catholic Theological Ethics in the World Church, and a member of the AI Pontifical or AI Ethics Advisory Group um, to, the to the Vatican's Pontifical F Council for Culture. Um, his publications include four books and countless articles in the fields of theological bioethics, global public health, environmental issues, uh, environmental issues, fundamental theological ethics, and new biotechnologies. And yes, he does have an article in the new, in the forthcoming Journal of Moral Theology issue on AI. Um, Brianne Jacobs is a Catholic feminist theologian who is interested in engaging the resources of, Catholic, of the Catholic intellectual tradition to work for gender justice and flourishing. Brianne's research focuses on the body as a site for reflection of ecclesiology, ethics, faith, and gender and racial justice, and, as we'll hear today, technology. You can find her work in Theological Studies, America Magazine, U.S. Catholic, and Daily Theology, as well as her forthcoming book, Holy Body, Gender flourishing in the theological and gender flourishing in theological anthropology and ecclesiology, which will be available from Fort Fortress Press. When? Uh, <laughs> soon. We'll just say soon. <laughs> so, um, without further ado, I introduce Andrea, and thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew, and thank you for the opportunity of uh, this very rich and insightful day reflecting on biometric uh, justice and biometric technologies.
Catholic theological bioethics is attentive to what is happening in society and within the diverse fields of research by joining ethical conversations in the public arena and by contributing to them. Participation and collaboration characterize this engagement in the academy and within the whole society. The goal that is pursued is the promotion of the common good, because the common good allows the ultimate realization of individual and social capabilities, and it aims at individual and collective flourishing by encompassing all social goods, spiritual, moral, relational, and material, for all the human beings everywhere in a very inclusive way. In reflecting on biometric technologies, Catholic theological bioethics stresses a threefold approach, centered first on a vision of the person, we'll call it anthropology, second on a vision of science, and third on a vision of society. This threefold approach could clarify how biometric technologies could participate and collaborate in promoting the common good, or on the contrary, could threaten the common good both in the case of individuals and of the whole social fabric. What we want to avoid is first an impoverished anthropological vision of the person that is not attentive to one's capabilities, needs, vulnerabilities, and limitations. Second, a simplified understanding of science, in particular when biometric technologies do not consider consequences and implications of what is produced and implemented. And third, a problematic vision of society that excludes, discriminates, and marginalizes many people by selecting who can benefit from these technological developments. So first, a vision of the person. To examine the vision of the person that is embraced means to focus on the moral agents. In such a way, on the one hand, we consider those for whom we develop our biometric technologies. We could call them the recipients. And on the other hand, on ourselves, as moral agents engage in developing these technologies, we could call these the makers. We can ask which type of person will benefit from our endeavors and technological tools, but also if our way of answering betrays a reductive approach, that is, we reduce people to our way of looking at them in light of our own limited ability to see them with their desires and needs, capabilities, vulnerabilities, and limitations. A more holistic approach is due, and it is anthropologically more promising. Anthropologically, multiple elements shape the Catholic vision of the person and its ethical implications. By mentioning just a few of them, we can list the need to promote human dignity, the attention given to the finitude, vulnerability, and mortality of human existence, the ability to recognize oneself and the other, the sacredness of the individual's conscience and freedom, the equality of rights and duties within the range of human diversity, the profound and inseparable unity between spiritual and moral life, the striving to be virtuous persons and virtuous societies in the multiple and diversified life situations, the attention to diversity, avoiding any racist approach and discrimination, the unavoidable political and relational dimensions of one's personal identity, the individual openness to change and transformation. And finally, the import, importance of personal and collective healing and transformation. Researchers and scientists should respect the richness of the human condition while they focus on technological tools and developments. Throughout history, religion and the humanities helped us to glimpse who we are as complex beings. The insights of these disciplines integrate the contributions of multiple sciences, including biometric technologies. Both this heritage and interaction among disciplines should not be lost. Second, a vision of science. 
A critical assessment of our vision of science should allow us to examine first what are the methods that shape our analyses and practices. Second, we should consider what are the means that we are using to pursue our research and realize it, why we use those means, and how we are using them. Third, we should question what are the goals that we are pursuing and how we pursue them. Fourth, we need to clarify who is going to benefit from what we are researching, realizing, and implementing, and what are the facilitating and or limiting conditions that will influence how people will benefit from our endeavors, the issue of access, for example. Fifth, it is necessary to examine what are the consequences for individuals, disadvantaged people, populations, minorities, communities, groups, diverse societies, and for the whole planet, of our research and, and what, of what we build. We can ask which type of consequences are we able to identify? Who is going to be affected by those consequences? How do we incorporate our assessment of the expected and unexpected consequences in the discernment and decision-making process that should precede our endeavors? Scientific, excuse me, scientific research does not take place in a vacuum. A heightened attention to science within social contexts with their inequities and potentialities, will allow for a more resolute, critical, and constructive social engagement. And eventually, it could facilitate the promotion of personal, social, and environmental flourishing. Third, a vision of society. Which type of society are we envisioning when we design, realize, and implement what we have studied, researched, and tested? Are we examining critically the social context in which we live and work and other far away social contexts that might be impacted by what we make? By paying attention to the social context, we examine what influences society as a whole. Socially, we could argue that justice should say shape social interactions. But we are aware of too many unjust situations. Hence, the promotion of justice requires social change. The critical assessment of events, dynamics, and situations is imperative to orient us toward constructive transformations. Moreover, within the social fabric, competing priorities should be identified and addressed. In considering, for example, global public health and ecologically sustainable policies as priorities, for humankind and the planet. In which ways biometric technologies could contribute to address these two priorities? And in doing so, strengthen a vision of society that aims at promoting the common good of humankind and of the earth. By promoting constructive transformations and addressing competing priorities, for example, between the research and its implementations, Biometric technologies could greatly contribute to this vision of a good and just society. Furthermore, racism, discrimination, marginalization, and exploitation should be avoided and eliminated. Because of the increasing social inequities, Catholic bioethicists advocate for a stronger partnership between scientists and researchers in the global north and those working in the south as well as between South and South to address these inequities. More inclusive international agreements critically assessing biometric technologies and regulating their implementation in the social fabric are needed, as we heard even this morning. The research agenda should be shaped by concern and care for the urgent needs of the poor, of the marginal, of the excluded, Hence, solidarity should inform advances in biometric technologies by striving to protect our humanity and by stressing a preferential option for the poor. From the University of Notre Dame, Professor Maura Ryan agrees. She writes, enthusiasm for biotechnology's potential is tempered, however, 
by fear that the consolidation and expansion of biotechnology markets will merely create new opportunities for marginalization and exploitation, end quote. Hence, to promote a greater justice that will tackle the increasing inequities, she advocates for stronger partnerships. She continues, without a genuine partnership between scientists from the industrialized nations of the North and scientists of the South, as well as binding international agreements governing access to technology and information, there is concern that the biotechnology revolution will merely exacerbate the 1090 gap, end quote, which enriches the rich and leaves aside the poor. Aiming at promoting the common good, invites us to articulate a comprehensive approach that integrates these three visions, a vision of the person, a vision of science, and a vision of society. It is a sort of three-dimensional approach, a 3D. Such a threefold approach presupposes and fosters a critical attention given first to what we make us interact with other human beings and what he says about our understanding of what concerns individual human beings. Second, it promotes a critical and constructive assessment of what guides one's scientific research and work. And finally, invites us to consider all social dynamics, both positive and negative, by focusing on what promotes social flourishing and what hinders it. In his 1997 book, Imagine Worlds, the British-born American theoretical physicist and mathematician Freeman Dyson wrote, if we are looking for new directions in science, we must look for scientific revolutions. There are two kinds of scientific revolutions, those driven by new tools and those driven by new concepts. The effect of a concept-driven evolution is to explain all things in new ways. The effect of the tool-driven revolution is to discover new things that have to be explained." End quote. Catholic theological bioethics provides both ethical tools and concepts to address the current and forthcoming ethical issues raised by biometric technologies by focusing on how we view the person, how we acquire and develop knowledge, and how we shape our life socially. To sum up, Catholic theological bioethics focuses on new tools, new concepts, worthy goals, trusted means, and sound ethics. And sound ethics. In such a way, it accompanies the progress of biometric technologies by considering it, it an ethical opportunity, not a temptation. Eventually, within the public arena, Catholic theological bioethics contributes in helping to make progress in biometric technologies as part of the human tension toward personal and social flourishing, locally and globally. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see you. <clears throat> so I come to this conference uh, not technically an ethicist or um, somebody who is an expert in um, biometrics, but as a theologian. And my specific area of expertise um, is in um, the dignity of the human person in the tradition and really focusing on bodies and how we talk about bodies today and how that intersects with um, uh, the Catholic intellectual tradition. And that's what really brought me to my interest here because there's, I think, a really interesting contrast that's happening 
with a kind of anthropology of Silicon Valley, let's say on the one hand, and then the anthropology that we have in the Catholic intellectual tradition. So I think I see a lot of students out here, maybe. Maybe you're doing a little bit on um, Catholic social teaching or um, the Catholic intellectual tradition. Um, and so I hope, um, just like the paper you just heard, that you'll hear some themes that you're hearing maybe in class in the, the paper as well. So I focus on personhood, bodies, and history, um, particularly within Google in this paper. The reason I focus on Google is because it's just kind of a case study. I could look at Facebook or Amazon or Apple or any of these other companies, but that would be a 500-page uh, you know, book. Uh, we don't have time for that. Um, so let's see here. How do I, do I just do, aha, good, okay. So in his 2016 encyclical, La Dao Si, Pope Francis um, writes that uh, humanity does not exist to develop technology. Technology must exist for the development and flourishing of creation. Uh, the preservation of this principle he calls the technocratic paradigm. So we have these, this is kind of a contrast here in the introduction I've laid out between the technocratic paradigm which puts technology first and humanity kind of exists to develop technology. In Laudato Si, he says, no, we must make sure that technology um, exists for the flourishing of creation, which of course includes humanity. Um, <clears throat> so in this talk, I expand Francis's uh, critique of the technocratic paradigm, this mindset, by looking at how it impacts the ideologies behind one tech company in particular, Google. Um, let me see, I think in the next slide I have, yeah. Um, that's what I do in the first section, uh, looking at Google's mission um, and revealing its concomitant disregard for personhood bodies and history, uh, particularly with its use of biometrics. In section two, I judge how Google's ideologies manifest the technocratic paradigm, particularly in its use of biometric technologies. Uh, and then finally, the essay concludes with three principles um, to act against the technocratic paradigm. Um, and just a quick caveat, it is not my intention to be critical of the existence of technology or of biometrics as some kind of moral ill. Modern technology is not simply a bad iteration of some previous good thing. And my criticisms here are not born of a love for the way uh, that things were or some kind of nostalgia. To compare uh, an email to the touch of stationery is really to miss the point, though that loss might be real. Um, we have to forge a place for flourishing human dignity and holiness now. Modern technology, including biometric technology, as an extension and expression of the project of being human, as a masterpiece of civilization, really, is often very good, and we can come up with lots of examples of this. Um, technology has the capacity, like all great masterpieces, to expose the tragic, to interrupt, to heal, to reveal beauty and love, and to help us develop in dignity and empathy with one another throughout creation. The technocratic paradigm is a toxic mindset that diminishes the uses of modern technology and the human person just as any toxic mindset can influence any expression of humanity. And it's that influence, influence that I wish to critique here. So first, um, Google, which I'll just have that up while I'm talking about Google. Um, so Google emerges out of the, the big tech myth, right? There's two PhD students who buck convention with nothing but some clunky hardware in their garage with a vision to change the world, and they make a fortune. Many search engines in the late 90s were I heard a student referred to it as the late 20th, or the like late 1900s the other day. I was like, oh my God. Um, <laughs> uh, the 1990s, um, uh, to navigate internet users through the vast and growing amounts of uh, information available to them. Most search engines in the 90s ranked results based on the number of times you, your desired search term appeared on the page. Uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin developed an alternative method. They wrote an algorithm that ranked sites based on the number of other websites that linked back to or cited the original site. For example, a search for Vatican II on Google would rank results based on how many websites are backlinked to a page with the search term Vatican II on it, rather than simply how many times Vatican II is mentioned on the page. 
The site referenced by the most other sites is ranked highest and shown as the first uh, search return. They named the search engine and website Google, a word play on Google, G-O-O-G-O-L, um, which is a digit, the digit one followed by 100 zeros, a mathematical shorthand for an incomprehensibly high number. For Page and Brin, the name of the company and the algorithm represented in the incomprehensible amount of information that would be processed for us in order to retrieve and rank our desired information online. Google's stated mission reflects their name. Quote, organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Google has grown to become one of the most valuable companies on Earth um, and its most viewed web property, but more importantly, it is one of the most integrated into our lives. The number of decisions Google's algorithms make uh, and the amount of information they process for us in a single day is really more than any of us can begin to fathom. Um, weather, directions, inbox, newsfeed, research, music stream, products, purchase, businesses, patronized. These are not shaped simply by a mission to organize information and make it useful, right? My day is shaped by algorithms that make choices um, ranking what content is worth giving. The thinking required to sort the world's information and to organize it usefully forms the deeper mission at Google. In other words, the development of algorithmic, algorithmic artificial intelligence and the integration of that intelligence into our lives at the most fundamental level is what Google has been successfully doing since 1998. And the expansion of this goal is clearly where it sees its future. Services like Google Maps, Gmail, Google Assistant, Google Translate, Chrome, YouTube, Android, right, and more do just that. The vision goes further to what they call AI complete. Sergey Brin explained to journalist Stephen Levy, quote, certainly, if you had all the world's information directly attached to your brain uh, or an artificial brain uh, that was smarter than your brain, you'd be better off. <laughs> um, I might be critical of that. Um, in another interview with journalist Franklin Four, Brin stated, perhaps in the future, we could attach a little version of Google that you just plug into your brain. Four summarizes this by saying that Google's goal is to, quote, create machines that replicate the human brain and then advance beyond. Part of the ideological underpinning of this idea is that it is not only good, but possible to create a brain that is unhindered by the body, by experience, by history, by touch, or by bias. Perhaps the greatest proponent of this idea is Ray Kurzweil, director of engineering at Google since 2012. In his vision of history, technological developments allow us to shed our frail and limited human bodies, what he calls our, quote, version 1.0 biological bodies. Neil Jacobstein, a Google executive, has said of our iPhone use, quote, we're already in some respects superhuman. I take him to mean that tools available to us with technology do not just aid and assist us, which they do, but that they augment our humanity for the better that what makes us super is one's ability to have and process more information, right? Which is a key anthropological um, presumption. Um, for them, the moment when we fully merge with machines, when we are able to upload our brains, quote, we will be the software, not the hardware, and be able to inhabit whatever hardware we like best. This moment they call the singularity, which maybe you've heard. Uh, in the singularity, computers will be able to complete tasks, life will be pleasure, pain will be non-existent, and most importantly, there will be no death. In, they're, that's, they're all just trying to run away from it, but that's good luck. Um, in merging with computers, we will become fully superhuman. The singularity invent, envisioned is not an extension or expression, uh, it's not just an extension or expression of what it means to be human, it is for them an evolution right, an evolution from normal human intelligence towards superhuman intelligence. History is an arc, and it bends exponentially, they argue, toward the singularity. Um, so given the analysis here, um, I would summarize Google's ideology in three parts. First, it understands the human person is valuable insofar as the person has innovative ideas based on the processing of ever more information. 
For executives at Google, smarter humans are better, and smartness is defined as widening one's you know, information index. Second, Google understands bodies, you know, all the things that are you know, our biases, social locations, histories, traumas, triumphs, special abilities, needs, desires, emotions, suffering, right, as having little or no value. They are mere glitches in the hardware that is meant to house and process information. And third, and perhaps, perhaps most compellingly, it has a theory of history as exponential technological progress, right, every year more, 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 um, that ends with humans reaching their peak value as superhumans merged with computers in the singularity. These are the presumptions that propel Google's missions and all of its projects today. So the technocratic paradigm at Google. These three presumptions about the person, body, and history shape Google's particular manifestation of the technocratic paradigm. This is to say the way Google values the person, body, and history, history prioritizes in each case the development of technology um, over the flourishing of the person and creation. Right? Um, so Google sees people as information indices. Because Google sees humans as data sets, it conflates technological progress with human well-being. Seeing humans as mere quotients of content works two ways. You could put a little Google in my brain and make me, quote, superhuman, capable of innovation because I can see the most data points. Conversely, as a set of data, I can be summed up, comprehended, and given to anyone or anything. My body can, with biometrics, be summarized in data. And I can be added to the great pool of data in somebody else's set. The development of technology that sees humans as data sets exemplifies the technocratic paradigm with little or no transparency or consideration given to how selling that data affects people. Each time we use a Google service, we give them a bit of data about ourselves, especially as biometrics expands. My location, where I go, my political interests, purchasing habits, my group threads and texts, my medical quandaries, what time I search these questions, and now with biometrics, my face, heart rate, retina, fingerprints, temperature, and sleep patterns, right? All that data Google can use, could optimize, uh, could use to optim optimize our searches to make them more individualized, so that, going back to the original algorithm, right, my subsequent searches render retrievals ever more likely, perhaps, to be just what I was looking for. Eric Schmidt, CEO of Google and later of Alphabet, the parent company, has said he wants people to be able to ask Google, what shall I do tomorrow? Or, what job shall I take? And his vision is that with the broadest possible data, optimally individualized, Google will be able to provide the best answer to any question for free. But of course, it's not free. Google garners billions a year in revenues, funding its many projects and mightily enriching its executives and shareholders. Where is all that money coming from? Quote, nearly all the company's revenue comes from marketers eager to reach the target, targeted audience that Google delivers so abundantly. We pay with our attention and data uh, the, raw, the raw material of marketing. In other words, while Google rhapsodizes about the promises of big data, about the possibilities of innovation based on giving us information and increasing our knowledge, making our bodies, quote, superhuman, what is happening is the inverse, right? We are the data being sold. Google thrives by getting as much information about us as possible and selling it to other companies. And now with biometrics, that information is not limited to our search terms and website visits. What gets your heart rate up? What fixes and holds your retina, your focus? How does the AI read your gender, your race, your age? What can AI calculate about you with information about your age, your weight, your you know, presumed weight, your presumed race, your pulse reaction, sleeping patterns, travel patterns, and keywords spoken? Um, our bodies are now uh, can now be harvested and sold in order to sell back to us with perfectly tailored marketing, whatever the highest bidder would like. It's a convenient way to find a nice pair of jeans. Like sometimes I like what I'm being advertised. Like I'm not like, <laughs> um, but what happens if it's anorexia that's being sold or nationalism, propaganda and misinformation, right? 
The obfuscation and secrecy around algorithms which treat people as data sets function primarily to consolidate power and wealth for those who run the company. Do biometrics make us healthier and more secure superhumans? Or do they flatten our bodies into yet another data set extracted for the profit and political power of others? Um, Senator Al Franken once put it succinctly, we're not Google's client, we're its product. Um, another way in which Google exemplifies the technocratic paradigm uh, is its presumption that information can be divorced from bodies, from bias and experience. Big data, algorithm, hardware, software, computing, these sound like neutral, objective, and scientific terms, right? Um, but um, there are two problems with this. The first problem is the assumption that people who write algorithms, um, uh, that they might not have normal biases, um, or that they might have normal biases, but that the programs they write wouldn't, right? Um, for example, in 2015, US News and World Report uh, reported a glitch in Google's algorithm that led to problems with auto-tagging auto and facial recognition software. The photo application automatically tagged African Americans as apes and animals. It is doubtful that this was intentional racism, uh, yet the implicit social bias um, that people of color are less than human um, perniciously reiterates itself in our human creations. The second problem with this assumption is that the more something is cited, the higher it gets in rankings. The biases of internet users, which are revealed in the way users uh, of the internet link and cite ideas, shapes the experience of the internet for everyone else, right? This is pronounced in what first happened when people would search for Jew on the internet and you would get back anti-Semitic and Holocaust denying websites. Um, or if you search for black girls and white girls in image searches, you get you know, highly um, uh, you know, violent and sexualized images um, for black girls, but sort of wholesome ones for white girls. Um, so Google claims to fix their glitches, but they never say exactly how they do so, and as it happens, new glitches continuously arise. Um, given these well-documented failures, we may ask, what will happen when algorithms start to take assumed, the assumed race of users scraped biometrically into account. So this is, I'm sort of asking this question, it's not happening now, I don't think, right? But, you know, um, uh, uh, what happens when they scrape these things uh, and bring them into the algorithm, right? I do not think there is a nefarious mastermind here, but the algorithms are built to keep us engaged, and I can imagine a world where light-skinned and dark-skinned users are fed entirely different realities because Google profits off the engagement such realities produce. Um, so ironically, far from being above bias or disembodied, Google's AI amplifies our embodied realities, the social, historical, and cultural meanings assigned to bodies. Um, <clears throat> the final way that Google exemplifies the technocratic paradigm is its theory of history as exponential technological progress that ends in the singularity, um, or the realization of our peak value as superhumans merged with computers. Theologian Johann Baptist Metz pointed out decades ago that what characterizes humanity is that unlike computers, we cannot and do not remember all moments in history the same way. History is not progress at all, says Metz. It is a story or a narrative that is given meaning by particular points of inflection, which shape and give meaning to all the rest. As humans, we choose how we tell our stories. We decide which moments have definitive meaning and shape the rest. Right? This is what the huge debate over critical race theory is really about, by the way. How do we tell the story of who we are? Who are our heroes? You know, Which stories are the ones that say who we want to be? Um, so these memories which shape our history, Metz calls dangerous. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection form the emblematic Christian dangerous memory. Metz writes that we must be wary of the memory capacity of the computer precisely because of its inhuman inability to create dangerous memories by distinguishing them from mundane ones. When we make computer-like functioning the human ideal, our most valuable human asset, the ability to tell our own stories and claim our futures is lost. Um, <clears throat> sorry. 
Google's ideology propagates a computer's view of history, a march of equivalent data points heading toward the singularity as a human ideal. This ideology functions to erase suffering as a dangerous force in history. Not only then does Google's view of history rob us of what makes us human, the promise of the singularity dulls concern for suffering now and functions as an opiate for the rich who benefit from that promise. The vision of the singularity is that it rids us of our glitchy bodies, but embodiment is more than what can be measured or scanned biometrically. As philosopher Jaron Lanier has pointed out, our use of biometric technology in a technocratic paradigm makes our embodied experience more flat and computer-like, reducing us to what can be measured. So these are the three person, body, history um, of the technocratic paradigm at Google. So finally, um, to wrap up here, three principles to act against the technocratic paradigm. First, um, there must be more transparency about algorithms and data scraping. There needs to be transparency about what's being harvested, what's being done with it, to whom uh, it's being sold, and for what purposes. And, um, to Reed's point earlier, like what, what concrete harms are being done. Um, second, uh, data accumulation does not make a person more valuable. This to me is the most important one. In the tradition of Catholic social teaching, there is nothing you can do, no knowledge you can gain or lose, no data set you can compile or waste that will make you more or less valuable. God is not just present, but fully resplendent and alive in every person, however much knowledge they have or can accumulate. The holiness of creation exceeds the bounds of information that we can quantify and qualify. Um, and finally, technology, especially biometric data, must serve our humanity, not aim to make humans more like computers. There is no innovation or optimal data, no biometric, that will allow one to hack one's way to being a better human body um, or a more valuable human because the value of our bodies is already there. Thank you. All right, thank you both. Who's on? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, make sure you turn on your microphones. Um, so I'm going to follow as Nathan did and, and just start with a couple questions, but then open it up to the audience. So hopefully um, you're developing your questions. And I know we have a couple of theologians in the audience, so hopefully they can dive in. But, but to all, um, thank you both for your rich, wonderful, um, really sort of um, um, Page-turning, um, uh, <laughs> page-turning page um, addition to this conversation, right? Um, obviously, we're, we're talking on, a, on an entirely different level once we engage with theology. Um, so, you know, but Catholic thought has had this rich tradition of influencing broader society to be a more ethical world. You know, you think of Catholic social teachings work in raising up global poverty, or the pro proliferation of nuclear weapons, and more recently, climate change as worthy of deep social and ethical reflection, or you think of Catholic theology's influence from the very infancy of bioethics, right? Um, how can we, so my first question for you is how can we connect the deep theological reflection on bio, biometrics to the broader social conversation that we need to have? Um, so kind of unpacking more and probably moving us towards our next session, our policy section, right? But um, do we need, as Jerry said earlier, better grammar? Do we need a better anthropology, indicating, you know, connecting to bo what both of you said? Do we need a better set of ethical principles? Do we need to expand Catholic social teaching or something like that? Um, so in short, I, I want to kind of move this towards the practical and reconnect it back to a broader social conversation, but while holding on to the theology. So how do we connect Catholic theology to this broader conversation? And I'll open it up to either one of you who wants to. I'm thinking of an example, a concrete example that was presented by a physician at the recent conference, a Lilly conference at Boston College. She works in, at the Boston Medical Center that is a hospital that cares for people in low-income neighborhood in the area. And the case that she presented is how, during the pandemic, how can we help the communities to be vaccinated? 
and they realized that what the city of Boston was doing was not helping this process. So there were two major centers that were very far away from the city, and you needed private transportation to go there and get vaccinated. So they realized if we really want to involve these people and help them to see that vaccination is for them and for all of us, we need to interact with them. So they interact with the local leaders in the communities, mostly African-American communities. And they, with discussing with the leaders, decided what to do. And the leader, leaders in the communities ask for centers in their neighborhoods. So they realize six centers for vaccination in the neighborhoods. What I'm proposing is that we need to find a way to work with the people. We need to listen to their concerns. We need to find a way to empower them. We need to create a sort of collaborative and participatory way of addressing issues. So we need probably to think ways in which we talk with people who have been affected by uses of technology, biometric technology in particular, and people who have had benefits from it, people who are uh, somehow <coughs> helping us to frame an agenda that will help us to use technology in the best possible way, in a way that are not at the disadvantage of those who are involved. So that would be my answer. It's a way of doing things that is helping us to be ethical and have an ethical outcome, an ethical result. Yes, I would agree with the point on um, uh, edu educate. I would say educating people broadly, like in, in their space. I I have a sense that very few people understand um, how much of this works, um, and so to even begin to think about the ethical implications, like it is as we mentioned in a previous panel, getting better. Like the congressional, you know, hearings that I've heard, the people who are asking the questions are becoming like slightly more educated. But like, for example, I was talking to my mother-in-law and I was saying like, well, you know, some people are influenced by Instagram this way and she just had really no idea what I was talking about. So I showed her a filter. I, I put on a filter for her face and she just couldn't believe it. She just started like crying, laughing because she, she had the eyelashes. And um, But I was like, look, imagine, go back to your high school self looking at this stuff. And she was like, oh, like she had no idea why Instagram was a problem or like wh why things were being sold to young people and how, like she just had no idea whatsoever. Um, so that, I mean, that's just one example, but I think really in terms of, you know, educating people so with, again, to, you know, reiterate my previous point, with the goal of, you know, human dignity, right, at the, you know, at, at the forefront there, I, you know, I, I think is, is important. Because I think, you know, in conversations, to, um, back to your point about, you know, asking people how things are helpful for them, I really want to reiterate, I think a lot of this technology is great. Like, imagine, you know, someday my, um, my dad is, you know, opening his phone and it alerts him, like, I, we think you're in the beginning of having a seizure, you know, because, you're, because of the way your face is aligned, right? Or, like, some way that these, these like, biometrics can, like, you know, detect and help us understand our own health. Like, that's all very good stuff. Um, it's just about how, how it's being used. And the more people are educated... Um, about how it's being used, I think, the better. But most folks, I just think, have no idea how much of their data is being scraped or what it's being used for or how it's being fed back to them. Again, like when I talk to my parents and other people, like they don't understand that Facebook feeds look different for different people. Like at the most basic level, it's just not even understood. I think you're right. I think that's part of what I was alluding to in the question is this notion that Catholic teaching has had a, has a historical influence on Catholic social teaching, raising the issue of global poverty. First of it, first of all, is information. And so I do think mm -hmm. we need to, as theologians and ethicists, we need to engage more in, in learning for ourselves and then therefore promulgating you know, a better understanding of the technology and connecting to that conversation. Um, Arjan has the, um, has the mic in the back. So if anyone does have questions, go ahead and raise your hand and he'll bring the mic around. But I have a second question for you all. Um, so um, Stephanie talked earlier about the potential for biometrics being able to, 
identify to help identify refugees and give them give them an identity. Um, conversely, though, one of the revelations of the Facebook files was how Facebook's algorithms are more closely monitored in the U.S. Actually, more closely monitored in the U.S. than they are in other parts of the world. That like right. we actually live in the best possible Facebook world, right. Right. and that. Globally, there is actually far less restrictions and far less ability for people to say, check this fact on PolitiFact or something like that. Those don't exist in Ghana or in Zimbabwe or in Indonesia, right? Um, and so I'm wondering, as we begin to think globally and we begin to think about this question of what can Catholic teaching help in this conversation, I'm wondering if both of you can comment about how Catholic social teaching would respond to the disparate uses of biometric algorithms in both in the global north versus the global south. Both in the positive sense of helping refugees and in the negative sense of, of, of this, this information um, literacy problem. We could say that Catholic social teaching and Catholic social thought help us to focus on what we want, which type of society we want and what we do not want. So it seems to me that the push is for social justice, for solidarity, for support of those who are at the margins. Hence, this telos, this end, this goal, might help us to reflect uh, first what we are producing and how we plan to use it and what would be different goals that are pursued. At lunch, we are having a conversation on how we engage with corporations in light of, you know, uh, and on with the research in light of two of the speakers of this morning. And so I understand that there are different dynamics, different logics, and we cannot realize a vision of the good for everyone without baby steps, we could say. We need to find the right ways to tend toward this goal. And uh, there will be incomplete ways of realizing it, but still it seems to me we need probably to tell ourselves that this is what we want. We want to be respected. We want to have the possibility of promoting ourselves uh, of being empowered, of having a voice, of making a difference. And we want a society that is allowing us to do that. And we maybe have the possibilities of doing this, clearly defining what is going a completely different direction and what helps us to strive toward this more inclusive and respectable society. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that that's, you know, what Catholic social teaching can bring to the table is not like new algorithms or, or anything like that. But just to say, like, for example, the two things that you brought up, those are certainly not in conflict. Like, we can both use facial recognition software to, um, you know, understand the patterns of human trafficking and curb it as well, which was brought up earlier. And put more money into, you know, having a... A, a better regulated Facebook beyond America. You know, we can both have better regulations for social networking and use, you know, there's, it's, so, and I think that that's part of the value of any ethical system is that you can continue to, you know, when, you know, engineers and, um, you know, I just think of like general Silicon Valley ideology sort of like comes at you, you can say like, no, no, no. You know, it reminds me of the, the financial housing crisis. Like, you've got all these people saying, like, you can't really understand what's going on here, so we made the problem, but we're also going to fix it. And it's like, no, 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 no. We actually can understand the problem, and we can bring the values, you know, particularly Duquesne, of um, uh, Catholic social teaching to this problem, and we can help fix it as well. You know, we, we, can, we do understand what's going on here, and we will insist upon, you know, not saying like, oh, well, we're going to give this up if we if we fix this, or oh, this is a problem if we do this. Like, no, we can we can have a better world, and we can insist on it, and that's what the value of an ethical system is. For, you know, is. Who's got a question? Thanks. Uh, thanks, both of you. That was really great. Um, I have a question about 
Google, I guess. So part of part of the critique seemed like it was a critique of Google, and part as a as a uh, platform or as a technology. Then part of it seemed like it was a critique of the founders and former C and founders of Google and CEOs of Google who seem to have uh, an emotional intelligence that's sub zero. <laughs> So that seems like a totally legit critique. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not, what I don't yet see, and maybe because I'm just literally missing something that's there, is that Google itself as a platform is encouraging the kind of activity that would lead us to take on the completely backwards conception of what humanity <laughs> is and what, what, makes, what makes a life uh, lived well. So do, do you think that there's something like, so you've got these, you know, quote unquote geniuses who have this backwards view and then you've got the thing that they created. Do you think that the thing they created plays a causal role in undermining people's proper conception of humanity? And if not, then what's the threat that Google uh, as a company creates as opposed to the stupid ideas that their <laughs> the founders well, have? Well, I think, and this goes to your point earlier, I thought it was really instructive the difference between um, you know, certain kinds of algorithms and a screwdriver, right? Like this, mindset is woven into the programming, I think. So on the one hand, I mean, there's, there's, you know, and I, I, like, I hate to paint with too broad of a brush because there's many tools, many algorithms, many programs, many things going on. Um, so I think, on, you know, I think that there are things that we can use for good, right? I, I gave some examples of those uh, already. Um, and I also think you know, particularly, and this, I guess, gets into a little bit more like, you know, social media, but there are ways in which some of these things bring us, to, you know, I don't remember the word you used earlier, but sort of, they, they aren't neutral, right? The programs themselves aren't neutral. And I certainly agree with that. So um, I hope this answers your question, but I think that the anthropology, the mindset, and the goals of the founders uh, and the company that I, you know, gave as examples, uh, become woven into many of the tools. Um, and so we have to be critical of that. But at the same time, I don't want to throw everything out and somehow imagine like it would be possible to go back 30 years. That's, that's not possible either. Um, so I want to be critical of some of the negative, what I would call a sort of negative anthropology so that we can, you know, given where we are in time and history and space, move in a direction that uh, recognizes human value um, better. Is that, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Andrea, anything to add there? And if, following what you presented this morning and then at the conversation at lunch, the, the question could be, what would be a way to promote ethically responsible practices at the corporate level? So what is the way in which we can help corporate powers in our world to be aware of that, to frame their work in an ethical way and to shape their work in an ethical way is going to be beneficial for the business but ultimately it's going to be beneficial for who we are as humankind on the planet. And you know, for a way to indicate it, this is possible, maybe not in every case, but it is something we can strive for, try to find ways to support the desire of being more ethical that we can identify in, in corporations, and maybe as a society, ask for it. Uh, Legislation was an example that was presented this morning, or uh, public concern. So in a way, we can try to see whether there is the possibility of changing the narrative, a creating you know, a better outcomes for everyone, respecting that the companies need to do their business and be successful in their business. But ethical awareness and ethical uh, accountability are not bad for business, we could say. Surely are good for society and for human beings. I have a, I have a question, sort of, it's, it's a general question, but I think it sort of cuts to the heart of what both you're all talking about, is, is you know, at a place, a place like Duquesne, 
it's a Catholic institution. You know, we're, we're happy to talk about, well, at least some of us are happy to talk about Catholic theology. Um, but in this, in this conversation in general, Catholic theology, not to mention Christian theology or just religious theology in general, is, is not super, it's just very pretty much non-existent in sort of the tech ethics conversation in general. So I, I guess the question I have is, is outside of, of, you know, sort of closed spaces like here and other ones like this, what's the role of the church in looking at the future of, you know, tech ethics and biometric ethics, you know, specifically? I know it's a big question, so, you know. Just throw it into you. Um, I'm thinking, just thinking still on your question and this one together, you know, I'm, you said, you know, they have like sub-zero emotional intelligence. And I think, I th which is, it's, it's an easy, it's an easy way to sort of caricature, characterize. Um, but the, one of the men that I mentioned, Ray Kurzweil, I'm so struck by his story. So his story is that his parents are survivors of the Holocaust. And he has, ca or no, his, his, uh, and his father died. His father has died. And he has, apparently, um, a storage of all of his father's things. Every note, everything his father has ever written. He has it all there. And he believes that he can take all of this information that his father left and somehow upload it and, and, and meet his father again. In, in some sort of way of like taking that information and like reanimating it somehow. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's tragic. And we all, I think as human beings, like understand that impulse of not wanting to let go of the people that we love um, and wanting to create a world in which we get to hold on to them forever. But part of what Catholic theology is doing is facing these really hard questions of like, you are going to die. We are all going to die. What does life mean? What are we gonna make of the time here that we have? And if we get sort of um, uh, taken off course into this idea that, oh, no, well, we can keep living in hardware and everything will be great. Like I said, like it can be this kind of opiate where we just let things of the now go by the wayside. You know, ethical problems right now are just you know, little things that are in service of this greater end. Um, so I think just for the larger discussion, right, to continue, you know, we get in the, you know, Catholicism, in the popular discourse can certainly emphasize things that, um, uh, no, you know, I don't know that are worth our time. <laughs> um, because there are important things that culturally Catholicism and Christianity can emphasize, right? How do we value each other as human beings right here, right now? Like, how do we see each other as holy? How do, you know, how do we do that across cultures? How does, you know, how does you know, Facebook do this, like we were saying? So I just think continuing to steer the discourse and not let us get off on these things of like, how can we reanimate each other? You know, and it, like, it, like that's not going to happen. And we have to sort of insist, like, you know, be a place where we can talk about death, where we can talk about, you know, tragedy and suffering. Um, uh, We have, okay. we have, hold on, Anna. We have a question over here first. I'm so sorry. No, um, that, you won't apologize for asking questions. Please. Thank you both for <laughs> your talk. I kind of wanted to build off of what the questions have been, but from more of a, a user viewpoint, I see a lot of almost competing priorities, value systems between mission and margin in the corporation, between the view of human dignity with the Imago Dei versus almost a transhumanist approach. And you talked about um, how there are two um, moral agents, the recipients and the makers. How do you, I feel like the recipients have a lot of power, the, the people using social media, the people using technology have a lot of voice. How would you push more education or almost a collaboration between Catholic social ethics and human dignity versus this Silicon Valley of transhumanism onto them? You talked a little bit about education, but what else? Consumer groups are another example. So again, ways in which citizens together reflect critically on what's happening to them, what's happening in society. So is, education is a process of empowerment. So we, we grow stimulated by others. And uh, there are ways in which, you no, know, education, I, 
the risk of the vacation is that maybe is a passive, you know, dynamic. When it is successful is when it is on the opposite, is there is an interaction between those who promote education and those who are, you know, involved in education between, you know, the teachers and, and the students, the professors and the students. So uh, we, we could say that within society, we, we have multiple social agents who can help the process of uh, growth in awareness and uh, of critical reasoning of what's happening and might help in changing what's occurring in society. So I, I think there is a role, surely, for institutions involved in education, but there is also a role for citizens, as we heard, even uh, through the legal system. Uh, there is a role for a stronger interaction with law enforcement, as we have seen in the recent years, trying to help law enforcement uh, forces to reflect on their dynamics, their strategies how they use their power, how they are the service of the citizens. So if you want I have, you know, an optimist view of the possibilities in civil society, and the church is another contributor, and we can think how the church can be part of this process, uh, particularly when the church needs to address issues in society and wants to be partner in addressing society, but also needs to address things within itself. And you know, that relate to power dynamic, dynamics or abuse and uh, issues of justice. So this is, if you want, a demanding process where the, the issues are not only out there, but the issues are also within. And so it seems to me that if we are attentive to this critical reading of the reality and uh, uh, taking advantage as much as possible of what dialogue can make possible and collaboration and interaction, if you want a relational approach, will, I hope, help us to move forward. Is this, yes, on. Um, so really, really interesting papers, both of you, or presentations, I suppose, thank you. I have a kind of a vague, ill-defined question <laughs> slash comment. Um, <laughs> It occurs to me, and I've been thinking about this a lot, and I know a lot of us probably have in the humanities, it occurs to me that a lot of what we're doing is kind of shaking our, like the people in the humanities are kind of shaking their fists, right, at people in tech and in science. Um, and sometimes kind of saying, you've forgotten some of the sort of basic foundations that all of us want to work together to sort of build in society, right? Whatever it is. So anthropology, religious studies, theology, moral and political philosophy. You've forgotten over there in science and in the business school and in um, tech the importance of some of these kind of foundational ways of thinking. Um, and so I'm hearing that in um, both of your presentations, but also to some degree in what Reed is doing in trying to kind of take the humanities to the world of tech and business, right? And so, and then I also know, Matt, that you've done some of this at the level of the university, right? Like how, does, how do we build universities that aren't just looking to get the student the highest paying job, right? But they're also trying to create certain types of character. So I wonder if like there's anything to be said at a conference sponsored by the Greffenstetter Center at Duquesne University for science and technology and law, but ethics as the overarching <laughs> umbrella, right? Which like seems to me like it's trying to bridge this gap between the humanities and the hard sciences. Um, like what should our institutions be doing to resist backburnering? That's not a verb, but I just made it one. Putting on the back burner the humanities in favor of the hard sciences, I'll, I'll or just, should we? Yeah, no, I mean, I'll just say, I saw this tweet the other day that was like, maybe we could come up with a program that would help people um, be able to discern truth in uh, the media uh, and, uh, you know, be able to understand when they're looking at disinformation. And I was just, as somebody whose undergraduate degree is genu like is in liberal philosophy and liberal arts, like the broadest possible thing, my head was just like, ah, because that's, like, that is what, 
liberal arts is for. Right. Like, like going and reading like Plutarch's lives, like go read, uh, you know, the, the life of Solon, right? Like you will actually, it will help you understand, uh, you know, these questions of like what makes a, a life worth living. Um, or, you know, what is morality and can it be taught, right? Which is, one, you know, one of the, um, the dialogues. Um, so I, I just, rather than saying like, how can we, I just feel like a lot of schools have like, um, it's like we have our humanities that we just, we're not gonna fund and we're not gonna talk about and we're just sort of begrudgingly have, but then we'll put in like business ethics. And I just, I think that you can see it as an asset. I, I just feel like you can see it as an asset, you know, that you can, that you can see the liberal arts as an asset. And I just know, this, we are all shaking our fists because it does sort of feel like, you, you hear people saying things like, well, how can we, you know, why should we keep our liberal arts, but at the same time, how do we make sure that our business students know how to navigate the world? And it's like, you know, it's really, it's quite defeating to hear those at the same time. Um, but I, I, you know, I, what I have noticed, I see a lot of students here, I don't know, it, and I'm sure you're required to be here, but um, uh, <laughs> that they enjoy having these conversations. They really enjoy having these conversations. People, like, I don't, I don't notice that, you know, this is like a drag, so. Two things, one about method and one about examples. A method, I think, a hindrance to this interaction between the humanities and the sciences is if within each discipline, within each practitioner, within each discipline, we presume that we have the answer to every question. Or to say it differently, we presume that we can have access to the truth only with our disciplinary approach and we can own the truth in a very comprehensive way. If we choose a more humble approach, where we search together for the truth and we bring what we have in terms of questions that help us to understand the complexity of things, maybe methodologically, it seems to me, is more successful. Concretely, it means interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity on an equal level, where there is not a superiority of one discipline over the others. In terms of examples, there are various projects in, in the country and the world that show this possible interaction between different disciplines. If I can uh, give a couple of examples from my own university, Boston College, we are finishing building up a building that will be housing an integrated science uh, is, is, is for integrated science and society. So science and humanities will be part of uh, the way in which we address issues on three major topics, health, environment, energy, actually four, and data. And so we want to gamble on the richness of uh, the liberal arts uh, education and uh, the competence and the expertise of sciences to address these very complex issues. A second example is for the core, in the recent years, we launched courses that are taught together whether they are two professors teaching together in the same semester or two professors working together uh, throughout the year, one course following the other. And the two, and the, these courses are addressing complex problems and enduring questions. If you want, the perception is, the, the, the presumption is we cannot simply with whether they are humanities or the natural sciences or social sciences address what uh, some scholars like Willie Jenkins define as wicked problems, and the environment is a clear example. And so we need to work collaboratively to address them, and we need to find ways that are helping us and helping the future generations to see how we can, uh, having maybe one expertise in one discipline, but have a sort of literacy a disciplinary literacy in another discipline, and this enriches. The example of major, double majors, major and minor, is pointing in this direction. I, I would just add, that's fascinating that you're bringing science and humanity into the same building, because at Santa Clara, we're actually doing the exact opposite. We just built a giant STEM center which brought the sciences and engineering into one building separate from the rest of the school, which I think is completely the wrong answer to that. And so, Anna, to, to your question, I would say we need to reject the STEM, non-STEM divide as something that these are two different things. One makes you money and one is about life. 
Like, no. Um, STEM needs to be about life, too. It needs to be about ethics. It needs to be about goodness and, and flourishing. Um, and the humanities needs to know about tech, frankly. Yeah. Um, and so I, I reject the divide. Um, but that's going to take some work. And I recognize that the divide does exist, and it's going to take some work to not do that. And I, I appreciate even just the physical solution, you know, as, as opposed to, to our approach, which is, which is different. And Dan just told me that the theology department is moving further down the hill, you know, and away from, from the rest of campus here. So we'll see how Duquesne does this. So. <laughs> um, but I believe that wraps us up for this session. So good timing. Um, we'll be back in 15 minutes, or is it 20? 20 minutes. So go, uh, there may be some more drinks and snacks. Thank you to our presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew.
one. Okay. All right. All right. If everybody could take their seats, we'll get started on the, the final panel. All right. Uh, welcome back, everyone. And I am excited to introduce our final panel discussion of the day on law and policy issues in biometric technology. So this panel is moderated by Beth Schwanke, and she is the executive director of the University of Pittsburgh Institute for Cyber Law, Policy, and Security. Her legal commentary has been featured on Al Jazeera, CNN, and NPR, among in other international news outlets. And her writing has been published in such publications as the New York Times, The Hill, Sydney Morning Herald, and The Wall Street Journal. Before coming to Pitt, Beth previously served as the Senior Policy Counsel and Director of Policy Outreach for the Center for Global Development, a think tank researching international development. So pleased to announce Beth Schwenke. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, John, and thank you so much all for joining us. I think our job as the last panel of the day is not to lose you, so <laughs> we will do our best. Um, so I'm here to introduce uh, Professor Elizabeth Rowe and Claire Garvey. Um, we are going to hear from both of them about policy considerations for facial recognition technologies today. We're gonna hear why these technologies require regulation and a sense of what already is out there in the regulation landscape and where perhaps regulation should head. Um, so I will start by introducing Claire. Claire Garvey is the Senior Associate at Georgetown Law's Center on Privacy and Technology. She was the lead author on the 2016 publication, The Perpetual Lineup, Unregulated Police Face Recognition in America, which surveyed state and local police use of face recognition technology. Um, and I will add, it's just hugely groundbreaking in this area and definitely encourage you all to read it. Um, she is also the lead author of Garbage In, Garbage Out, Face Recognition on Flawed Data and America Under Watch, Face Surveillance in the United States. And I'm also going to introduce Elizabeth Rowe. Elizabeth is the Irving Sipen Professor of Law, Distinguished Teaching Scholar, and the Director of the Program in Intellectual Property Law at the University of Florida Levin College of Law. She is a leading scholar in trade secret law and was formerly a partner at Hale & Dorr. She is the author of Regulating Facial Recognition Technology in the Private Sector in the Stanford Technology Law Review, which is one of the first law review articles to focus on commercial regulation of face recognition. So thank you so much for being here today, both of you. And Claire, we're gonna to turn to you. Thank you so much. Uh, very excited to be here today. Um, and I think I'm really excited for this panel. Uh, it's been a really interesting day and I hope to weave in some of the things that we've heard earlier. Um, my remarks are gonna focus a lot on state and local law enforcement use of face recognition, both because that's my area of expertise and that leaves Elizabeth to focus on her area of expertise, which is far more at the federal and uh, commercial applications of face recognition. So before I get started, I wanna bring something back from the first panel we heard today, and that's the idea that face recognition has a lot of different applications. We talk about face recognition as this kind of monolith, but as we've heard in various um, different discussions, it's a tool. It can be used in a lot of different applications. Um, the ways I like to think of it is there are four general categories that face recognition falls into. One is face verification. Is this person who they say they are? We see that uh, in the airport context, in an employment context, in the opening my phone context. Um, I face identification, who is this person? Comparing a photo or video of unknown, un unknown individual to a database of known individuals. This is used in the law enforcement context and a couple other contexts. Face surveillance, the use of, or what I will use, term face surveillance, the use of real-time face recognition, the ability to put face recognition on the back end of uh, live video feeds to identify individuals walking past a certain camera, 
and face characterization or classification. Uh, if folks were at the screening of Coded Bias last night, uh, Joy Bulamwini's work focuses a lot on gender recognition, the ability to infer somebody's sex, race, age, but also emotional state, uh, what they're thinking perhaps, even to the point of predicting, attempting to predict somebody's propensity to commit a certain type of crime or behave a certain way in the future. That falls under face classification or face characterization. All these are referred to as face recognition, and I just wanna tee that up. Um, what I'm focusing specifically is on identification and face surveillance, which are the primary uses of face recognition in the law enforcement context. What is the state of play in the US? Well, face recognition is incredibly common in the law enforcement and public agency uh, use. We estimated back in 2016, when I conducted a survey of about 100 law enforcement agencies around the country, that over half of all American adults are in a face recognition database that are used for criminal investigations, thanks to getting a driver's license photo, or a driver's license, and being enrolled in a DMV database. Uh, at least a quarter of all law enforcement agencies have access to a face recognition system. That number is probably much higher. Um, and uh, we also estimate that, uh, that it's used probably hundreds of thousands of times in a given year, and it's been used ever since 2001. Uh, the first jurisdictions to use it were um, the Michigan State Police and the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office in Florida. They started using it in 2001. So it's been used for 20 years. Uh, it's incredibly unregulated. I will be talking about regulation in a moment, but the general assumption should be that there actually aren't laws or regulations governing how a given law enforcement agency can or more importantly cannot use face recognition technology uh, because most jurisdictions still don't have a law in the books that, uh, that prescribes certain restrictions around its use. The uptake of this technology has been incredibly rapid and I think that's for um, a, couple of, a couple of reasons and I, why I focus particularly on face recognition over other biometrics um, is because of this rapid uptake. The main reason is because we are all, functionally speaking, in a face recognition database. If you have a driver's license or state ID, perhaps even a student ID, visa, passport, a mugshot, chances are better than not you are in a face recognition database. And even if that's a photo database, in any given point in time, that can be converted into a biometric database. Clearview AI has expanded that reality even further. They now purport to have 10 billion images scraped from the web in a face recognition database, uh, access to which they sell to law enforcement. There are less than 10 billion people in the world, which means they have at least, well, a little over one photo of all of us. I guess, in this database. Um, as a practical reality, you are in a face recognition database. The other reason why the uptake has been so rapid is the user experience. The user interface is very understandable to all of us. When the uh, Customs and Border Protection were thinking of implementing biometric en entry exit, um, a program that the Congress mandated that they explore, they tried out fingerprinting and passengers were kind of grossed out by touching a, a pad, a fingerprint pad, that every other passenger had to touch as well. It's kind of gross. They were incredibly creeped out by iris scans. And they were 100% fine with getting their photo taken. It's something that we all just have a very, we've all been very inculcated into being comfortable having our photo taken whether or not we understand the full implications of what happens with that photo. So all that to say the uptake of this technology has been incredibly rapid. Um, and then the last reason for that is the potential, the ability to take something that is so visible and can be collected remotely, being our faces, compare that to a database of known faces to de-anonymize or identify individuals is incredibly appealing especially in a law enforcement context, when the only evidence you might have is a photo of somebody at 
uh, a given crime scene or near where a crime took place. Face recognition has raised a lot, has, has been the subject of a lot of interest and a lot of regulation over the last few years, um, which has focused on a few key risks. And my uh, work focuses on those, those risks. So when I, when I talk about face recognition, I talk about the potential harms. I also talk about them being an attorney in terms of constitutional rights. So what are these risks? There's a First Amendment risk. What are our rights to privacy and particularly anonymity in our free speech, free association um, that we participate in in public spaces? It sounds contradictory to say I have a right to privacy to my face if I choose to show up at a public demonstration. That sounds kind of absurd. Law enforcement would say, well, hang on. I have the right to take your photograph if you're at a public demonstration. If I decide to go to an anti-police demonstration in downtown Pittsburgh, we can video record you. We can take notes about what's going on. But can they establish my identity? Can they look, can they demand that I show my driver's license? No, they can't. So where does face recognition fall within that, those two, um, you know, within that spectrum? It's somewhere in between. It is not quite just taking a photograph because it has a form of identification, but it is not demanding that I produce my identification. It's passively scanning me. So there's a very real question about where face recognition falls in this spectrum of what is or is not private in public space. Um, the Supreme Court, in a case called Carpenter in 2018, said that actually we do have a right to privacy to our movements across time and space in that they betray very sensitive pieces of information about who we are, about what we believe, about what our associations are, things that we don't intend to make public even though we have to appear in public, such as where we go to church, where we pick our children up from school, who we choose to have coffee with or go home with at night. This is information that cannot be passively collected um, for days, months on end without a warrant by law enforcement. Uh, they were looking at, in Carpenter, they were looking at the um, cell site location information, the retroactive information that our phones collect and store about where we are. But it raises a very interesting question. What if we can uh, collect that same type of information based on where our faces show up, which cameras our faces show up uh, on, on in a given day? Does that fall under the warrant requirement? It's an open question. But it's a very real question about whether face recognition and the Fourth Amendment have direct interactivity. The Fifth Amendment, the right to due process. Face recognition, as I mentioned, has been used for the last 20 years by law enforcement as an investigative tool. Under um, a case called Brady, uh, the Supreme Court said that um, a defendant is entitled to information, um, information that speaks to their guilt or innocence, potentially exculpatory information. Well, information about how they were identified, put in another way, information that may suggest that they actually aren't the person that law enforcement thinks they are, is potentially exculpatory, but has not been traditionally released to the defense in the hundreds of thousands of cases where face recognition is used. I would argue that's actually a due process violation. And equal protection. A, um, algorithms, historically, and many of current algorithms commercially available algorithms that are tested by the National Institute of Standards and Technology seem to con uh, perform differently depending on the demographics of the person being searched. Their accuracy varies depending on race, sex, and age. with an intersectional component there. We are not just a specific race without being a gender, so those will interplay. What do we make of the need for equal protection under the laws and a law enforcement tool that performs differently depending on your demographics. So there are huge constitutional questions around face recognition that to date no court has actually uh, 
examined, really. Um, which means the legislature has stepped in. Not at the federal level, but at the state and local level. We have seen over the last few years a lot of regulation in the law enforcement space. So now, or sorry, in, yeah, in the law enforcement use of face recognition space. So switching gears to that side of things, we've actually seen four sort of types, or four approaches in the regulatory space. The first and the one that gets the most attention are bans. Let's just ban the use of the technology. There are pros and cons to this approach. The pros is that it's kind of easy. We can just say, we don't have to think about the nuances. We don't have to nitpick around what are the benefits, what are the harms. Let's just say, no, you can't use it. Full stop, go back to analog identification. Um, we've seen that in a handful of places. The first was San Francisco. One of the other issues with these local bans is that um, they tend to be jurisdiction specific um, instead of right specific. The ban is a ban on city um, because it was is issued by San Francisco. It's a ban on city employees. So SFPD cannot use face recognition. SF, the San Francisco County Police or sheriffs who can still make arrests within the city limits are permitted to use the technology still. So that is an inherent limit in hyper-local bans. It may actually just be banning certain people from using the technology as opposed to protecting the rights of the individuals against the harms that we think this technology is perpetuating. Then we see two types of moratorium. It's a ban and a moratorium the same. Moratorium is like super convoluted word for a, let's press the pause button on the use of the technology. One kind of this is a time-bound moratorium. Let's just not use it for the next two years and hope something happens that figures this stuff out for us. Again, it's kind of easy. Is it kicking the can down the road? <laughs> yes. Or hoping the federal government regulates in the space, perhaps. Um, we saw that in Springfield, Massachusetts, for example. I think they put a two-year moratorium on the use of the technology. Then there are directive moratoria saying, OK, we're going to put a ban on the technology unless and until something happens. Usually, the legislature passes a law affirmatively allowing it. This was something that was really being pushed for in Massachusetts. They landed up getting a regulatory bill instead. Um, other types of directive moratoriums say, OK, let's press pause while we set up a task force. The task force is going to give us recommendations after three years. They're going to tell us what to do, and then we'll regulate. And then the fourth type is regulation. Um, basically, let's actually just sit down and hash this out now. What should the regulation look like? Back in 2016, um, when I talked to law enforcement about the use of face recognition, they were very skeptical about the need for regulation. They're like, this is just a tool. We got this. Don't worry about it. Uh, you know, we have lots of investigative techniques that are not regulated up the wazoo. Like, just let us do our thing. Now I'd be hard pressed to find anyone who doesn't think that regulation is appropriate. But the snag is what regulation is appropriate. Um, the ones we, t the, the types of regulations that we see are, as I mentioned, setting up a task force or working group. Um, hopefully, this says bringing in what the, the last panel was talking about elements of and representatives from the community. What does the community want? Policing is a service to a community. What do they think about the use of this technology on them? Uh, placing requirements on companies to be more transparent, to audit, to um, subject themselves to sort of external oversight. Accountability and transparency reports. One of the things we found in doing survey of law enforcement use is that most law enforcement agencies don't keep track of their own use of the technology, which means that not only is there its use not transparent to the public or to the defendant uh, on which this technology is used, but even to the law enforcement agency themselves. They don't have transparency into how often it's used, how successful it is, how unsuccessful it is. Um, implementing regulations around the officer use 
such as training or certification or limiting access. When Ohio's system was first set up, I think it was 20,000 people had access to use the system, including every single court uh, employee. Um, after some negative press around that, they limited it down to 7,000, and then after another review, it's been further limited still. Um, explicit civil rights and liberties protections, restrictions on First Amendment protected activity, that type of thing. Restrictions around what types of crimes it can be used on. This is a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, but in line with the Federal Wiretap Act, there is an analog for limiting sort of advanced tools to certain types of crimes only. Face recognition may not be appropriate for jaywalking, for example, but maybe it is appropriate for a murder investigation. Why is this a double-edged sword? You're upping the ante. So to the extent that face recognition may not work as advertised or may make mistakes, um, you're putting that, that risk on higher risk crimes, on, um, on investigations that will lead to more jail time. Um, so you're just upping the ante on the, the risk of what happens if there's a misidentification. Side note, there are misidentifications. We heard later or earlier that there are at least three misidentifications that have been authenticated. All were uh, black men misidentified using face recognition. Um, all three of them are suing their respective jurisdictions. Um, but the damage has largely been done. Job loss, um, PTSD, trauma to their families, et cetera. Um, targeted bans restricting certain uh, applications, the use of technology with other forms of technology, like don't use face recognition on body cams, but sure, use it on surveillance uh, footage, that kind of thing. And then court order requirements, we see that a lot. The requirement that um, before a search is conducted, an officer must go to a judge and assert that he, he or she has probable cause to run a search. All of these are trying to get at the risks, the perceived and actual risks of face recognition. Um, I think as I've mentioned some of them, uh, there are loopholes, there are um, problems with the very, the hyper-local or state approach. We've created a patchwork of restrictions on, in, on officer behavior more so than a comprehensive um, paradigm protecting constitutional rights. Um, it seems odd to me that we're dealing with constitutional rights, and yet folks in Washington state are more protected than folks in Ohio right now. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Elizabeth to talk about what the potentials are at the federal level for federal regulation, as well as the commercial side of the face recognition equation. Thank you, Claire, and thank you all for uh, inviting me to be here and participate today. It's been a wonderful uh, conference, and I especially appreciate having listened to all of this, that you invited us as lawyers and legal scholars to, to be part of your, part of your group. Uh, because I think, uh, as we were discussing earlier today, that sometimes part of the issue is we don't get called in until problems occur. Um, and it's actually, you know, we can be of some use uh, uh, in the beginning as well. Um, so Claire discussed and gave you a, a wonderful uh, background on the status in terms of um, law enforcement use and what's happening on the, on the state level. On the federal side of things, um, and in particular in the private sector, which is uh, my area of expertise, um, there's nothing, um, nothing happening. So that's what um, I have spent a good deal of time uh, thinking about. Certainly there are proposals uh, floating around. Um, and a lot of the discussion has been about the law enforcement, criminal justice uh, side. Uh, what has been, I think, uh, quite overlooked has been the, 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 the business to business, the private 
um, uh, aspect of, of regulating, especially considering that the nature of these technologies is such that they are a joint endeavor. It's the private sector that often provides, develops and provides uh, the technology to the government. And the government, frankly, in my um, sort of scheme of things, is a consumer, uh, the largest consumer, uh, but a consumer nonetheless, just as we are individually consumers uh, of, these, of these technologies. So with that in mind, and just thinking about the, the actual, if we were to draw the relationships between the parties and the stakeholders here, we have, we now have businesses um, in a business-to-business -business context who are developers, who are consumers themselves, who are producers. Um, we have consumers, uh, another large group, who are individual consumers, uh, but also businesses as consumers, and in particular, the government. Uh, as a consumer and perhaps the largest consumer, as I said, uh, of, these, of these technologies. So as we think about regulation, I, I come at it from the perspective of regulating from the middle, I call it. What's starting to happen is that we have camps forming, um, uh, as you heard from Claire, there's the, you know, ban it all, we don't need it, it doesn't work, or it's bad, and others who say, you know, there's nothing wrong with it, you know, uh, kind of leave us alone, let us, let us do our thing. So at the outset, as we think about and as there certainly has been a move toward regulation on the federal side, um, I think one thing, at least to me, that we have to be very mindful of is that there will not be a one-size-fits-all approach because the problems underlying what we're trying to attack are, um, are too complex. And... Um, so in order to be effective, uh, which maybe not is high on the list sometimes, but in order to be effective, uh, the considerations about regulation, I think, need to be nuanced, um, and they need to be specifically tailored. We also need to avoid regulating just for the sake of regulating, uh, because at the end, that doesn't always, looking historically, when we've, uh, you know, regulations don't always accomplish at the end, what we intended uh, in the beginning. Um, and so they often can sometimes fall short of being effective, of being efficient. And indeed, often those calling for regulations themselves are certain uh, to often find that when they do get what they want, they're still not satisfied. Not because they're not hard to satisfy, it could be that too, but they're unsatisfying. The result is unsatisfying. Um, or they may actually be annoyed. I mean, think about the uh, GDPR, which wonderful, uh, all of these um, consumer, da consumer data protections. Uh, but now we're annoyed when we get the pop-ups, do you consent or not? And we just, oh, get this thing off, consent and move on. Um, so is that what we're after? Who knows? Uh, but that's what we got. So even companies that favor regulation uh, and many do right now, uh, including uh, companies like Amazon, um, will inevitably be concerned about the cost of compliance with, with, with these regulations and also various ambiguities that often are written in or not written in, however you want to uh, interpret them, uh, into, into the law. So today I suggest a framework for approaching regulation rather than specific uh, leg legislation. And it involves identifying, first of all, common interests uh, among the various um, stakeholders and their various concerns. Also, I will um, suggest a few guided questions as a broad outline on what contours, contours of regulation should look like. And finally, I'll recommend uh, certain concrete <clears throat> steps toward building and approaching the substantive and procedural debate on regulation. So let's start with a broad summary of some of the general concerns of the various stakeholders, uh, starting first with companies. So companies uh, receive tremendous benefit 
from facial recognition technology, in particular, the group work is there. So for instance, they receive lots of information, they're able to make decisions more quickly, and of course, increase revenues. Yet the lack of federal regulations in this area also raises tremendous concerns for them. Uh, in particular, how do they avoid liability? They collect, they store, they share, they use this data. How do they avoid liability? Um, to the extent that we have states like Illinois that are regulating in this space, most companies do business nationally. So it's inefficient to have to work through select patchwork of regulation and saying, okay, I can do this in Illinois, but I can't do that anywhere else or vice versa. Um, so ideally, they want consistency uh, which often comes uh, on the federal side. Companies are also concerned about misuse um, and what their, pot their potential liability might be for misuse of data that they collect and they use and how they share it. And as I said earlier, compliance costs are always uh, a concern because whenever you say regulation, there are costs to comply with, with whatever regulation is put in place. Finally, they also value secrecy. Uh, secrecy, um, and I come here as a trade secret, an expert in trade secret law, uh, secrecy to protect algorithms, uh, secrecy to protect the data that is also uh, collected from individuals. All of those are incredible and important assets uh, that, companies, uh, that companies own. From the perspective of consumers, for as much as we complain, we love the convenience of, um, that these technologies provide. So how many of us get so annoyed, right, before the newest Apple update when with our mask on, our phones wouldn't unlock and you're trying to check out at the grocery store or whatever. Um, and, you know, luxury buildings now have biometric and facial recognition technologies that unlock doors for you and let you into the gym and let you into various parts of the building. So you don't need to carry a key around. Isn't that wonderful? You don't have to worry about losing your key. Um, yet, consumers are certainly concerned about privacy. I put quotes around that because as we discussed earlier, uh, what does that mean? Um, they're concerned about misuse of that data once it is collected, uh, despite the fact that you know, they love the convenience. And they're also concerned about civil liberties and the protection of their civil liberties uh, as they move through uh, the various business uses, but also certainly um, the potential that this information can also be uh, turned over to law enforcement. So they too then could benefit from secrecy to protect their privacy. Uh, because much like a social security number, it seems to me, if businesses get to protect their secrets as trade secrets, the current framework as individual privacy really doesn't have nothing near the same kind of weight legally as if individual information were treated the way business individual secret information uh, is treated. So, there, so there's a gap there right now, and perhaps a bridge, or I don't know how, but what term we want to use. Uh, but, but, but that's another way of, of, of thinking and conceptualizing about how, what individuals uh, may have. So the patchwork of regulations that offer protections in a few states right now is helpful, but again, you know, if I don't live in Illinois, you know, it doesn't matter to me. And in fact, the people that live in Illinois may actually be annoyed because now they're really, you know, lots of companies uh, have some, will, will sometimes carve out certain features uh, of technologies that is offered to users of every state but Illinois, for instance. So you're actually missing out, they may think, right, on, on certain um, aspects of the technology and certain uses that they may actually enjoy. For the government, 
as a sort of final broad group of stakeholders, they use facial recognition technology very widely and in a huge range of areas, not only in law enforcement, uh, on the border, uh, public housing, uh, in schools. Schools are starting to use um, uh, facial recognition technology at every level. So it's widely used. The technology is used because it's a useful tool. Um, and it's efficient. You could do, in terms of sort of cost, what it would take, you know, several humans, several, you know, paid humans to do. Uh, you, you don't need them anymore because you could use the technology uh, to more uh, easily accomplish all of that. However, when we talk about government use, we have to think about, uh, we have special considerations, special constitutional considerations, as Claire mentioned, that aren't implicated in the private sector, but certainly are implicated uh, in the private sphere. So the potential for abuse and misuse of the information, uh, the potential for poor decision making with the information, um, and also uh, government's fear that sometimes, again, with respect to these bans, that even though they like using it, that their local public um, will be powerful enough to, to nonetheless, uh, you know, implement, get bans uh, implemented. So I see then about five areas of overlap um, across these various stakeholders. So if we were drawing concentric circles, here's where I would draw them. First, a need for regulation. I think all of these would, would, groups would argue that, yes, we need regulation. Second, a need for consistency and uniformity uh, to address the expectations and also uh, to address concerns about efficiency. Third, there's certainly a need for security uh, and secrecy or privacy. Fourth, there's a need to balance civil liberties as well as the various uh, privacy concerns on the civil side. And finally, there's a need to ensure accuracy and reliability. So all of these groups, I think, would agree uh, on, on those things. So when we're thinking about regulation, then, I think these are a few questions that we should ask uh, as legislators uh, sit down to write, um, to write what the rules should be. Uh, first, should businesses be regulated? If so, which ones? Because that doesn't mean every business should be regulated. And how do we draw the line as to which ones and when? If we decide to regulate, who will be the regulating agency or agencies? Who will be in charge of all this? What will be their powers? How much discretion will they have? How much flexibility will they have? What penalties, what sanctions will be imposed for misuse, for abuse, for noncompliance? How will the regulated information be defined? Because as we've heard today, the vocabulary and the grammar, whatever you want to call it, is all over the place. So what exactly, how are we going to define in sort of a universal way uh, what it is that we're regulating? What provisions are going to be in place for notice and for consent? And how, how are we going to do that? What are we going to do about transparency? with respect to the collection of information and the handling of information. And finally, what exceptions, if any, because we find that we often do need exceptions. So what exceptions uh, will be made? Will we be making exceptions for certain types of information, for exceptions for uses by certain bodies and not others, for certain applications but not others, for certain groups of people and not others? Those are all questions that uh, I think need to be answered. So I offer then in terms of guidance, more specific guidance, three specific points. First, uh, regulation in this space, even though I use it in a, as a singular word, regulation, um, should apply a differentiated approach. Because as I said in the beginning, this is not a one-size-fits-all situation. And 
perhaps different areas need to be tackled differently, separately, and perhaps even independently uh, of each other. So facial recognition technology, for instance, might be regulated differently from handprints and other types of biometric information. Civil issues, private sector issues, might be regulated differently from law enforcement and criminal justice issues. We might consider specific markets, healthcare, for instance. There may be special considerations uh, for uh, regulating in certain markets where we treat them differently. Discrete business applications and different uses. And finally, something that I think about a good bit is, but haven't figured out, categories of people, and in particular, minors. What do we do about minors? Do we treat them the same way as we treat adults? And even in the line of minors, do we treat little children, like elementary school children, the same as we would treat a 17-year-old or a 16-year-old? Uh, and the different ways that the data is used and collected and the fact that, you know, as, as people, as children get older, their, you know, their features change, just as we saw earlier, as we age, you know, features change as well. Uh, and minors in particular are particularly are, are a vulnerable um, group. Uh, second, uh, we should provide precise and practical rules for the key areas that I've described earlier, storage, use, collection, and sharing. Uh, we should reduce um, compliance costs, and we need to have greater clarity so that companies know on a day-to-day -day basis what interactions should look like with their employees, uh, with consumers, with business partners, and we need to have written policies for all of those because we're already starting to see uh, some legislation, um, some litigation uh, between employers and employees, for instance, for the uses of these technologies in the workplace. Finally, we need to address um, key concerns that we hear uh, from um, social scientists and others uh, about criticisms about the technologies. Accuracy is a big one. Um, you know, the race and the gender disparities. There are religious objections. We have some, have had some actions as well from um, religious objections for certain uh, employees who refuse to use uh, these technologies in the workplace and whether they are protected by law uh, from doing so. Uh, security concerns for everybody about storage and use of the information and the need to be proactive in preventing uh, misuse ultimately of whatever data is collected. So these are paramount, I think, uh, and one way to kind of process all of them leads me to my third and final point, which is uh, to consider trade secrecy, and maybe this is just the hammer seeing a lot of nails everywhere, uh, but it's to use trade secrecy uh, to, um, to think through if we have a need here, I keep saying everybody wants to keep things secret and we want to keep things confidential, well, this is exactly what trade secret law has been built for um, you know, on the business side for all these years. In trade secret law, we have a reasonable efforts requirement, which is the standard by which if companies want to keep their information secret, we require them to have made reasonable efforts uh, to, to, to protect the information and to secure the information. So that could be a standard that we apply to what level of care is needed by companies with respect to storage and security and data that is collected and in, in their care. Finally, another thing that we do a lot of in trade secret law is NDAs, uh, confidentiality agreements, uh, contracts about how things are gonna be used, how they're gonna be protected and how they're gonna be kept secret. Uh, so because the point is to protect against improper disclosures. So as we move about this space, we can't overlook the, um, the option of using contracts uh, to also, among the parties and between the parties, uh, have them negotiate for themselves uh, what will be shared, what won't be shared, and how. 
Now, I'm not suggesting that a trade secret framework, you know, in its entirety is ideal or an ideal fit for, for the issues here. Uh, and in fact, you know, I should probably reveal as I end that we actually have a dirty little secret here, and it is that it is indeed the law of trade secrecy that is largely responsible uh, for the concerns about lack of transparency in AI generally um, and the black boxes um, that protect these technologies. Uh, but with that recognition, I see trade secret law as um, to the extent even if it contributes to the problem, it also could contribute to the solution because it has a system in place uh, already that deals with um, handling secrets, protecting secrets, uh, deciding what can be shared, how it can be shared, and under what circumstances. So in the context, for instance, you know, where, you know, as Claire mentioned, with the criminal justice system, where you have these special cases where transparency and constitutional concerns uh, rise to a level uh, which they don't in, others, in other areas, very careful consideration has to be given to balancing uh, those concerns with the public interest, with constitutional uh, concerns um, all, all around. So that's it, thank you. All right, great. Thank you both so much. That was um, an excellent start to our conversation. Um, so before we start, for, for you Pittsburghers in the audience, um, in case you are interested, the Pittsburgh City Council actually did pass uh, some regulation around facial recognition uh, in 2020. Um, and essentially, before any city agency wants to use technology, uh, wants to procure a technology involving facial recognition, it does require city council uh, approval. That said, there are about a million carve outs, um, including the uh, ability to um, authorize it, you know, an exemption to that requirement uh, in, in an emergency situation. So um, pretty far short of a ban or even a moratorium or just about anything you laid out, but, but something. Um, so anyway, um, I hope we will have lots of audience questions, but I think I will start us off. Um, so you both, you know, laid out that, that facial recognition systems are less accurate at identifying um, people of color and women, especially women of color, than they are white men. Um, and we heard about that in, in earlier panels too. And so we hear from advocates a lot that this is you know, part of the reason for why we need to regulate facial, recog facial recognition technology. But I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on if that has any implications for how we should approach our regulation. Sure. So um, I think the first panel touched on this a bit. This is something that does look like it can be overcome um, on the technological side of things. Um, back in 2019, the National Institute of Standards and Technology issued a, uh, a report in their ongoing face recognition vendor test where they did find that a majority of the, the um, algorithms they tested did still perform differently depending on the demographics of the person that was being searched. However, the best performing algorithms seem to have overcome that and performed better, including on this differential error rate. Um, that is kind of tech speak for saying that some companies have actually fixed this problem. That is not to say the problem is fixed, though. Um, again, particularly in the law enforcement space, we have to be cognizant about um, what existing, pre-existing structure this technology is being introduced into. Face recognition um, will be disproportionately uh, deployed on people of color. Um, that's just quite simply because of how policing happens in the US. In San Diego, San Diego Association of Governments that used to run the face recognition system for the agencies in the area found that they used face recognition and license plate readers up to two and a half times more on communities of color than their proportion of the population would suggest. 
simply because of their policing practices. So that's who it's gonna be used on. In addition, a lot of these systems still run on mugshot databases, which represents historic arrest data, disproportionately young black men. So who can be found by these systems? Are the people in the database? If the only people in your database are young black men, then that's who's who are gonna be disproportionately both identified and misidentified by an inaccurate system. So while it seems to be that there is a technological solution that some companies have found to this issue that the algorithms perform differently, um, we have to be very aware that this also perpetuates endemic racial uh, injustices within the criminal legal system. Um, what the solution to that is, is beyond my pay grade. Um, but I think anytime we're talking about a solution, it can't be tech focused. Um, it has to be rights focused. Uh, what are the rights that we're seeking to protect? Um, who are the, the people who are going to be disproportionately impacted by a misidentification? Um, and how can we solve, how can we protect those rights and those injustices from happening rather than how can we rein in a particular technology? I, I think I'd also add to that that in addition to the gender and race issues on the criminal justice side, we've seen also in the private sector that, um, that this has become a, uh, an issue with companies with respect to hiring when they use uh, hiring algorithms, um, uh, some of which involves facial recognition technology. So some companies uh, have tried using basically facial recognition, to, you know, quick video interviews, automatic, uh, you know, uh, videos to kind of scan people and do the initial uh, elimination of, of who's coming in and who's not uh, into the next round. Uh, and those have posed those have posed issues. And with respect to um, other types in the financial sector, we've seen issues where you know women have been treated uh, differently. Um, uh, not necessarily, again, because of uh, a question that asks, are you a woman or not, but because of the data uh, that was put into uh, the algorithm in the first place that uh, was really was, you, was sort of built around uh, providing information that's more typical of male, of male candidates or, or, or people who happen to be male. Uh, so then, uh, you know, when you look at sort of the end result on the other side, it turns out that Oh, we're giving you know we're giving credit, uh, for instance, to to um, to men more often than we are to women, even though they have the exact same salary or the exact same credit history, uh, because based on uh, you know these other bits of data uh, about them that happen to be in the system. So one thing I would say to is yes, we need to sort of get the algorithms correct, whether they be for facial recognition technology or or not uh, in, in the first place. And I think a lot of it is on, you know, how do we train from the beginning? What do we, what do these, what's the training set look like? If we're always training on white people and white males, uh, then, you know, it's not unusual then to expect that when we uh, uh, implement uh, in a world that's not of that demographic that we might have, we might have some issues. So I think then the answer is to be very careful, and this is about AI broadly as well, about, the use in decision making and all and having a human being right involved to double check that when uh, that 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 these decisions uh, don't have a, a negative effect i think that it's I, I think a lot of the issues come in where it's I mean, it feels like the technology has such um, an overriding role in making a decision right that without a human being also involved so in the criminal justice system, right, the, the, you know, the, the risk from that can be high. That means someone gets arrested when they probably shouldn't have or they go to jail uh, when they shouldn't have. Uh, in the private sector, you know, you don't get a loan. Uh, you don't get insurance. Insurance companies are now using uh, this, this, this technology. So, so there's so many ways where you think, okay, the machine does its part, but where's the human being, right, to come in with the human discretion to look it over and say, yeah, this looks right or this doesn't look right, uh, and what's happening internally in terms of just generally auditing and making sure that the technology is working correctly and not having uh, those kinds of gender and race um, uh, disparities. 
Okay, I can keep asking questions forever, but I hope you guys will too. I think we see one here. Hello, um, thank you for both of your presentations. It was very um, great and eye-opening. Um, I think my question is, how do you balance between transparency and trade secrets? So like the argument on the other side could be that um, consumers might lose uh, trust in a company if they sense that there's a lack of transparency from that company. So if you could elaborate on that. Uh, I, I guess one thing I would say is perhaps, but you'd be surprised. I think I think on a on a basic level, a lot of consumers. On, on the civil side, let me let me say it in a different way. On the civil side, we may not realize it, but we're used to having a lot of things be secret to us so that we don't have a right to it. So when a private company makes a decision uh, or, you know, they're, you know, they have whatever data sets that they've built, all of that is is secret and we don't even have a right to it. So. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, I did a project because I wanted to demonstrate this very point, that how even as individuals sometimes, you might think you have a right to something um, that is deeply personal, but it actually doesn't, the right doesn't belong to you, it belongs to the company. And the example that I used were implantable medical devices. Because I thought, what could be more personal? Something that is inside of your body. Right? Um, so when you have an implantable medical device in your body, whether it's measuring, say, your cardiac rates or whatever, um, and, you know, data is coming out of your body, um, you know, I should have, I assume I should have all the, you know, I should be able to get the reports of what's going on. Um, but you don't. You don't. Uh, the data belongs to the company. Um, and if you want access to what's going on, you have to go to your physician, uh, who is the only one who, when the report is printed from the company, it will be released to the physician, and the physician will be able to communicate that to you. Um, so, so that's one of the examples where you see precisely what you that 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 this that that secrecy uh, and transparency especially in those contexts, they just don't match. Now, can they? Yes. Uh, but, but it's about really having, uh, having a negotiation um, ab about it. A negotiation which often cannot happen because as individual consumers, what am I going to say to Apple when they say, check this box or else? Uh, I, I can't say anything about that. Um, so if you have groups, right, who might be able to, again, let, here we go with the legislature. Um, so I'm not going to get into this too much now unless people want to know it, but so that's why I've con I'm considering another angle to this, which is through the procurement system on the government side of things. Because the procurement system, when the government acquires these technologies, they're using contracts. And in those contracts, Again, using a trade secrecy paradigm, that's already what's in there. Those contracts are what say you have to keep the secret. You cannot share this information with the defendant in the criminal justice process, uh, sometimes even with the court, um, and even with the lawyers. No one can know. So what we have to do then is, through that procurement process, change or negotiate change one-on-one. -on -one. We don't need to you need Congress for that. Um, through, the, through the terms, the confidentiality terms that control the transfer of the technology uh, from the developer to the government. So those are some of the ways I think we can get around the, the transparency issues uh, and, and, and get some, a, a little more transparency. But it's just really hard to do on an individual level. Maybe to create a little bit of controversy, I think I might disagree with you a little bit on the extent to which trade secrecy might be helpful here, mostly from the looking at the criminal legal side of things. Mm -hmm. We actually see trade secrets being used successfully to prevent defendants gaining access to source code, for example. 
to a tool that may have uh, determined their, the length of their sentence or something like that. Um, I would argue that trade secrets do not belong in the criminal legal system at all, that that is a civil legal construct to protect trade secrets from competition, but that that's what protective orders are for, and that trade secrets, um, that courts should not entertain trade secrets as an answer to companies' unwillingness to turn over data to criminal defendants who need that data in order to mount a fair defense and be able to adequately uh, fight their case. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I don't disagree with that. I mean, there, there are many who, in, in trying to solve the problem of transparency in the criminal justice system, there are many who say just that, among others, that, I mean, 100% trade secrecy allows the problem to happen, as I said. It's, 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 trade, it's civil trade secret law. This is the other thing, right? What's happening from the legal side is you have sort of a collision between private law and public law because of the dynamic between the private-public relationship, right? Private company producing something to a, you know, to, to a public agency. So when you put all of that together, it seems startling, which it is, right? Because so in the private, because in a private sector, you know, trade secrecy works. People share, don't share. You know, expectations are different. But once trade secrecy enters the criminal justice system, that's when you see. Wait a minute, though, right? These considerations here that didn't exist in the private sector certainly exist here, and we need to do something about it. So, yes, one certain uh, alternative is to say there shouldn't be trade secrecy in the criminal justice system. So we could see regulation, for instance, uh, and believe it or not, there's actually something that passed recently, it's sort of a modest version, but in Idaho, um, you know, that, that, that calls for some changes about uh, trade secrecy uh, within, uh, in, the, in the criminal justice law enforcement context. Um, so, so that would be one one possible route to um, through to to the, to the um, legislation. Some others have also said, from an evidentiary perspective, like looking at it more from evidence law, right? That trade secrets we could probably get rid of trade secrecy as an evidentiary uh, measure because why don't we don't need trade secrets in evidence in a criminal trial? This is all supposed to be public. So that that's absolutely another way. My 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 sort of my procurement um, suggestion is kind of a, okay, but while we wait for all that to happen, which is very unlikely, I think, um, while we wait for all that to happen and while we wait for the legislature, both state and federal, the other problem with the law enforcement side and saying let's have legislation on trade secrets is that it's criminal justice, so it's governed on a state level. It's not federal. So because it's a, it's a state level, you also have tremendous variation. So in, in, in any state, like Florida, for instance, you have city government doing its thing, city law enforcement doing its thing, county law enforcement doing its thing, state law enforcement doing its thing, and nobody, there's no sort of consistency between who's doing what. So at least, I, you know, if in the meantime, we have to figure out some way, at least for the if the city really cares, but the county doesn't or the state doesn't, right, maybe the voters, in addition to the various things that Claire has said that people, right, the bans and moratoria can say, you know, hey, city government, you, because what's happening now is a lot of, um, when challenged, law enforcement will say, for instance, you know, don't look at us, we, you know, we can't share this with you, we signed a contract, right? And they'll use the contract as a, right, as, as the excuse. We have no choice. Um, but, you know, but we're all about transparency and we'd share it if we could. We'd love to. So this way, well, the answer is, well, if you could, then just revise your contract. Because unlike us consumers, who, individual consumers who have, as I said, practically no bargaining power, the government has a lot of bargaining power in acquiring these technologies. Uh, because for a lot of companies, particularly those using that context, that's, that's who they're making it for. That's who they want to sell it to. Now, we, I expect to see that in, on some level, some companies will say then, if you, you know, depending on what you decide in terms of making things available to, you know, to publicly, 
then they may decide, well, I don't want to sell my stuff to you. I'll go sell it to somebody, you know, in some other state that doesn't care. But, you know, but in the meantime, you know, absolutely, at a minimum, these contracts shouldn't say that you can't keep information, that you can keep this information from the defendants in the case, uh, when you could certainly share with protective orders. And there's may, there are ways, even if you keep trade secrecy, there are ways to share, yet keep the secrets secret. We do it all the time on the civil side. Uh, so, so that, that's, that's my point. Okay, we are actually at time, but if, oh, we can do one more. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is kind of broad, uh, so I apologize about that for the uh, short amount of time we have left. Um, it's kind of a good segue, though, your last answer into this question. Um, I think the bottom line is that, you know, we need AI facial uh, recognition um, regulation at this point and I guess is that possible and if so how um, it seems it's relatively bipartisan at this point um, you know the progressive side of things we can you know push police reform uh, conservative side of things we can limit government overreach um, and then there's even some international precedent I recently read that Australia just ordered Clearview to actually delete all of their um, data on Australian citizens um, but obviously there's going to be like police pushback, that kind of thing in the U.S. Uh, would it take like a lawsuit to go to the Supreme Court? Uh, would it, is it even realistic at this point? Uh, could it happen congressionally? Um, I guess given the breadth and depth of what we're dealing with, um, have we hit a point of no return or is it even possible? Like, should we even still have hope for any kind of regulation? <laughs> wow. Okay. So at the state and local level, we've seen 22 and counting. Um, laws passed that do something with, uh, particularly on the law enforcement side, law enforcement use of face recognition, from light touch regulation to all out ban. So if you ask me in 2016, I'm like, you know, we're gonna like hope for regulation and we'll probably see some decent policies. Um, but we've seen some pretty intense movement. Um, I don't think there's another technology that's just been full on banned in places. And face recognition has, and to your point, it's been very bipartisan. Um, the federal level, I am not optimistic. The federal level can, in theory, operate here. They have to be a little sensitive because it's law enforcement. Law enforcement is quintessentially a state's rights issue. Um, but if we're talking constitutional rights, they can absolutely set floors. Um, from a procurement standpoint, most face recognition systems are set up using federal funds, so they could also regulate through procurement. Um, my my prediction is that we're going to see a, we're going to continue to see state and local movements that are going to pass, and we're going to reach a point where it's so patchwork that companies get really fed up and start lobbying the federal government for something more universal. Um, that's, that's my guess. The court side of stuff, the, the, um, on the criminal side, it's, it's a non-start. It's like not moving very fast at all. Uh, on the civil side, it's based. It's really tied to state laws right now. Yeah, so I think, I, I agree with Claire. I think, I think it's possible. Um, and, uh, it's possible. I don't know that it's highly probable. That it's highly likely. Uh, if it, if it, if and if we do see it, it might be, um, you know, perhaps directed to a law enforcement in some way or another, or some piece of it, rather than a, than a wide scale. Uh, in Europe, they seem to have are making a more concerted effort uh, toward regulation. But again, they that sort of, they they tend to be ahead of us. Uh, in, in, in that way, so we could kind of look over there and see maybe that's where we might be headed uh, in a little while. I also think, yes, from the court's perspective, if the Supreme Court were to come out with a ruling um, that might spur things as well, especially if it's one that, um, that, that the public doesn't like, so then it might spur the legislature uh, in, into action. Although one of the, one of the things, um, that, that happened a while back, and Claire probably has some more specifics on this because I don't remember the details, was that uh, facial recognition technology was tested on members of Congress. And there was a mismatch, I think, for about 20, 
or so members of Congress who happen to be, uh, have to fall around race and gender lines. So, so, that, so basically, it, it, it picked them out as criminals when we assumed they were not. <laughs> Um, so, so, so it, so it, so it highlighted, right, a lot of, you know, some of the concerns, the very concerns that had been raised about the accuracy, and I think, so from that, it developed and motivated, right, certain members of Congress to say, yeah, they're not just making this up, some of this stuff actually doesn't work. So, so I, so I think we may continue to see from that and from other, you know, from other isolated stories, kind of, at least an interest in doing it. Um, Amazon, for instance, you know, Amazon produces a face recognition technology called recognition. Um, so, and they, for a while, seemed quite interested in, in legislation and, and, the, and regulation. Uh, and they've proposed a framework that seems pretty reasonable, uh, nothing that anyone here would disagree with as to what that, 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 that regulation would look like. So I think if we continue to see kind of the corporate side of the corporate push for regulation, that might be another reason why, why it happens. Now, what is going to look like? What is going to say? As I said, will it be satisfying to us? That's a whole other thing. But, but, I, but I, think we, I think we probably are headed uh, in, in that direction. And, and it, it will happen, I think. When? Who knows? It's going to piss everybody off. Yeah. It's okay. the mark of good legislation. <laughs> <laughs> On that semi-hopeful note. Yes. <laughs> I think we will wrap the panel up. So thank you both so much. This was a wonderful conversation. All right. So before we do anything else, um, I do want to say thank you to all our online listeners. Um, we're closing off the live stream um, at this point, thank you for being with us throughout the day, and I look forward to hearing from you. Please send uh, feedback, visit us on the website, um, and send feedback to us. Let us know how it was, and look forward to those conversations going forward. So thank you very much, all the online listeners. Okay. Waiting for a confirmation. Okay, great. <laughs>